Hello, peoples! My name is Dark Humility, if you do not know already. I've played Diablo 2 for perhaps about 20 to 30,000 hours total throughout, you know, since it came out. Uh, maybe even more. Um, I've completed a grail. I have probably built over 200, maybe even 300 builds, if you're counting variations. Um, throughout whatever, like throughout the entire existence of D2, I've made all kinds of PvP builds, PvM builds, PvE builds, and um, today we're giving you guys a 2.4 patch note in-depth analysis from my point of view. I'm doing it live with my own chat who can also provide their own thoughts as we are doing this analysis. I have already skimmed through all the notes, so I have a pretty good idea of what we're going to be analyzing today. Uh, I did that long before the stream today, pretty much when I woke up. Really good stuff. Um, keep in mind, though, uh, they could adjust some of the numbers. They could even add some things before the first D2R ladder launches. Um, these aren't the final launch notes, but they are the 2.4 PTR notes. The public test room for the 2.4 balance changes will be live on January 25th. Of course, uh, make sure to check out all of my build guides on d2.maxwell.gg and on YouTube for both D2R and PD2, the community's favorite mod. And let's get into it. So let's just get into the meat of it. Let's start with class changes. We'll go all the way down and whatnot from there. And I'll try to give you guys my analysis on virtually all the changes. So, what do we have here with the Amazon Javelin and Spear skills? All right, so the first thing we see is a change to Impale. Now, I read this and I thought to myself, well, Impale is so trashy uh, in, the, uh, in the current version of the game. That's like, how could they possibly make this any better? This is one of those skills that just is like, what the heck do you do with it? Um, it has no synergies, it's super slow, it's interruptible, it's, it does a ton of damage, but it even degrades the weapon. Um, it's just really unresponsive, especially when like Jab exists and has like rapid thrusting attacks and whatnot. Like, what the hell do you do with this nonsense? So... Based on these changes, and uh, out of all my testing of Impale that I've done, um, in uh, continuing for an unreleased guide actually on Maxwell, which I'll release soon, which is the Jab Fen guide, I did test a lot of Impale just to see <laughs> where it currently is. These are my thoughts on what I think is going to happen here. So I, I know, I know, I know, too much talking anyway. This skill is now an inter uninterruptible attack. All right, so I think that's good. Um, I think the big issue is this attack is so slow that it usually doesn't even go through. It doesn't register because the monsters will attack you and interrupt the attack uh, by putting you in FHR, or uh, Fast Pit Recovery. That's no good. So that's a great improvement to the skill for sure. Uh, the skill now slows the target by a percentage for the duration. So that's interesting. It seems like they're adding some uh, utility to it. Is this the same as the slows target stat? That's my first thought. I think it is. It's like, you know, the stat on Kelpie Snare or Nosferatu's that says slows target by X percent. I think that's what that is. That could be quite, quite useful. And then the attack rating modification has been removed and it's been turned into what is effectively Smite. Um, smite always hits, if you guys don't already know. They're changing the tooltip for that, which we'll get to down there. But uh, now this skill will always hit the target. It has no attack rating. It always hits. That's quite. That's not bad at all. Um, my first thought about this ability is that it could be a great ability to use for utility. I don't see it as being the best damaging ability, the most efficient way to clear monsters, or even to kill a single monster. However... It could be really useful, perhaps, for one-shots in the case that you can one-shot. that It could be nice for a single target. Let's say you got a single isolated target that doesn't have much HP. 
you might just be able to clean it up. Just done. It's dead. You don't have to worry about any of your attacks missing. You just go slam, and it's done. Uh, Impale has a lot of damage. That was always its strength. So maybe you could just one-shot single targets with it. If you can't one-shot, it's still going to probably be slower than Jab or Fend. Um, that's my first thought with that, based on a lot of testing and one, whatnot. Once again, you might be able to one-shot some things with it, which could be quite nice. It could be just like a poke done. So it might be useful for those situations where you have one isolated monster, just one, and you can just one-shot them, uh, which is uh, something my chat has also said there. Something else my chat has said, which is very smart, is that you could use it on bosses. Now, my thought is you could use it on uber bosses as well, not just Bale. So Bale likes to move around a lot. Slow's target is very effective against Bale. Um, so if you use that against Bale as your first attack and then go into using, like, Jab, you might be able to maximize your damage per second against Bale, and he doesn't move around that much. The other thing that I think it could do for sure... Um, of course, it could also slow down Diablo or make him less likely to move around. Uh, but the other main thing I would say is uber bosses. So Jab and Fend is already very effective against uber bosses, if you don't already know. Uh, particularly just Jab. Jab is what you use against the uber bosses themselves. You could use Fend if you're surrounded, but that's about it. Um, at least currently. We'll get to the next change here in a moment. But I think, I think if you use this against uber bosses, you're going to be good to go. So make sure to test this out against bosses and for one-shot potential. I think that's how you're going to want to use it. You're not going to want to use it all the time, um, especially when you're like tons of monsters coming at you. I really don't see that being very effective compared to like Jab or Fend. Uh, but in the, um, in the cases of single targets, like bosses you want to slow down or single targets you can just one-shot and take out in one hit, you're going to be good to go. Um, can anyone post the link for anyone in the chat that wants the link or make a command for the uh, the patch? That'd be awesome. Sweet stuff. Um, Fernando, this is this is this is the patch right here. We're actually reading it. We're kind of we're doing in depth analysis though, so we're not just reading it. Um, but anyway, that, those are my thoughts on Impale. I actually think these changes to Impale can make it useful, which is really strange. But I think these changes will actually make it useful. Um, like I said, in these specific situations that I've mentioned, it can make it useful. You get that Breath of the Dying on the Jab Fens on. You also have Impale. You can do quite some amazing stuff with this. Um, I guess another thing I should mention about this is that I'm not 100% convinced you'd want to max this necessarily, but you could. Um, it could, especially if you're looking for the one-shot potential. If you're looking for the uber slow and the utility, you might just want to put one point into it, or just keep one point into it, which I think you need anyway on your way to Fend. So, it has some potential in both ways. I think it has even more potential for utility. Let's just... But that's about it. I, I'm really interested in this change, which is why I talked about it a lot, but there you go. Fend. Attack speed increased by 100%. Reduced the rollback frames value between each attack. Wow. Okay, so dang. That's uh that's pretty sick. So the major issue with Fend is that it takes too long to hit monsters even when even when they surround you. So even though it's not bad to use when the monsters surround you or when you just jump into a whole bunch of monsters, it can be very slow and it can feel less responsive. What this change is gonna do here is gonna make it like twice as responsive if not more so uh this is quite promising this is definitely something i'm looking forward to testing uh, especially since i'm interested in the jab and fends on more so lately i think i think we really want to see is this enough to make fend outdo jab because currently jab is almost always what you want to do you want to get in front of the monsters and then jab everything in front of you and it's always more effective um, if you if you accidentally get surrounded, maybe you can still use Fend, but um, this isn't as effective. You, you normally don't even want to use this skill versus Jab. So what I'm thinking here is that maybe, just maybe, uh, we're going to see a viable Fend usage, and you're going to want to max out Fend in everything when it comes to normal farming, uh, not just 
uh, not just here and there, but maybe even dominant versus jab. Maybe maybe jab you use against the single targets and maybe a couple of monsters, but fend is what you end up using most of the time. Uh, that seems likely here. That is a huge change, and I think this change is going to be meaningful. All right, uh, power strike. Okay, so it seems like here with power strike, they're trying to allow for the use of more passives um, and maybe possibly more hybrid builds when it comes to power strike. So let's take a little bit of a look about what they did here. So they removed a synergy. When you remove a synergy, that means that you need less synergies, which is what they did. They also boosted the rest of its synergies. Um, means you need less synergies to effectively uh, max out the skill. So instead of needing 100 skill points, you only need 80. Uh, this can mean you can go maybe power strike on one swap with a spear or a javelin of some kind. And then it means that you can go, um, I guess you can go uh, like, maybe strafe multi-shot on the bow on the other side. So you can have like lightning damage and uh, physical damage. I think they're trying to open up more options here and I think they'll succeed at doing that. Uh, am I convinced they're gonna make power strike insanely strong? Not necessarily, but I think they're trying to increase hybridization options and making it to where you're not committed to 100 points. Yeah, so there is an overall buff to it, too. Um, it's still not going to compete with, like, Charge Strike or anything. That's my immediate thought here. Um, but, yeah, I think I think it could be interesting to, like, hybridize using some of these skills. It definitely makes it a bit more interesting. I don't know if it's ever going to be dominant, though, especially if we look at this change here, where Charge Strike has the same exact thing going on. So. I think people are still mostly going to use Charge Strike. Charge Strike just does too much damage. It, it's per bolt. It's not like a single strike. It's it's just nuts. And um, the, 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 the only problem, though, the only problem that I see here, though, is that um, this right here is... Uh, no longer synergizing with Lightning Fury, which makes me wonder like exactly how effective leveling a Lightning Fury Amazon is now, which is what you would typically do. So that's also something that's kind of strange. It, it, it might even be a nerf removing it as a synergy, so it makes the build a little bit more awkward. I'm not 100% sure about that though. Um, it might not matter that much considering that you can still get your synergies elsewhere. But if you think about how you level Lightning Fury Amazon, normally you just point, uh, you put points into, um, into Charge Strike and into Lightning Fury. So my main concern is that what this would do is that if you're like level 50, now you have to put points into like other things to boost Charge Strike. So they don't help each other out kind of maybe like a shadow nerf to the early game of Amazon, but I'm not sure. Uh, this is something I'm definitely interested in testing, though. Lightning Strike, pretty much the same thing as Power Strike. With this, with this pretty decent uh, power up here, it makes me think maybe, um, maybe you could see an overall buff to Lightning Strike as well, just like Power Strike. I'm not sure... 100% how influential that's going to be, but it will be interesting to test to see if it can compete with Lightning Fury at all. Uh, Lightning Fury is just by far the strongest Amazon skill, so uh, it'll be interesting to see if like it actually encourages people to use Lightning Strike. Um, so that will be interesting to test for sure. These are definitely very interesting things that will be worthy of testing, and maybe to see how they might work in different situations. However, this skill is so effective for single targets, and Lightning Fury is so effective for groups of mobs. It's going to be challenging to make these two um, uh, comparable. So 
I think we got to hold our enthusiasm potentially for using these other skills until we know exactly what they do. And also we need to like look into how it might affect leveling. All right, Poison Javelin. This skill's damage scaling at high levels has been slightly adjusted. What does adjusted mean? Does it mean it's been increased? <laughs> I don't actually know what this means. I'm assuming it means they increased it. Um, casting delay will so so this is so this next point here is something they did to like every skill they removed global cooldowns basically so there's no more global cooldowns if you use a cooldown skill it won't affect your ability to use any other cooldown skills so cooldown skills are skills which are gated by a cooldown so they you, you can't use them until the cooldown is up but what happened though is if you use any cooldown skill you likely couldn't use any other cooldown skill um, in that interim and you would just be able to do nothing in that interim or you wouldn't be able to use certain abilities so you could use one cooldown skill and then you could use a normal ability that has no cooldown that's based on faster cast rate but you couldn't use two cooldown skills ever in that cooldown uh, duration you're just stuck in jail for all the cooldown skills they just removed that and honestly i i really like this um, this is one of my favorite things about what they're doing I think this is one of the more clunky things about the original D2 is that it felt like you just couldn't use certain skills in combination with each other, which is especially harmful for the fire druid, which we'll get to as we go further down. Um, but that's a that's pretty impressive stuff. That's pretty impressive stuff. Um, it's gonna be really good. Uh, right, the damage is basically the same. Yeah, that, that makes sense, Mirage. I mean, the the damages up here are probably gonna be pretty similar though. Um, yeah, I think so too. I think they want you to maybe use this as a hybrid skill. So poison, poison javelins have uh, historically been used in combination with freezing arrows. So another hybrid build where you use a different set of weapons on uh, each weapon swap. And uh, they want you to be able to use other, uh, other cooldown abilities as well. So any any kind of casting delay at all, it can be good. You could use Poison Javelin, and then you can use Strafe. Um, it looks like you're going to have all kinds of abilities to do all kinds of things in combination with, with each other, and it's going to be a lot better. Smoother gameplay in general around Poison and Plague Javelin is very good. Um, I guess this duration wasn't always fixed, so I guess there was like variable Plague Javelin duration, so they fixed that. And they also increased the power of Plague Javelin. Uh, play javelin sorry and they they reduced the casting delay as well and uh, overall i think this is just making these abilities more responsive and less clunky is going to help out poison javelin a lot maybe as a pure build or even as a hybrid build even more so um really really cool stuff uh we're gonna have to try these out as well very excited to see what these do i think these might do quite a bit it might be the case that there's still not enough AoE. Um, it might also be the case they don't do quite enough damage because um, there's not enough like negative enemy res you can apply uh, using some other means. Um, however, they definitely could bring it from a pretty trashy build to a pretty decent one in that regard. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's that 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 they they they're also fixing the poison damage too as well. So they're making it to where it always lasts the same amount of time. So uh they're 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 fixing some of those bugs where different sources of poison damage would mess up like how the poison damage was applied and whatnot. So yeah, honestly, a lot of really good stuff there. Um very good indeed. So yeah, they, they also show at the end of each uh, section, they show kind of like a blurb of like what they were trying to do. Yeah. Yeah, see, they're trying to make it to where Lightning Fury isn't the center of every build. I can understand that, um, but, you know, I did express some concerns before, so we'll have to see. And of course, they're also uh, trying to make Impale and Fen good, which I think they might have actually succeeded in doing to some extent. We're going to have to try that out. And um, definitely going to be interesting. See, I think using Plague and Poison Javelin together uh, is always going to be the play optimally. And with some of these fixes, more and more people will do that. For sure, for sure. All right, so 
I, I think Charge Strike could suffer a bit early game, but overall it's going to be the same late game. Charge Strike is insane, so I don't think you have to worry about that. Impale will hit, always hit like Smite. Exactly. So it might be a great way just to one shot, one punch a monster, or to apply a very nice slow. So mostly as a utility that also does a lot of damage. Um, but it's not going to be a DPS skill, that's for sure. Um, it's super slow. They didn't do anything to the attack speed. All right. Passive and magic skills. This skill's radius has been increased by 35%. Okay. That is something that always felt a bit clunky with Inner Sight. If you've ever tried to use Inner Sight to eliminate enemies or to decrease their defense and make them easier to hit, uh, it was hard to get close enough to the enemies to actually make it feel worth it. So this might make it less clunky. I mean, it might see a little bit more use with this for sure. Uh, I'm not sure how impactful that is. Uh, maybe not so much. I don't know. Slow Missiles. Okay, slow missiles is got a lot of good potential here. So this this one this one's looking solid. Uh, I really like this. Like they're gonna reduce enemy missile damage based on skill level. So it actually reduces the enemy missile damage, not just slowing it, um, not just scaling, which it will now, not just a less clunky radius, just like inner sight. But it'll even reduce missile damage. This is key because you would use this ability anyway against archers, but they would still hit insanely hard in a lot of cases. Um, using this ability, I think, is going to feel way more impactful now. I actually think this will be a lot more commonplace, uh, especially when maybe you don't have your full build. I would say that, like, you know, if you're going for pure efficiency, usually stopping to cast something that isn't dealing damage to the actual enemies is usually not going to be top notch. But when it comes to like mid game and whatnot, when you're fighting like really dangerous archers in the pit or something, um, this could actually matter. This, this, this is actually kind of nice. Much better, much better utility skill now. What's up, man? No one's using this. You say no one's using this. Well, no one really uses this, no. I mean, you try to use it, but yeah. This one, people do use it against, like, uh, Black Souls and whatnot in uh, Worldstone Keep. It's definitely, it definitely gets some use already. Um, however, um, it's definitely going to get a lot more use, I think, with some of these changes, for sure. All right. It is a buff to Peace Rinward, true. So changing this skill will also change all instances of this skill on other items as well. It's something to... Keep in mind as we continue down here. All right, Valkyrie. I love this. This is something that's super annoying for me with Valkyrie is that if you cast one and then it dies instantly, you can't cast another one for like six seconds. Um, they fixed that. They reduced the cast delay on it by a ton. So you can pretty much recast it whenever you want. And of course, the more FCR you have, the faster it casts. So it's good stuff. And once again, they removed the global cooldown, which is. Uh, which is nice. And uh, there you go. Ooh, congrats, SciPy, GG. Yeah, it was already good for sure. Dodge. Dodge. Okay, so Valkyrie is going to be a little bit more useful. Now, the question about Valkyrie, though, is that even though Valkyrie is showing as, you know, more responsive and whatnot, easier to use, the question is, why would you ever do Valkyrie? So this is this is my thing. I don't like Valkyrie for most builds unless you're ranged, like multi-shot or strafe or something, or maybe freezing arrow, because um, you have to put points into dodge, avoid, and evade. What did that historically mean? Well, a dodge, avoid, and evade would um, lock you in an animation where you can't perform any other actions while you were stuck in the animation. So should we even care about Valkyrie? Well, yes, we should, because they're also making changes to dodge and avoid. I don't know about evade, though, because they don't list evade, so I actually have no idea about that one. Uh, it's not even listed here. I'm assuming, no, these are the patch notes, man. PTR is out January 25th. Someone just asked a question about that. All right, so dodge and avoid. So dodge and avoid. Uh, Speedrunners will be mad about some of these changes. Yeah, you know, we can talk about that a little bit. Um, 
I think speedrunners might be happy about some of these changes. Um, I don't know if they'll like this change, actually. But uh, uh, not, not, not the lightning ones, anyway. They, they might not like that. But most of this stuff is pretty solid. So, yeah, I was going to say, speedrunners, I don't... There are speedrunners that speedrun D2R for sure, but I think a lot of them don't like the load screens. All right, anyway, um, that's just currently, though. I think I think that's going to change as time goes on. All right, animation can now be interrupted and will no longer lock the Amazon from performing other actions. <gasps> Does this mean that you're not just invincible throughout the whole animation. It can be interrupted, one. And then it doesn't lock out the Amazon for performing other actions. This is huge, actually. Um, this is insane. So this is similar, if you guys know what PD2 did, PD2 just got rid of the animation completely. It, it looks like what they're doing here is they're keeping the animation, but you aren't just stuck going, huh, huh, huh for like an hour and then you have to save and exit because you're, you're stuck you know um so it, it, i i i i know what it's like and most players know what it's like to get stuck like that trying to use these abilities and you needed to skill these abilities in order to get to valkyrie you literally couldn't have a valkyrie unless you had at least one point into these um so that changes a lot for that whole tree. That that whole side of the tree now is so much better with these changes. Um, all these changes, including the top ones here. And uh, I think we're looking at some very, 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 very good stuff. So you might actually want to get those skills now because you know you can still attack while you are being put into uh, dodge or avoid animations, um, which is really good. So you can interrupt that animation and perform an attack. So you can perform the attack yourself. I think you interrupt it yourself. I don't know if the monsters also interrupt it, but I'm assuming you can just interrupt it yourself at any time by performing another action, such as trying to move, trying to cast an ability, trying to use an attack. I'm assuming that's what that means. So anyway, really, really good stuff. Hey, ST Gur, we're reading the 2.4 PTR patch notes. We are hyped ish. Thanks for this, because we're going to be testing that come starting January 25th, and we're trying to see kind of, we're trying to do an in-depth analysis and discussion as to how do we think these uh, um, changes will affect things, and also trying to hype some of them up, and also mitigate the impact of others if we feel like they're not going to do that much. All right, so bow and crossbow skills so we're getting to the end of the amazon here freezing error reducing mana cost yeah this is one of the biggest pain points of this ability it does a ton of damage um it's so strong actually a lot of people underestimate how powerful this ability is even in d2r or the original game however its main challenge is that you'd always need lots of mana per kill or you would need lots of mana leech and even then you would still be glugging mana pots like crazy um, I would, sometimes on this character, I would go three rows of mana pots. Yes, that's right, Mirage. That's right. She no longer quaffs mana. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that's actually the biggest change you could make to that ability without breaking it. Instead of buffing its damage, which is already nuts, um, especially when it scales up to its highest levels, making it to where the mana cost isn't absurd is actually uh, really good. And reducing it by half, approximately, is going to be very good for that ability. Magic Arrow. Increases the amount of physical damage converted to magic damage for the base level and per level. Okay. So, I'm assuming this is making it possible to... This is the solution for physical bosons like strafe or strafe guided arrow uh, multi shot that kind of territory of the uh, of the zon tree, and this is the solution to kill physical immunes. This is what I'm thinking. This is so. This isn't really meant to be like a main build or anything, but it's meant to be used as a solution potentially for killing um, physical immunes. That's interesting. Um, 
they're they're trying to convert the amount of physical damage from your physical damage bow into straight up magic damage and they're trying to make it more effective if you have attack rating it hits and you'll likely be able to kill the physical immunes with that so i think what that's going to do is going to uh, some people were already using it to kill physical immunes to be fair i think most people are just relying on like atmos or decrepify from uh, like reaper's toll or atmos just to break the physical immunity because this usually wasn't very effective. But I think they're really trying to make it to where these uh, uh, physical bosons don't get totally stuck um, uh, with their high physical damage bows not being able to kill monsters. So I think that's what that is. And that's a very, that's a very welcome change. I think uh, we're going to want to use that as a secondary ability on those characters now, and it's going to be Um, I don't know about that, Mirage, because when you're using a high physical damage bow, you don't have any synergies, and then freezing arrow doesn't do any damage. So I think magic arrow is going to actually do a lot more damage than any other alternative now, and uh, except for maybe just breaking the physical immunity, but this could also be uh, make it possible to where you don't have to break the physical immunity, so uh, it's going to be better for early game as well. I think that's a good point, but I think that's it. 100%. Hey, Kalooza, dude. Man. Yeah, I turned off the sound for alerts, but thank you so much for joining Xanus Attack Squad, the Ghost of the Machine. The Arcane Disciples. Let's go. Let's get it. Actually, I didn't turn off the sound for alerts. It's just my headphones are turned off. Because there's no sound going into them. All right, chat. Spam those eyes of Xana in the chat for them. Um, yeah, so this is going to be really good stuff. I think this is a really good change, and uh, I think this might be what is required. I don't know how much they increased it, they just said increased. So this requires testing for sure. Uh, we don't know if it's effective, but I think, I, at least this is the theory behind the change. I'm trying to give my theory, and there's a theory. Pretty sure that's what they're going for. Guided arrow. Damage bonus per level increased from 5% to 7%. All right, so that improves single target damage for physical bosons. So not only are we getting improved ability to deal with physical immunes, but we are also getting improved ability to kill things like Diablo and Bale. So this is this has always been a, a, a really big pain point for multi-shot and strafe, is that once you're up against Bale, it feels like it's super hard to kill them. Um, I'm not sure if a 5% to 7% buff will be enough, it might not be. It might be. I'm not sure. Uh, one thing I can say, though, is that it, you can already kill them, you know, without too much trouble, as long as you have, like, Amp or Decrepify that you can apply to the bosses um, through either the Mercenary or yourself. Uh, however, it's it does take a little bit. This might at least improve the kill speed and make it feel a little better. Is it enough? Not sure. Requires testing. Hey, thank you so much, ST Gur. I hope everyone's hyped for the D2R PTR 2.4. We'll of course be testing it day one. Because that's the plan. Um, I mean it. It might matter, Mirage. It might matter. I mean, that that's something, dude. That's something. It they might want to end up going to seven, ten percent. I was thinking this too, that this might not be enough, but we'll have to see. It's kind of hard to say for sure. Remove the 25% weapon damage reduction for the skill. Oh my god. Yes, so my favorite boson, everyone, is a multi-shot. Never has been. Um, my favorite boson, uh, even since I started streaming and started showing it off on 1.13c, is Strafe. And I don't see any multi-shot changes. Um, I think multi-shot could be buffed a little bit. But now I think strafe already dis I, I think strafe's already more powerful than multi shot. If I'm being perfectly honest, I already think it's more effective than multi shot, except in maybe certain areas like cows and dealing with like players one monsters. I mean, multi shot's really good in P one right now for spread, but when it comes to like high player count and group play, strafe is already the more effective one. And now strafe is going to be even stronger when it comes to higher player count. Strafe is so good now. Um, the main thing holding Strafe back was this right here, was the uh, the damage penalty. Strafe had a built-in damage penalty. It says it does three-fourths of the weapon damage instead of all of the weapon damage. 
Um, now it does it does all of the weapon damage. I'm gonna want to test this for sure just to see how strong it is. But I bet Strafe is gonna shred. It already has the potential to do player Z. That's without any of these other uh, you know utility changes here to these other abilities. Um, however, it's kind of slow, right? You know, it's not amazing or anything. This might change that a bit. I think it's not going to be as slow anymore. I think we're going to see uh, Strafe become very powerful with this. Um, it'll also give a more attack rating. Um, yeah, this matters on certain weapons. Uh, if you're using Faith, though, you're not going to... This is almost going to do nothing. If I'm being honest, uh, in late game, you usually have too much attack rating. So I don't know how necessary this is, but I think for early game, this is going to help out Strafe quite a bit. Which is why, you know, people probably don't use it in early game very much because they don't have enough attack rating. Well, now they can get enough attack rating. So I think this is mostly an early mid game change. It doesn't, it's not going to affect late game that much. Strafe melts. Yeah, it, Strafe should be very strong now. And that's cool because I love Strafe. I love how the ability works. I think it should be better than a C tier build, which is where we currently have it on maxroll.gg for overall late game strength. Uh, it should be better than that for sure. <laughs> hey, thank you, SC Geraldo, for continuing your sub from Lucky Luke. And for Xanifying, Bink Barnes, a Panamonium Run, Dapuz, Teo, Tree Nut Lee. Oh, wow, Teo as well. Everyone getting Xanified. Let's go. Chat, spin those eyes of Xana in the chat. I can get him in there. Oh, man, Orsky going ham too. <laughs> Maybe I should have turned off alerts. That's okay. I actually like alerts. It's fun. So good shit. Uh, you guys can have fun for sure. Man, that's crazy. All right. So, so that's really good stuff. I'm really excited about Strafe. I actually think this is going to matter more than even the changes to Fend and Impale for like stab stabs on. I think Strafe got the biggest buff, and that's huge. Um,. I think this could be a very strong ability now. Uh, I'm not sure how strong. It might not still be like in the top tier of abilities simply because you have to stand in place while you're using it, but I think it's going to be really good. Uh, people are going to be able to clear chaos like with really, really easily now. I think it's going to be really nice carry. That's really good. Um, or, of course, we're going to test it though. Sounds good, man. Thank you, man. Uh, thank you again. And uh, thank you for getting some hype in here, S Seeger. Uh, always, man. Always, man. Have a good night, man. And thank you again. Orski, also, Xanifying Carmeria, Lutgas, Shediman, Hosa, Siana. My goodness. All killing it. All right. In the hype in here. Let's do it. Good, good stuff. You think stra uh, Strafe is on? I think. You think play javelin's gonna be busted? You know that's a good point actually. Is someone in my chat said that play javelin might be busted? I think with some of these changes, it could be. It could be. It could be very strong. Um. However, my only concern is that getting negative enemy res on this build might be a little challenging. So I'm not a hundred percent sure if it's really gonna be busted. I don't know. We'll see. You know, this is why we're going to test things. I'm kind of just giving my thoughts and also giving some thoughts in chat that look interesting as well. Um, it's going to be really good. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys, for supporting the channel. Being beasts. I know it's gone for two days, but we're ready to start beasting it again, especially for the PTR. Going to be going hard again when the PTR starts, no matter what. Um, really good stuff. Strafe and Joyers Unite, right. All right, so let's get back into it. Let's finish the Zon. Man, this is just the first character. So this character had a lot of changes, though, so there's kind of a lot to talk about here. Um, let's talk about Exploding Arrow. So Exploding Arrow, I think this is going to be quite good. Exploding Arrow is already pretty good damage-wise. I think... I think they're trying to make Exploding Arrow potentially stronger than Freezing Arrow, but not Freeze. And that makes sense. Like, to me, it's Exploding Arrow should do slightly more damage than Freezing Arrow because it doesn't actually freeze the monsters. Uh, they're increasing its damage scale enormously. Also doing the same thing for Freezing Arrow, which is to reduce the insane mana cost. Um, 
that's cr that's great. I mean, you can already kind of hybridize the build and make it to where you also have exploding arrow and freezing arrow at the same time. And I think that's going to be very good. Uh, they're also trying to like improve fire arrow early game so it's not as painful to level your Amazon early game using fire arrow. That's pretty nice. Um, but I think the big one here, though, is like, look at these damage changes. You think Mist plus the new Fire Helm will now work on a, for a Fire Boa? I think it could. However, I think Mist... I don't know if Mist is geared towards Elemental, but we'll talk about that, though, in a moment. Um, so, yeah, they fire, fire damage is supposed to be, like, the highest damage in Diablo 2. Um, lightning is supposed to be easier to put things in a hit recovery, but also have maybe a higher ceiling. Uh, maybe not like average damage. Fire damage is supposed to have like the highest average damage, which is something they're going for with all these fire skills. So it's really good to see that Exploding Arrow is going to take a central role. Um, you can use, of course, Phoenix bows, Hand of Justice bows, maybe even the new bow, uh, Melody, and of course, you know, some new rune words, which we'll get into uh, for that as well. So that's really cool. Yeah, I think Hand of Justice might still be better, to be honest, but it's got potential. It's got potential. Immolation Arrow. Immolation Arrow. The new bow definitely could be used for that, though. The new bow gives three skills straight up, and you could also put it in another bow that has bow and crossbow skills, so you could get six skills on it. So, yeah, very possible. Very possible. Immolation Arrow, though. This is also really cool. Um, I think fire arrow builds have been completely neglected, uh, at least past the early phase of leveling in the game, and making these happen might make people want to play them um, later on in the game. Uh, it, it's challenging to compete with something that just freezes the monsters straight up and already does a ton of damage, um, but I think they're trying, and I think it might have a reasonable impact. I think freezing arrow might still be the dominant build, but it's hard to say. It's hard to say. Um, of course, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Well, we'll have to test that, of course, like everything. And Immolation Arrow, average fire damage per per second is scaling increased. Uh, average fire damage per second scaling increased by about 100%. That's a lot. That's a lot. I mean, it, they're trying to make it do a ton of damage. Um, this ability might be really good for bosses, especially as they kind of just sit in the pyre. Uh, casting delay will no longer share its cooldown with other skills that have casting delays. And once again, getting rid of the global cooldowns. Global cooldowns, it's just so painful, man. You can't use anything else, any other cooldown ability. The second you use even one ability that has a cooldown, uh, it's just painful stuff. So they're getting rid of it, at least until that cooldown is completed. But you get the idea. It's just painful. Tooltip updated to now display casting delay. Very good. I like how they're updating the tooltips too so people actually know what these abilities are doing. I've noticed that across the board, by the way, they are making it to where people actually know what the ability does. It's very good. Mana cost per level. Uh, reduced from 0.5 to 0.25. So once again, not a billion mana. More damage, Freezing Arrow, which already does a ton of damage, just getting the reduction. Tons of damage for Strafe. Way more quality of life for Poison and Plague Javelin. Um, and uh, not as much reliance on Lightning Fury with some small buffs maybe here and there with about the same amount of damage. With as much quality of life as they gave these two abilities, they might be way better. And, of course, way better utility and passive trees. So this is looking really good. Uh, a lot of people talk a lot of mess, saying maybe they're not doing enough. But, honestly, that is a lot of good stuff. It's so much good stuff, in fact, that I feel like they're fixing most of the main problems with the Amazon skills that have problems. Um, I feel like they're, you know, they're, they're actually addressing the primary issues that exist within the skill trees. So that's... Honestly, there's almost nothing else that I would wish that they probably were able to do within these skill trees. Um, I feel like they really do address the main problems. I think Strafe and Fend are the big winners. And I think when we try out Fend and we try out Strafe, we're going to see them be so much stronger and more responsive. Um, 
I do think Exploding Arrow is a big winner, though. I think people might be underestimating that one, as well as Plague Javelin. Um, so we're going to have to see. We're going to have to check those out. And these mana cost reductions are no joke. Everything's no joke. But I think the Amazon overall is looking very, very good coming into the first ladder. Um, that's, I mean, obviously I still think that, you know, the abilities or the ability Lightning Fury might still be on top overall. I think Charge Strike will still be on top as the single target ability. But I think they are, um, it's going to be nice. You know, I think Immolation Arrow kind of accomplishes that, I am Gus. I'm just not sure. It, it kind of accomplishes it. All right, um, Assassin. So these are some of the changes I was more excited about because martial arts, everyone knows that you don't touch this tree in Diablo 2 except for Dragon Talon, which is kicks. You can kick the Ubers to death. Um, you can use the kicks to proc things like Frozen Orb on weapons like Rift. Um, you can do a lot of cool things with them. You can use it to proc Static Field like on Stormlash. Um, and of course, crushing blow from all sources and have really powerful boots and destroy single targets. Uh, so Dragon Talon's never had too much of an issue, but I think the rest of them, it's like you wouldn't touch this stuff. Nobody would touch this stuff in Amazon. It just felt too clunky, too useless. Um, there's just always just th these abilities were just trash, and they never. It, it's kind of sad they released this character with the expansion. And they never made it um, these abilities very useful. But the good news is that they might have done that. That's right, Raj. Even if Firebow is okay, it could be a nice hybrid option for Freezing Arrow, which is you know kind of how I would use it already uh, most of the time. Okay, so Assassin. Let's go into it. So all of these abilities, every single skill in the entire tree here um, that is not a finisher. So all of the elemental damage abilities, physical damage abilities, all have had their attack rating uh, bonus increased. So they all got more attack rating. And this makes a lot of sense because finding attack rating on these abilities in early game is very tough. If you've uh, ever tried to level with one of these, you'll know that attack rating is almost non-existent. Um, in PD2, they actually solved this problem by uh, creating a, a whole new skill called Claw and Dagger Mastery um, just to address this problem in addition to some other issues potentially. Um, but... I think that's good. I think that's going to be really good, especially for early game. And it'll be better for late game, too, where it's still kind of a struggle to get attack rating, especially with elemental damage synergy gear. Um, Dragon Talon. All right, so this is where this is where the stuff gets a bit interesting. So all the damage is still looking the same, more responsive, more likely to hit. These abilities need to hit, so that's all good stuff. Um, I'll need those claws and whatnot. But yeah, anyway, let's go into the um, the finishers. So this is the big one. All the finishers now only consume one of each martial arts charge when cast. So you get to three charges, and you can just use three finishers. So at least that's my understanding. So, correct me if I'm wrong, chat, but you could pump up Blades of Ice for three charges, and then just go Dragon Claw, Dragon Claw, Dragon Claw. And you can do that, because it only consumes one of each martial arts charge when cast. Uh, that could be quite crazy. Um, that could be a lot of damage. They increase the damage of all these abilities too, so the finishers feel a lot more impactful. Which makes me think that once you charge it up, you can just start slamming those monsters for a ton of damage. I'm not 100% sure if it's enough. <laughs> then explode the screen. 
Um, see, I don't know that, Barrage. Can you charge up two of these at the same time? So people are actually theorizing right now you could charge like three five Cobra Strike and three Phoenix Strike. I'm, I'm assuming not. I'm assuming that's not how that works. I'm assuming you still get to a maximum of three charges, no matter how you get to those three charges. And then you can just expend them. So... This explanation here, I think, is something that really elucidates this point. So, martial arts skills are receiving a <laughs> Blood Doll comes in for the assassin, of course. Blood Doll, resident assassin master. How you doing, Blood Doll? Uh, martial arts skills are receiving a significant change with having finishing moves, including the attack skill. So, I'm assuming... The skill itself, like if you get to three charges with Tiger Strike, you can just expend the charges with Tiger Strike, I think. Not sure though. Um, only consume of one of each charge at a time instead of all three at once. This is the clue to what you guys are asking here. I think, I think there's only a maximum of three charges still um, because it says all three at once. It's using the language like it's assuming that there's three of them. So I think no matter what, you can get free charges. Um, and, you know, depending on, you know, how you combo the abilities, uh, you can get the, the different impacts of each charge. And then when you charge them all up, you can expend... You can expend one with a normal attack. See, I don't exactly know what that means, but you can expend them all with, like, a normal attack. And then you can um, you can also expend one per finisher. So that means that the 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 assassin will just expend charges and get that full damage on the finisher. You can just use three finishers after getting three charges, or you can just expend one normally. Uh, maybe to keep, like, let's say you just keep using Claws of Thunder. I think, like, if you're at three, it'll go down to two or something. And then, uh, you know, go down, I don't know. I'm not 100% sure, but I think that's kind of how it works. And maybe it goes back up to three. Um, it's pretty cool. That, that, that's cool stuff. I'm assuming you use the, the top charge off each charge up with each finisher. Yeah, that makes sense. It means that makes it you use the top charge, the last charge, the last charge, and then you go down to the next charge, and then you go down to the next charge, or maybe that means that you only can use a finishing move at three maximum. Okay, so maybe maybe I'm actually interpreting this wrong. Maybe maybe what this means is you can still only use finishers. You can only use finishers when you get to three charges, but. But you only use one charge, and then you can get back up to three. Well, I don't know. <laughs> Wait, you can? Huh. Interesting. We're going to have to test this. <laughs> I think... <laughs> I think this is the area that I know least about, and also it's the area like where I'm not sure what they have changed to make it different. Okay, so people are saying you can have multiple combination of charge ups at the same time. Okay, that makes sense. So then, which one does the finishing move get rid of? The first one you used, the last one you used. Oh no, it says consumes one of each martial arts charge. Wait a moment. Okay, okay, wait, 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 wait. I'm not reading this properly. Okay, so you can have all the charge-ups you want, I guess. And it only consumes one of each when you cast it. So does that mean you can actually cast three finishers then and then get rid of all your balls? So I assume you always use the top charge off of each? I don't know, I guess so. I guess so. 
<laughs> okay, to, to be fair, to be fair, there's a lot, I've got a bit of like PD2 brain with this, so I, I I forgot some of the elements of the LOD one, I'll be honest. So this one, it's been way too long since I even attempted some of this stuff, so alright, so this this is where my analysis personally is like least useful, if I'm being honest, but what I do know is that You could do one dragon tail and you can expend all of those charges. And the damage bonus from the finisher itself has also been increased. Okay. Do you think that's what would happen though, Mirage? See, I'm actually thinking people might do three charge ups and then three finishers though. I don't know. Do you think that'd be too clunky? Or would you do like three charge ups, a finisher, some more charge ups, another finisher, some more charge ups, another finisher, and they would just keep their charges up at all times just to maximize their damage? Hmm. I don't know. No, you think it will be three charge ups and three finishers and so forth, unless people use Dragon Claw. Okay. Hmm. This could be interesting. I really want to test some of this stuff. I want to see exactly like what this does for these abilities. All I know is that I'm excited to try them out when it comes to these, and I'm not sure if it's gonna make them not clunky enough. But one thing I do know is if it's only consuming one of each charge. That's going to be a lot more potential for just dealing out huge amounts of damage. Because I think the big problems with, with martial arts before is that when you consume all your charges, you then had to spend this time where you're not really doing all that much damage, charging them all up again. And I think that was part of, part of the issue. Yeah, it's clunky. That's why it should be massive damage. Right, and it should be massive damage. Okay, right, 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 right. So depending on... Okay. Phoenix Strike does different elements. Yeah, 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 exactly. Right, 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 right. Right, man, and uh, when we get to that, we'll definitely talk about that. The irate seagoer is as much for four months as member Zan's attacks called against the machine. The Arcane Disciples. Okay, so... Mm. Right, right, right. That would make sense. So... The only thing, though... Is like, yeah, yeah. Depending on so, depending on how many charges you have, would determine like what effect you do from the ability. And for Phoenix, that would determine the element. Um, so that means if you finish three times, you would just do all of those elements. Dragon flight's looking good though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Positional annoying to use things need to be worth it. Yeah, yeah, right. Indeed. Casting delay removed. Casting delay removed. Yeah, so someone in the chat, Ladal's talking about this right here. This is pretty huge, actually. Um, um, and another cool thing about these is that all of these finishers are basically like Smite now. So the finishers themselves don't require attack rating. So the big damage, the big damage appears to be coming from the finishers. These abilities need attack ratings so you can actually charge them up. And then these right here are going to be the really big damage, depending on what charges you have charged up and whatnot. Yeah, you guys still build it up, but you also don't lose all the charges. So you could... You could you could keep your damage going a lot more smoothly. AR becomes a non-issue. True. I think this is more of an early mid-game thing, but yeah, I talked about that ash for sure. I'm pretty sure this is an early mid 
game thing. Mostly. Mostly. But casting delay removed on Dragonflight. Man, Dragonflight used to be so clunky. It felt like you had to go... Vroom. Now it's just like, it's probably going to go... Vroom, vroom, vroom. It's going to be nice. It's going to be nice. You could just uh, teleport from monster to monster. I think... I think martial arts might actually look quite good after this. Um, this might be what it needs to feel like the damage is worth it and the smoothness of gameplay is worth it. Gonna have to test this crap out though. Talked about it a lot though. Um, there's a lot of cool things. To be honest, I don't even 100% understand um, how this all fits together, but I will. Uh, we're gonna have to. We're gonna have to see it. Uh, martial arts can be quite complicated. So uh, in terms of like finisher charge up abilities and whatnot but we'll, 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 we'll check about we'll check about some people know a bit more than i do and see about that one though no what's up elmer jiggle how you doing you want to know if they fix it so facets work uh facets theoretically should work for these abilities shouldn't they i mean they're not traps but then again maybe they didn't fix that who knows it's a good point Okay, it doesn't work on all martial skills. Okay, so that might not be super impactful if they didn't fix that bug then. Interesting. Um, are they nerfing anything? Good question. And you know what? The answer is no. Well, we'll do that over. We'll, we'll talk a bit more about that in a moment, though. All right, Shadow Disciplines. Full tip updated to now show the physical damage resist reduction. Okay. Um... So basically, Fade would always reduce curse, curse length reduction and it would give you res, but people would always wonder, does that actually reduce or does it have physical damage reduction on it? It does, but people didn't really know that. It was kind of like a hidden knowledge thing. So I'm kind of glad they're fixing that. Once again, they're fixing all the tooltips. Venom. Um, all right, making it match other durations. I like that because then it's not like have to renew this so much more often than these you know um it's kind of clunky so that's definitely a nice quality of life shadow warrior reducing cast delay getting rid of the global cooldown and now the tooltip shows the casting casting delay same with shadow master very good changes here um same as the valkyrie honestly i, I really hated that it would just totally like lock you out from reusing the same ability or using other cooldowns while you after you casted one of these. So that was always nasty stuff. Um, I'm glad they got rid of this for sure. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I think I think no matter what, plus skills will definitely be the way to go for the martial arts uh, tree in general. You guys are still talking about all these changes. I think we're gonna want like martial arts GCs. We're gonna want like martial skills and items and claws and gloves. I think it's going to be quite interesting. Uh, maybe facets? I don't know. I don't know what, what's up with that. Should be interesting to see, though. Um, getting some nice, very useful uh, insight from some uh, martial arts assassin experts in the chat here. This is actually probably out of all the hundreds of builds that I've played in Diablo 2 that I've messed around with the least. And it's been a really long time since I've messed around with some of this stuff. But all I can tell you is that from these changes, I can tell you they are hitting their pain points. They're doing well hitting their pain points. A lot of these were their pain points, and a lot of these didn't make them feel worth it. And they're doing what is required, it appears, but we also don't know if they're doing enough. So we're going to have to test that. Assassin looks interesting. Oh, it looks a lot more interesting than just traps for sure, which is, I think, you know, the main problem. All right, so next up, uh, traps. Okay, so Shadow Disciplines, nothing too crazy going on, but uh, some quality of life, uh, some clarity. Um, most Shadow Disciplines are useful, at least in some context, so it makes sense that you don't have to do too much weird stuff in that tree, but there you go. I mean, maybe one thing that's kind of weird still, especially for late game, is Psychic Hammer, but um, I, I don't even know if they want to screw around with that yet, so there you go. All right, traps. All right, this is actually some pretty big stuff. I remember reading this and I was like, okay, this is um, this is some crazy stuff. So, traps removed synergy from 
Remove the Death Sentry skill synergy from Shockweb. So, in general, they try to remove the Death Sentry as a synergy. Trying to separate Death Sentry. Kind of like how they try to separate uh, Lightning Fury from the rest of those skills and trying to make them kind of their own builds that don't rely on Death Sentry to work properly. So you don't have to go Death Sentry on every Trap Assassin. You don't have to have Lightning Fury on every single um, uh, on every single Zon build. At least that's my understanding of these changes. Um, so Fire Blast being a 120 point build is still weird. Yeah, but it's 120 points versus. Um, Versus 140 points, right? So Fire Blast used to be one of the strangest skills in the game. That required far more points to max out its damage, theoretically, than you could ever get. Um, now it's almost as many points as you can get. So it's it's theoretically... Way, this is a pretty big buff to Fire Blast, I see, actually. Because now it's possible to unlock more of its damage. Maybe not maximum of its damage yet, but a lot more of its damage. Um, that's what I see from this. So Fire Blast already is very good as a support ability, but if you want to max it out completely, I mean, it already destroys even in player seven, but if you max it out completely, I really see a Fire Blast Assassin as being a 100% legit build now, where you can unlock way more of its damage because way more of the power is behind less synergies. Um, that's quite nice, actually. Why would you ever give up Death Sentry? Um, because you're just teleporting around, blasting everything with Fire Blast Mirage. That that that's why. So so there are builds there. Are, so I've actually demoed this build on stream before, where you literally just like go around using Fire Blast and one shotting or two shotting most of the monsters, and for that Death Sentry just becomes um, a, a hindrance. Um, same thing for like shockweb potentially, where sometimes you just want to lay down some shockwebs and kill things that way. Um, so shockweb is looking like it's a stronger support ability on its own. Charge bull sentry also stronger on its own without death sentry, and lightning sentry is not a hundred percent tied to death sentry, which means that if you are going for the power of the powerful lightning sentry build you can still get the same amount of damage um and you don't even need death sentry which means theoretically you can now hybridize your assassin instead of just going lightning sentry maybe having a mediocre fire blast um and having death sentry which is normally what you would always do uh, you could potentially go lightning sentry and then you can just go max fire blast. You can go these other sentries as well. You can put more points into shockweb. And maybe because you're saving a synergy there, it might even be easier to hybridize and even go like wake of fire on top of lightning sentry. Um, I don't know. There's a lot of possibilities here. Shockweb next hit delay issue. Yeah, Shockweb I don't think is going to be a pure ability. See, Fire Blast is more of a pure build for sure. I, I actually see Fire Blast being a lot, having a lot more potential for being a pure build now, or at least something that is totally self-reliant, um, which is really cool. Uh, Fire Blast was never really highlighted that much before, but I think now it's taking a more prominent role. Shockweb could be an amazing support ability. Uh, it's never going to be its own. As long as it has that cast delay, it's never going to be like insanely... It, it can't be that independent. Um, Charge Bull Sentry. This could definitely... Um, this definitely looks like it could be quite interesting. Um, I don't know if people will be using this still, really. It still has like its own delays and whatnot. I'm not sure how this fits into anything still, but... We'll see. We'll see. Six facets fire blast. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not joking. Like, there's more power you can unlock in the fire blast now. It's pretty. Uh, it's pretty bonkers. And I think they actually buffed it overall by about uh, one per snow. Wait, 
two. Yeah, they buffed it by like one percent too. Interesting. It already does decent damage. Fire Blast already does decent damage. You get more damage on that. It's gonna be very interesting to see. Um, but anyway, I, I kind of like how there's more hybridization options, which is what they're trying to do by making these builds more independent from Death Sentry. And um, some of these abilities, especially Fire Blast, I really see really shining from this. That's quite nice. Uh, Wake of Fire. Wake of Fire synergy increased from 8 to 10%. Wake of Inferno synergy increased from 8 to 10%. So they're buffing. They're buffing the fire skills. And they're removing the Death Sentry synergy from Wake of Inferno. And they're isolating Death Sentry and making it its own thing, which I think is cool because if people want the Death Sentry, which is one of the strongest traps in the game, if not the strongest trap in the game, um, they can do that. But then the rest of these abilities can kind of help each other out. Um, in order to kind of make up for that lack of death sentry power if you don't want to go death sentry. I think that's quite a good idea, actually. I think uh, separating those from isolating those ultra-powerful abilities like Lightning Fury and death sentry and kind of making it their own thing that isn't dependent on anything else and weighing down these other skills by making it to where you would never use them because it's already a synergy uh, for the strongest skill or the st strongest skill is already a synergy. Um, I think that's a good, I think that's a good choice. I think this is going to be kind of interesting to see, uh, how good Wake of Fire, Wake of Inferno become. Wake of Fire already does decent damage, but I think these are going to be better abilities, and I think it's going to be easier to hybridize them, especially when Lightning Sentry doesn't even have one of its synergies. So now I think you could go, like, Lightning Sentry and Wake of Fire. I actually think it's possible, um, especially since facets don't work on traps anyway. Um, this could be interesting to see. You get a lot of plus skills, get a lot of like trap skills, and then instead of running death sentry, uh, you get more emphasis on hybridizing your damage, and then you can do all kinds of like interesting combinations here. Um, I think the one that's not gonna matter the most still is like charge bolt sentry, unless they fundamentally change this ability. I don't think it's gonna matter too much. Uh, this one definitely can still use a support ability, especially against bosses, to uh, increase your damage. It's got a really nice uh, tick damage for sure. Very strong. And um, I kind of want to see a full Fire Blast Assassin. And then some like hybrid builds from this. I think that's what's going to happen there. Um, does it matter if they buff fire trap skills if they're still fire immunes in hell? Well, sure, because then you could use the lightning traps for that, which now have less synergies. Or you can use death sentry, which does physical and fire damage. Or you can use conviction aura when you have infinity, break those immunities, or avoid areas with fire immunes altogether, which there are now more areas than ever that don't have fire immunes that are viable for farming because they're level 85, which is something we'll get to uh, soon. That's toward the bottom. I don't know about soon. This is... This is a very long discussion, honestly. This, this might take up the whole stream, you know. This is a lot of fun, man. A lot of fun. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Facets. Facets do work for fi for uh, fire blasts as well, which is something I noted. Um, yeah, that's that's why I said. Uh, also, Phoenix works with it, too. So fire blasts is going to be beast. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, yeah, but... Yeah, bro. It's going to be very nice, very nice. Um, I'm still reading the chat. Don't worry. Um, definitely still reading the chat. Okay, Blade Sentinel. Okay, so this is <laughs> this is something that could be quite interesting. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Blade Sentinel is mostly just clunky. It already does a lot of damage. Um, it's just very clunky. Um, they're increasing the missile speed. They're increasing the synergies. They're increasing the weapon damage. Blade Sentinel, I think, might do insane damage. This could be one of the most broken changes, actually, of the entire patch notes from when I saw this. It is slow hits, but look, missile speed increased. This thing could be incredible. Uh, <laughs> you get some procs, man. You get some high physical damage weapons. Holy crap, this is going to hurt. Um... Yeah, I, I, I see this as being very, very good. Is Blade Sentinel too strong? I think it might be. 
Yeah, what do you think Blood Dole? Blood Dole knows even more about some of these assassin changes, especially like martial arts changes. Um, what do you see this? You're excited to test it? Oh, I think it's going to be crazy. Look at all this. That's so much DPS added to it. And it already does damage. It does damage. They reduced the casting delay too. They reduced the casting delay. Oh my goodness. Oh, this thing's gonna hurt me. <laughs> you know, I bet you this is gonna be an Uber killer build. If, if I had to say so, I think this thing's gonna shred Ubers. It's gonna shred single targets. I, I don't know about being like the fastest like mob clearing ability, but it's gonna clear fast enough. This would be very interesting to test. I'm very interested in this. Blade Fury. All right, so added synergies. Nice. I'm glad that they're synergizing. I think that's all good stuff. By the way, this is something that PD2 also did. Um, so if you guys don't know, it's something that already exists within that context. There was a big spinning blade that hits every 25 frames or so. And yeah, it's it's crazy. We'll have to see though. It is physical damage, yes. Flayed Fury is also physical damage, and unlike in PD2, I don't think it pierces. Um, but it has more damage. Blade Fury could also have that potential, maybe even more so against single targets. So this might be more so against single targets, but even Sentinel, I think, could shred single targets and possibly even groups of enemies very fast. Um, lots of quality of life also for Blade Shield, which would be quite interesting. Um, definitely some potential for Blade Shield to do good things, especially if you just put one point into it and you go melee. Uh, you'll be solid, you'll be good to go. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's that, it's that like spinning boomerang blade thing. Yeah. I wish they made it so it could trigger on striking. Ah, blade shield instead of the mobs. Uh, yeah, yeah. I I don't know if this is ever going to be a max out, but for sure it's a one pointer. I'd say it's not bad just to have on hand. All right. So with the assassin, I don't know, man. I think shadow disciplines. Honestly, nothing too interesting going on, but uh, the martial arts changes to be very interesting to see just how much damage these crazy finisher explosions can get off without taking off all the charges all at once. Um, you should be able to do way more damage, in way more situations, and way quicker like this. It'll be interesting to see, though. Um, we'll have to see. And then, of course, uh, hybridization of traps. Not every build uses death sentry, and death sentry doesn't overshadow every approach. I think that's a good idea. Uh, I'm most interested in the pure fire glass assassin though. That could be very interesting. Uh, unlocking more of its damage, even more damage. It already hits like a truck, so it's going to be interesting to see. Um, definitely making it more useful, I think, and maybe even more of an ability to stand alone. And of course, Blade Sentinel. I'd say Blade Sentinel has some of the most interesting things going on here. Blade Fury, possibly as well. It's going to be very, very interesting to see how. Um, a pure blade sin could potentially work. You'll max shield for the synergy. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, they're they're all synergized, right? Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Okay, so I guess well, maxing shield doesn't really do much for the ability itself, maybe, except for increase the duration, do some other cool things. It might be good for those. Yeah, that's actually something I didn't even notice. Yeah, that's true. That's true. It is a synergy for both Blade Fury and Blade Sentinel. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's why you max Blade Shield. All right, we're good. We're good, we're good. All right, Barbarian. Sweet. All right, War Cries. Okay, so honestly, Assassin's looking really good too, not just the Amazon. Barbarian, though. Let's take a look at this here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, see, that's the big thing about Blade um, Shield. If you guys don't know, like because it does so much of that weapon damage, that means you are also leeching with it. So if you have like Life Leech and Mana Leech, it's going to be really huge leeches. 
So you use a big weapon. Yeah, you use a big weapon, man. That's right. Big weapon. Breath of the Dying Thunderball, anyone? Breath of the Dying Thunderball? Yeah. <laughs> You're gonna have to see, man. Everyone's been making Breath of the Dying Thunderballs now. That's gonna be interesting to see. Maybe something else. Anyway, you want a really high damage weapon for these abilities if you don't know how they work, but I recommend checking out the guides for this. Um, this is a guide on Maxwell as well. I think BT is uh, working on that one. It's not already done. Uh, yeah. You think Death Berserker Axe plus... Oh, uh, yeah, Death gets that Deadly Strike. True. I think really high damage would be good too, though. But if you want to be tankier, absolutely. You can use a, something that doesn't require attack speed, just has a lot of damage modifiers like Crushing Blow, Deadly Strike, high damage. Yeah, it's going to be nice. It's going to be nice. Um, no, all of these changes will be in the PTR. That's what they said. So this is the 2.4 PTR patch. They are launching all these changes. So we're going to be able to test them all. Obviously, one at a time, but or, you know, a couple at a time. Yeah, yeah, you can hit 50 DR with that too, Ash. Yeah, you can make yourself super tanky, have super big leech with a blade sin build. Oh, yeah. It's going to be interesting to see all the different approaches. All right, Barbarian, let's go. Yeah, it's, it's fun. Dude, I know, D2R graphics with all the charges going off. Watch as your monitor and GPU go down in flames. <laughs> oh, man. It's so true, man. It's so true. But aren't you excited to burn out your GPU with Mar the new martial arts school? Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, the Assassin, I also feel like they're addressing most of the deficiencies of the Assassin as well. Um, most of the core deficiencies of her skills, I think they are addressing them. Now, are they doing enough on the martial skills? I don't know. We're going to have to see. Uh, they're definitely addressing the core deficiencies. Are they addressing them enough? We will see. Kind of same thing with the Amazon, except the Amazon, I think it's more clear that they're addressing the deficiencies in a very strong, loud, and powerful manner. Um, we'll have to see, though. Barbarian. Mm, I love Barbarian. So, how? Yes. Now it dis updated to now display radius on how. That's good stuff because radius matters on how. Once again, more tooltip updates on Battle Cry. War Cry. Okay, so this is the first big change on the Barbarian. Let's talk about this. So War Cry Barbarian is already viable with really weird builds. And by really weird builds, this is what I mean. Like even in the late game, uh, it first of all, it's viable for speedrunning. It's like the strongest skill because getting a strong enough weapon is really tough to just plow through monsters in hell. If you're doing a hell speedrun, you're going to need War Cry, and War Cry is going to do most of your damage unless you're fighting bosses, which is where you use like frenzied or not frenzied double swing and uh and like black flails or something so war cry is already really strong for uh early game this is really good this is a huge boost to the barbarians early game the barbarians early game is very painful partially because war cry is the strongest skill and it doesn't even do that much damage now an end game an end game what this means is that um we are going to see we're going to see some interesting approaches. So right now, one of my favorite approaches, because this build just drains your mana, which is actually something they haven't addressed here, which is the mana cost. I think that's something they should reduce, but they don't. They're not reducing the mana cost. It's kind of like Freezing Arrow. It's like crazy mana. Um, at the same time, though, that's kind of always been seen as the drawback, because you can perma-stun the monsters while dealing damage to them. 30% damage increase is huge. And my build I'd always use is like Insight. You'd wear Insight. You'd get the FCR on Insight. You would wear it. And then you would use Reaper's Toll on the Mercenary. you get Decrep on the monsters. You would jump into them. And then you could use Warcry to kill them. And you could even kill things in higher player count with the Decrep, lowering the physical resistance. And then getting in there with Insight. And then you wouldn't run out of mana that quickly. Um, so no insight doesn't counteract it. No, no, it's good stuff. You just use insight as your two handed weapon. So you, you're, you're this barbarian wielding a polearm insight, 
and then you just jump into the monsters, and then your mercenary hits them with decrep with a Reaper's Toll, and then you just start using Warcry. And, uh, it's pretty. It's very effective in players one, and in somewhat higher player count, you can still make it work. But here's what I'll say though: with the thirty percent damage increase. You can still hit the 105 breakpoints, still get your mana regen, still get your uh, um, decrepify for increased damage, but now your damage is actually sizable, which means this ability might actually work for late game and for team and group play, and you might actually do some damage with it um, early and late game. It's interesting. Um, already a pretty strong approach to magic finding. It rivals Berserk in a lot of ways. This also makes me wonder if uh, there's going to be more war cry approaches to one-shotting uh, players one mobs and then using item find than just using berserk. So war cry is going to see maybe a much more prominent role uh, with this change. Um, definitely for leveling, for sure. If you don't have a good weapon, this is going to be your salvation. Remember how painful it is to level up a barb if you don't have gear? Well, you know what? If you don't have gear, this is your salvation. And that is what D2R is doing. They're making it your salvation. And they're making it possible for it to be viable in the endgame. Which is actually quite interesting. Shout. Duration baseline increase from 20 seconds to 30 seconds. Well, I should say more viable in the endgame. It always kind of, kind of works. Shout. Duration baseline increase from 20 seconds to 30 seconds. Marching battle orders. Okay, so... Um... That's just good quality of life. It's kind of weird that Shout didn't last as long as Battle Orders, so it's good. And more clarity. And more clarity. And more clarity. And also making Battle Command not last so much shorter than Shout and Battle Orders. So just trying to bring them all up to Battle Orders and make them all last a very long amount, uh, pretty strong amount of time. So it's not clunky and your one of your auras doesn't run out when the other ones are still active and whatnot. It's trying to uh, keep it a bit more consistent. Is, I appreciate that because all those abilities tend to get longer. Yeah, so that's a good point though, Mirage. One good point here though is that one thing this is maybe not good for is um is uh on hardcore when your battle command runs out, it's usually a sign that you should rebo. But now they're all gonna run out roughly the same time. Hmm. There's more windows for making mistakes when that's the case. You're really going to have to keep track of those timers now. Really going to have to keep track of those uh, of those timers for sure. Because now there's not even like an indicator. Uh, your shout and battle command don't run out before battle orders anymore. So that's uh, that could be a drawback actually. But yeah, overall I'd say it's a plus. It's just people are going to have to pay more attention to that. Cast at different times. Yeah, there you go. I'll use a staggered cast strategy. <laughs> All right. This is actually kind of fun, though. This is kind of fun. Are the bard changes Pog or ZZ? I don't know. Watch. We're going through them. I, I did skim through them already, though, I can tell you. This is something I think is very interesting. Um, Grimward looks quite good. Slows and increases damage taken for nearby enemies, so it's going to increase damage to all nearby enemies. So it's got great utility now, especially for groups, and it slows. And it slows. Um, I think this would be amazing to have uh, Grim Ward now on a starting bar. Let's say you're just trying to like beat Hell Bale first or something. Um, imagine how much utility you can get out of just slowing down the monsters, and then increasing all sources uh, of damage versus them. I don't know if it's just physical damage or if it's all sources of damage, but hey, that's good stuff, though. I don't know. I mean, it might be a little clunky to use, but once you can get that Grim Ward up, that's going to be kind of strong. Like before, I think the problem with Grim Ward is like, why the hell do we even need this? What does it do? And then Howl is already more effective, or any of the other skills are more effective. Um, that potentially makes Grim Ward a must-have 1.1 bird. Yeah, or even more than one point if you're playing in a group a lot. I don't know. Um, it also has its radius. 
So the radius has been increased. The radius of effect has been increased as well. So this whole thing is just more useful. I think uh, that might help a lot. I think one of the, I, I think I might even like this for more change better than the current PD2 approach of just making it to where there's more damage in AR. I actually think this, uh, this puts it very firmly in a strong um, utility role. Of course, on PD2, you can cast it from afar, so it's less awkward. But then again, um, I don't think barbs are sorceresses. I think barbs have to kind of, you know, use a hammer and uh, bang on that totem a bit, you know, bang it into the ground, stake it into the ground, nice and good, nice and firm. Uh, he's he's got to he's got he's got to put it up, man. He's a handyman, all right. He's a handyman. He's, he's gonna do this. He's gonna do this. Um. Also, it has a synergy. So if you're playing in groups a lot, this could be insane. In addition, I think I think what's gonna happen. Okay, so this is this is my hot take. All right, you guys, want to hear my hot take? This might be totally wrong, but fine potion. You would never put more than one point into it ever. Now you do. It has a synergy, but this is what I think is gonna happen. So it, let's say you are a utility barb. So you are a shout barb. You are a barb that is there for utility. All right. You can go your one or more points in a war cry, and then you can max out all the other, like battle command, battle orders, or shout. Or you can just max out shout and battle orders. Maybe put only like one or two points into battle command, and then you can like max out grim ward and find potion, and then put like one point into like find item. And then you don't really go any of the masteries or anything. You put like one into each of your like normal masteries. And then you are literally just like a group utility barb. And you just like go hard on battle orders, shout, and grim ward. And then you put the one points where you need them or where you want them for some active abilities like item find and stuff. Or you can even put more points in item find. You can kind of like mix and match kind of how much utility and how much like item find you want or versus whatever. But I think what this is going to do is it's really going to cement the role of a group help barb that's not just a a, a bow bot so if you're a bow bot that you know doesn't only stun here and there you're maybe like you know uh you know work some bodies behind the team no you're also like trying to make it to where your team can actually do more damage sounds good to say Pi. you have a great night man um I don't know if they have that many points, but that means Warcry Charms are going to be even better. Well, no, Warcry Charms are always worth something just for the bow, especially in Hardcore. Uh, it's just that now they're going to be even better for sure. I think the Utility Barb is really, really good. It's looking really good now. Um, it's looking really, really good. Um, that's all very good stuff, and I think it's going to make more people want to play Utility Barbs. That's good. Combat masteries. Okay, so throwing mastery, the added chance to pierce, so so that the axes or the throwing daggers or the knives pierce through enemies to enemies behind them. This definitely makes it a lot less clunky to use and increases the AoE impact of throwing axes and the like. So throwing barb. Throwing throwing is OP. Throw barb is very, very strong. It could be very strong. It has a lot of potential to do damage quickly. They increase the pierce. The other thing about throw barb is they added bonus damage with 16% baseline and 8% damage increase per level. Um, hmm. I mean, it's doing a lot more damage. I like what they're doing. They're giving it a lot more damage. It definitely was lacking damage. Definitely had a bit of a damage problem, for sure. And it definitely didn't pierce as reliably because you needed pierce items on you and you had no way to get pierce just, you know, passively. That's good stuff. I, I have one... I had, um... I have some concerns, though. And my main concern with this is that like we've been, I've been talking about throughout the weeks since they announced this. Uh, 
I don't know how good a throw barb is or will ever be until they increase quantity on the weapons themselves or drastically increase replenish quantity on the weapons themselves. Um, until they address all the quantity issues like you know stack size, base quantity, replenish quantity, um, the range isn't too bad. Um, I mean, it could definitely use a bit more range too. Um, range is definitely a little bit of an issue on throw barb for sure, but I at least uh, on the LOD one. PD2 one's insane, but PD2 one has infinite quantity, so we're not talking about PD2 here. Um, for talking about D2R strictly, I'm thinking the biggest problem with this build, even more so than any of the things they have like upgraded or improved here, has always been the quantity. You know, let, let me give you guys a little bit of understanding because I've tested this pretty thoroughly. It's 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 fascinating stuff. You can have six lacerators and burn through all of them in the span of like five minutes. 10 minutes maximum and then they don't even replenish you have to like repair them you have to go back to town repair them you have to carry them all on you or go back to the stash and repair them um if they're ethereal good luck you just have to wait till they replenish and they replenish very slowly and the ethereal ones do way more damage um i don't know man i, I think this is one of those changes where i don't see anything meaningful changing i I love this build. I want it to be a thing. Um, I want to even make the guide for it, but if they're not changing the quantity yet, it's not a thing yet, really. It's going to be really clunky. It's going to require multiple trips to town. It's going to be hard. It's going to be nice for PvP. PvP, you don't have to worry about quantity that much. You can do... I think this is going to be nice for PvP for sure. Um... I think it'll make it pretty good for PvP, but I don't know yet whether it's ready for PvE until they re uh, until they address the replenish problems. Yeah, I'll let the item till it works. Yeah, I, I don't see it being that great still, even with those changes. And that's actually the first time I've said that, even like throughout all the changes. And it's the first time I thought that going through the patch notes is like, mm, it's still kind of missing the it's missing the mark there. It's missing the big problem, the elephant in the room. It's it's not addressing it. Uh, the quantity is such a big problem with throw bar. It, you just burn through those, you just burn through those axes so fast. It's crazy. It's just faster than you can blink, and they're all gone, and they don't replenish fast enough. All right, um, leap. I like this. Baseline minimum distance increased. Speed of leap motion increased by 75%. Less clunky leap and uh, very useful. And now it displays the knockback radius, which is something that everyone that maxes leap on a utility barb already, if that is your choice um, for more utility and to avoid damage, um, people usually like maybe not max out leap. I think they get like level 17 leap or something. And then you're like maxed out and you're good. I think at least a level 11 leap is usually what they do, but uh, putting that there is nice. So, I mean, leap is already great for utility potentially, but they're uh, making it less clunky and uh, trying to help out the, um, so people understand that it does increase knockback radius. Um, simple fix. Throwing mastery adds replenish one quantity per level. Yeah, that would be a good fix. Um, you mean one quantity repair per skill level per second? Yeah, that'd be kind of interesting. I, I do think there is a simple fix to the throw or problem of quantity, but they haven't provided it yet. Um... I don't think it would be that hard. I mean, you either you can either increase the stats on the items themselves, or you could build it into one of the synergies. Absolutely. Or the mastery, the throw mastery itself. You could do that. All right. Um, leap attack. Speed of the leap motion increased by 75%. 
Yeah, leap no leap is great for making runs safe. The monsters get totally immobilized. You just leap around, and they just get immobilized. That's I, I was doing that in LOD. It's, it's perfectly. It's honestly overpowered. I think a little bit, but it's a lot of fun. You do have to invest a lot into leap to make that happen, though. So it's it's kind of interesting, though. Um, leap attack. Leap attack. I don't know. I think since they're making leap less clunky, and they're making leap attack less clunky, and they're increasing the synergies and increasing the base light damage, they're doubling it. It might be quite interesting. Um, I mean, it doesn't have AOE still, though. But are you going to be able to just go like, hey, 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 hey. You're just going to be able to like, just slap, just destroy everything, or just go like, hey, 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 hey. I don't know. That's kind of what it sounds like to me. Um, you might just be able to chain leap into monsters and kill them in like one shot. That could actually be quite interesting. Um, that's kind of what I imagine from looking at these changes. Uh, is that what's actually going to happen? Because like before, you couldn't really chain leap because the speed of the leap motion was too slow. Uh, the damage wasn't high enough, so you couldn't really one shot that many monsters, even if you had a good enough weapon. Blah blah blah. With this. It might be a whole different story. VHS James, thank you so much for the follow. Welcome to Cole Xander State. It might actually work. I mean... Oh no, the update is very good. It's not tacky at all. I mean, they might still be, you know, they might still need a little bit of work to get some of these skills where you'd want them to be. But overall, like, they're so much better. All of them are better, no matter what. So it's, it's, it's good. I think people were afraid of this, but there's nothing to be afraid of from what I've seen here. It looks very good. All right. Leap attack could be viable. That is definitely going to be a very interesting thing to test, and it's going to be interesting to see. But I think from those changes, we could see a viable leap attack for sure. All right. Yeah, ping ponging between mobs when charging without the fun of charge chaining. Yeah, you're going to be ping ponging between mobs quickly and no charge but that could be fun though that could be fun um it's definitely a different feeling than uh charging so that could be quite interesting yeah yeah maybe you can leap attack in a and one shot him mega fast yeah exactly exactly that's what i'm thinking too that's what i'm thinking too all right so Double throw, we already went over that. Double throw is looking really good damage-wise now. Maybe the range isn't enough, and definitely a problem with quantity still, which is a huge issue for that build. Uh, this is a little perplexing, though. So this change almost makes me think they don't already know that Berserk is the most efficient magic finder in the endgame. And the reason I say this is because this, this change is probably the weirdest change I've seen, like, throughout all the patch notes. It's like, what the hell? Yeah, so, all right. So we know anyone who plays the Pitzerker, the Berserk Barb, which is what this is. I, I wrote the guide on Max Roll. I have written it. This is my guide. All right, anyone that's played this build knows that, um, uh, it's quite, um, I don't know. It's quite interesting. This, okay, so I understand why they're doing it, right? Shout doesn't make sense to be a synergy for Berserk. Why? Because when you use Berserk, you don't have any defense. You actually have zero defense. Zero. No hit chance mitigation whatsoever. Zero defense when you use Berserk. When you're in the Berserk attack animation, there's no defense. So when you have Shout, Shout gives you defense. What's the point of using Shout if you have zero defense with Berserk? I do understand that. I do understand that. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Maybe when you're teleporting around, it makes sense to have the defense. But it doesn't make sense when you're actually using the attack itself. However, however, I question making this already insanely strong build even more insanely strong. Um, Battle orders, this was the one weakness I always found for a hardcore pit zerker, 
was that, damn, I really wish I could just max out my battle orders and not lose damage. Well, now you can. <laughs> so now you get a maximum survivability on top of having maximum damage on the same build. You lose nothing on a hardcore version of this build or softcore just for maxing out survivability. That is crazy to me. Um, so Berserk is going to be nuts. I think, I think this build just got a pretty big buff, and it's already so efficient at magic finding, and it's crazy. And it already was decently tanky, even with the mismatch. Um, it makes me wonder if maybe they shouldn't have just like put like made it one of the useless synergies, like battle command, a synergy for. for Berserk instead of Shout. I don't know. I mean, that doesn't make a lot of sense, but at the same time, it makes it to where there's not a mismatch, and then... I don't know. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's kind of crazy, man. It's kind of crazy. Um, that's a lot of power there for a Berserk Barb. And also, that's going to make... Um, I, I think maybe what else we're kind of going for is... Yeah, you can also max find item easier, but I think the thing that they're also going for is making it to where the Berserk Bar, which is one of the best grouping builds too for like setting up chaos for Diablo, uh, setting up for a player trying to hit 99. They're trying to make it to where you can also have max battle orders in both the group without losing damage as well. So the chaos prep build is also way stronger like this as well. Um, I don't know, that's a, that's a buff to an already insanely strong build. Um, I guess they're just trying to make the bar more insanely strong all the way around, but Jesus, that's that's quite a strong buff for that build. Um, for a build that's already like top of the line in terms of all builds in the game when it comes to magic find or item find efficiency. Um, that's nuts. I, I don't I don't know if I'd buff that, but you know that's uh, that's me. It's gonna be pretty crazy to see though. Gotta be even more fun to play a Berserk Barb. So if you didn't really like the build before or thought it was kind of clunky, well, there's nothing clunky about that build now. Not even not even a little bit of clunk. Not even a little bit. All right. Double throw. Added damage bonus uh, with 16% baseline and 8% damage increase per level. Yeah, we already talked about that. All right. Um, sorry. Frenzy. Increased stamina synergy added. Okay. So, I'm not so sure about this one. I, I read this and I was kind of stumped. What do you think about this chat? What, would you ever do that? Would you ever max out or put more points and increase stamina for the sole purpose of increasing the amount of seconds that Frenzy lasts versus getting other utility abilities? And versus putting those points elsewhere for more survivability or other utility builds. You try it out just to run half the level. I think speedrunners might like this. I mean... Don't you think speedrunners might like this, though? Don't you think... Well, I know when you can't have Port Enigma, sure, but like... Uh, I guess this is like movement utility, right? Hmm. And then you don't have to hit monsters as often. You can just run. Maybe, maybe this is maybe this is the speedrunner buff right here. This is where like you you just want a way to run through the game, and you don't want it to only last what twelve seconds. I think it lasts like maximum. And so you just max this out and then last like 30 seconds and you don't waste any time. You just run through the game. I need to make double swing a 16% synergy and remove taunt. Frenzy doesn't have the points for it as it is. Yeah, that's my problem. Frenzy doesn't have the points. It needs like all the health and everything else. I feel like for Frenzy, they should be focusing more on... I mean, if they did do this, they should also like add ED or something on top of it, not just length. Or like something that makes it worth it. Um, or like double swing needs to be a synergy too, because double swing is actually the main damage ability. Frenzy's the utility ability. Um, 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, it's six to fourteen. Yeah, you use double swing. Th this is this is interesting, but I really I don't feel like the double swing frenzy build has. I don't think you can afford this. I, I'm. This is another one where I'm kind of skeptical. This one just buffs already an S tier build, which is insane. But you know, it also makes it less weird and clunky with an ability that doesn't work with it. So I do understand what they're getting at. Um, I don't know. This one's kind of weird. I don't know if that really helps Frenzy like maybe it should, but I think maybe some of their other changes maybe are like to the attack speed. They're doing they're doing another change that I think is gonna help out this build as well, which we haven't gotten to yet, but um I think double throw is definitely still in big problems until they fix the quantity though. Uh Grimward sh I don't know, man. Utility bar is gonna be a lot of fun. There's so much you can do with the utility bar now. There's so many there's different approaches you can take. For the utility barb as well. So many different approaches like leap, rim ward, more fine item, more into like battle command for more length increase, but not necessarily. Um, you don't even need shout, you can just go pure battle orders, maybe and just go like pure rim ward, and maybe like pure like fine item with leap. There's a lot of things you can do now. War cry is looking stronger at all points of the game, which is just an overall buff to the barbarian, if you ask me. And uh, less clunky skill interaction with the Zerk, but it already buffs a crazy build. And I don't really know. I don't know about that. I think that could be used for maybe like maybe for speed running. Theoretically, it could. Or for like just running through the game. I don't know. There's otherwise it's like if you don't if you care about the damage, you just can't afford that. Or if you care about the survivability, you just can't afford that. Man. Like gonna, it's gonna kill you. I don't know. Uh, leap attack is looking very promising though. Leap attack is. Uh, I want to see what that looks like. That's a lot of insanely good changes. That are reducing like all the clunkiness on the build while giving it enough damage to one shot. I think that's gonna be fun. That should be interesting. I think it might be a thing. Yeah, I think it might be with those changes. It has the potential for sure. Um, I'm gonna have to test that though. I mean. I don't know if I'll be testing that right away, but that's going to be interesting. Oh, man. You put up damage. Right? Druid time. Yeah, everyone's favorite class. Here we go. Um, Maybe not. I don't know. So the Druid is known usually as the weakest class in Diablo 2. You think this is going to remove the distinction? The 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 kind of, I guess, the, uh, the black haze that's always kind of like hovering over the Druid. Do you think this is going to do enough to to do, to like fundamentally change it. There's like a dark cloud that follows the druid and that's the distinction as the weakest class. The class where every other class can do what the druid can do, but they can do it better. Um, do you think maybe these changes will get it out of the water? I don't know. Um, I don't think so completely, but it might make it to where more people might have a lot of fun playing the class and where it's strong enough to where it's responsive enough and it matters enough to where you might actually use it. We'll have to see though. Let's start our analysis segment on the Druid. Alright, so this is huge. This is one of my favorite builds that people usually hate to play, uh, which is the Fire Druid. Alright, I love Fire Druid. I build so many fire druids i love fire druid and the big thing that i always hated about the fire druid and what everyone hates about the fire druid is the cooldowns my god they did something about it they did something it's just less terrible we'll see guys no more global cooldowns means you can use firestorm immediately after using fissure Guys, can we have a round of applause for the D2R team? Oh man, oh man, let's go. Or I can cast Armageddon, and then I can immediately use Fissure. I'm not in like a, some kind of Darth Maul lockout zone where I can't use my lightsaber. You know, like in episode one, Star Wars episode one, and it's like, I use my Armageddon, and now it's like, oh, I can't do anything for six seconds. So, 
Oh my god, the worst problems, the worst problems plaguing this build have really been solved. Honestly, that's all they really needed to do because it does a ton of damage if you take those things away. Got a ton of strong AoE damage. Slam the piano and quick cast everything. You know, maybe, man, maybe, because now that the cast delay doesn't share its cooldown with other skills, you might just want to slam the piano and cast them all. Now, I don't think you can cast them all literally simultaneously, though. I don't know if that's how it works, but uh, I think you have to finish the cast animation for one. So you have to... You have to, you do have to, um, you do have a cast rate, right? So you have to finish actually casting the skill, and then you have to cast the other skill, and then you have to cast the other skill. Yeah, exactly. Instead of waiting, right. So what this means, Mate Land, thank you so much for the follow. Welcome to Cole Xander. So we're doing analysis on the new D2R PTR 2.4 patch notes, if you guys just got in here. And, yeah, there's a lot to say. But, I think that's going to be big. So you still have the cast animation, but then after the cast animation completes, you can immediately use another ability. You don't have to wait for the cooldown to complete on the abilities. So all these abilities have cooldowns, all right? Fire, Fire Druid, they all have cooldowns. Fissure, I think, has like a 2.4 second cooldown. Um, I wrote them all, of course, on my guide, but anyway. It's, uh, it's pretty similar stuff. I think it was like a 0.7 second cooldown on Firestorm. All right, so normally when you would cast Fissure, you couldn't use any fire abilities for 2.4 seconds or whatever it was, or two two and a half seconds roughly. Um, none. You couldn't do anything in two and a half seconds. He had a fire druid. Now you can cast Fissure, and once you you know cast it, the cast animation completes. You can use like Molten Boulder. Volcano or Firestorm. Um, they also reduce the cast delay itself on Molten Boulder, so you're not sitting there casting it as long, so you can go bowling with Molten Boulder. They also increase the Volcano Synergy, increasing its physical damage, and uh, the missile range is decreased, but the overall travel length is the same, so that's pretty nice stuff. That's pretty nice stuff. They make a teachable course on speedrunning hardcore. Oh man. Boy, that would take a while. But you know, maybe. Yeah. Fissure, volcano, firestorm, pew pew pew, start over. Yeah. You could do that. Um, you can start with those. So what I would do is I would start with the longest cooldown, right? So first I would cast Armageddon, which is six seconds. And then I would cast Fissure immediately after. And then you can cast um what has the next longest cooldown? Uh, volcano, maybe? Molten Boulder. And then Firestorm. But you can also spam Firestorm. Firestorm is relatively spammable because uh, its cooldown is only like 0.7 seconds. So you can, you can spam it pretty effectively. This is why I recommend you always use Firestorm against most single targets, unless they're fire immune. Which in that case... Another thing they did to all these abilities is they increased the physical damage by increasing the Molten Boulder synergy for Volcano and the Volcano synergy for Molten Boulder. So this means you're going to get more physical damage. So these things are definitely going to be your go towards go to when there's fire immunes. Fissure is still going to be the most effective skill, I would say, overall for non-fire immunes, uh, no matter what. Uh, you're definitely going to want to make sure that every time Fissure can be used, it probably will be used, and that's still the case. So every two and a half seconds, you want to be using Fissure um, most of the time, for sure. Now, does that mean that you shouldn't do anything else? No, because now you can use the other abilities as well, or you can just cast Firestorm while Fissure's on cooldown immediately after casting Fissure. So it, it, it's just so much less clunky like this, and then you get more types of damage than just physical damage. Molten Boulder has improved responsiveness. Volcano um, and Volcano and Molten Boulder overall do way more damage. 
Um, that is really good stuff. Uh, it's going to be so much better to play the Fire Druid like that. And I think, um, you know, I, I'm the writer of the Fissure Druid Guide on Max for All. Definitely make sure that in the Fissure Druid or Fire Druid Guide, um, that in the skills section and the play style section, I do modifications as needed to help people understand when to use these abilities or how to use these abilities. So this is really cool stuff though. And I think it's gonna make the fire druid just way better. Fire druid's already one of the strongest druids. So it's uh, it's gonna make the druid class overall also a little more elevated. And uh, already early game fire druid is arguably the best way to level up on a druid. So you're gonna see a lot more of just free uses of abilities. And there's just gonna be a lot more comboing and just, just got to mind those cooldowns. Remember, though, Fissure is still likely to be the strongest overall ability for AoE. So make sure to use that against groups of monsters as often as possible. And you're still there's still a lot of similarities, obviously, but I think it's just going to be so much better. And Orski, thank you for so much for Xanifying. Ash, making them remember Xana's attacks while the ghost of the machine there can say in his chat. Spam the size of Xana in the chat for Ash. Now that's a left or 90% fire immunities in hell. Yeah, but there's a lot of areas that don't have fire immunities, including a lot of new 85 areas. Something I mentioned before, Club. Someone also mentioned that earlier. Also, Volcano in Molten Boulder are getting way more physical damage. You want to know what else is getting way more physical damage? Arm. Physical damage significantly increased. I don't know what that means, but that means a lot, probably. Casting delay has been removed for Armageddon, so you can just insta-cast Armageddon. That's interesting, so this has no casting delay at all. Hmm. Wow, so you can just spam this. You can always have this up. This is crazy. And now he just physical damage. Damn, that's going to be sick. And that makes sense because they're freaking meteors coming at you. I don't understand why Armageddon mostly did fire damage. That doesn't make any like visual sense. You know, if a meteor is coming towards your head, do you think, oh, it's going to burn my head off? No, it's going to, you know, it's going to take your head off. <laughs> it's going to hit harder than, harder than a wrecking ball, man. Shit's physical damage, man. I like that. I like this. These are some of my favorite changes, actually. This is this is sick stuff right here. This is very good stuff. I think they're very positive changes for the game. Yeah, exactly. Icy caverns are free farm for fire. Yeah, that means like icy cellar too, most likely. And also areas like stony tomb and other areas as well. All right, so we have Arctic blast. Okay, so this is where we get into some of the more things that you're like. Arctic Blast, why even care? Well, um, it looks like the base damage and scaling increased by about 100%. Wow. Maybe it does a lot more damage now. I don't know. Controls are updated so the skill now casts free form, which means you don't lock onto a single target. You can just blast all the enemies in front of you with this, and it does twice the amount of damage. Is that enough? I'm a little skeptical. Um, I think maybe in players one that should easily be enough. I don't know about uh, group situations, but uh, it's cool, it's cool. It definitely could have more use. I I'm not convinced of the Arctic Blast Druid yet, but it's, it might, I don't know. It could be an interesting thing to test for sure though. Cyclone Armor. Meteor Sword proceeds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, Meteor is just a pure, just a bigger fireball, okay? <laughs> just a giant fireball. Well, let, let's just say the Meteor is like a, you know, it's like it's like a solar flare, okay? Just, just imagine the Meteor is a solar flare, all right? It's no, no physical damage. Um, all right, Cyclone Arm, oh my god. They haven't even done this in P2, thank you. Oh, it's so annoying. I hated not being able to cast Cyclone Armor in Werebear and Werewolf form. Um, because you would, you know, you'd lose your Cyclone Armor and then you wouldn't be able to 
survive the elemental damage. This helps both the werewolf and werebear so much being able to do this. Uh, cyclone armor is actually going to be um, quite good, actually. That is a lot of good extra survivability for those builds just for elemental damage. That's really nice. I, I think that might be an underestimated change or an overlooked change, but that's really good. Maybe, well, I didn't see that, Ash, but uh, I don't know. I don't know if they should do that, but I think I think that's just to encourage more builds to use Enigma. I don't think they should allow Enigma Telly in those forms, but I don't know. When it's circulating around where forms, that's right. All right, the other thing is Twister. So this is huge because Twister, you would never use Twister ever, pretty much, because Tornado and Hurricane are just superior. But if they increase the damage scaling on it, maybe you actually use it because it stuns? Could be a safer alternative or a way to provide more utility as a druid. Um, so, one of the criticisms, guys, of the oak of the druid in a team is they're basically an oak bot. You know, just like the barb is always a bow bot, but if the barb has leap bow and grim lord and more things, and it's not just a bow bot, if the druid has twister and it actually does some damage, and it stuns everything for the team to kill easily, then maybe it's not just an oak bot, you know? So if you think about this, Aquatron, thanks so much for the follow from Nicole Zanderson. This means that if you're running in a group, one of the most effective things you can do as a support druid would be to max out Arctic Blasts for stun duration on your uh, Twister, and then you max out Twister, and you get good damage. And you also have Hurricane, of course, and Oak and everything else. But you have that stuff as well. And then you have even more utility. So there's another way to provide utility. They're not just about Oak and Bow anymore. They're actually trying to expand some of these characters' utility functions, even if they're in the, purely in the support role, which is very nice. Does Tornado still randomly... Yeah, probably. I mean, I don't see any changes to Tornado, so... Except, I think I remember originally they improved pathing for Tornado in one of the D2R patches before. Not this patch. But they have improved it. They said they improved it. So maybe it's already improved. I think it's just maybe still not amazing. It's still not insane. I think they've already improved it in D2R, so it's already an improved thing. If I recall in a previous patch, they did something about Tornado pathing. I do remember that. It's so bad. I mean, it's still not great, but, you know. That's why you tell stop it, okay? But, you know, Twister, you don't have to path, right? You just shoot these in front of you. And it's got more damage, so maybe you don't have to worry about Tornadoes anymore anyway. <laughs> maybe, maybe you can do enough damage to where this is more efficient than Tornado, actually. Uh, in certain certain scenarios, let's say you have like a bunch of low HP monsters like the pit, maybe you just can cover more ground with twisters. It's possible. It's possible. I also like how Arctic Blast is now a synergy for Twister and it provides more utility. I think that's interesting because then it also means you can also provide utility just by freezing the monsters on top of stunning them. So this could be some very interesting uh, interactions here. I think this is great stuff. Um. Hurricane, no Castellay. Oh, wow. Well, there you go. Um, there's no cooldown on Hurricane. But yeah, you can cast it as much as you want, which honestly, I don't know why they made their a Castellay on Hurricane. Anyway, it doesn't really make sense for this ability to have Castellay. Maybe it was a limitation of older systems, and maybe it would break the computers just like Armageddon, but they uh, removed it. And you can cast it in Werewolf and Werebear form. So, I'm convinced now, you could get a lot more survivability on a werewolf or a werebear if you want them. And you can cast it as much as you want, and there's no cast delay. And you can literally just run around with Hurricane, and you can be a wolf. No, one point wonder on wear forms, so is so is cyclo armor. At least a one point wonder. It might even be more. You might even want to put more points in some of the stuff. Who knows? Possibly. It's 
kind of hard to say, but I, I would that I, that is the analysis I would use. One point wonder definitely for those, and uh, I'm already starting to see some positive changes for werewolf and werebears. Um, I like how it says with their casting delay changes, druid fire skills are generally going to be more widely used. Yeah, there's a reason why people didn't like using them, except for Fissure, which was just so absurdly strong, and it still is, that you would use it anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's good. That's good. And I think, in yeah, if constantly going in and out of human and wolf form was so annoying, this is why you wouldn't usually want to do that, but now it actually makes sense to do it. Uh, to use Hurricane and Cyclone Armor on Werewolf and Werebears. All right, very nice Elemental Tree. Honestly, those are all good changes. I honestly think they should buff the damage of Tornadoes slightly. Um, there's definitely other changes I can think of that they maybe could do. Um, but overall, not bad. Maybe the changes to Arctic Blast are to Alright, shape shifting skills. Alright, uh, werewolf. Tooltip updated now to in display the casting casting delay. Alright. Hmm. <laughs> Very interesting. So that that's that's interesting stuff right there. They are uh, now making it all transparent, but this is the one that I don't understand. All right. This one's also the same, by the way, for werebears, so they change werewolf and werebear the same way. Tell me, chat, what does this mean to you? Because I think there's two different ways to interpret this, and I think they could have been more clear when writing this patch note. Change how attack speed is determined while transformed as a werewolf. Attack speeds while transformed should match attack speeds while untransformed. Enhanced by the werewolf's increased attack speed. Okay, so this is like such a garbly gook. I, I don't I almost don't even know what to think about this. So I my 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 uh my intuition is that. This is how I interpret it, okay? It's that, let's say you have 80 attack speed, and you are a human, and you're attacking with that attack speed. You should be able to attack just as fast as a wolf? That's one way to interpret it. The other way to interpret it, though, is that the human and werewolf no longer have different rules for how they apply attack speed. So basically it's not just on weapon attack speed, it would be all kinds of attack speed everywhere in the build. So they no longer be special. Um, they no longer be unique in that way. One way they are always unique uh, transform builds is that they use weapon only attack speed instead of attack speed everywhere on your build. It's something that's always been kind of mystifying about the build and not super clear. Since they do like making things more clear and they've brought a lot of clarity to the game in general with a lot of these tooltip changes and otherwise, it makes me think that is the case because it's one of those like hidden properties that players intuitively wouldn't know unless they played the build. Um, but I think See, this is what I'm thinking too, Postal Mosa. That's what I think. So what I think is what it's really trying to say is that you don't have negative attack speed at level 1 through 3 wolf or bear. Right. So it means that your attack speed is applied the same way as if you're a human as you're a bear. But it doesn't mean that other items on your build will apply attack speed. I don't think so. I'm, I think it's still weapon-only attack speed. Because if it wasn't, wouldn't they just come out and say that and be like, bruh, other pieces of gear now give you attack speed instead of just your weapon. I mean, that, they could have just said that. That that would have been so much simpler way to describe that. Um, 
But it could mean all those things at once. Maybe it means everything we just said. So maybe the reason there's so much gargly gook here is that they're just trying to all encompass everything. They're just like, okay, human attack speed works the same as, you know, shapeshift attack speed. In all cases, every case you can think of. Maybe that's what's going on too. Um, I don't know. Very interesting. Mm, yeah. I don't know. These are the ones I'm the most confused about. I think these are like the this is the most confusing bullet point I've seen. Not like most confused about why it's there, but I'm confused about what it is. <laughs> so um testing is needed. I'm reading it as they added like two shales to your weapon or something upon transforming. Yeah, that makes sense because human normal human attack speed frames are much faster than um, the transform frames. For some reason, they would punish you for transforming, and the amount of attack speed you'd have in your weapon wouldn't translate to the amount of attack speed you would have as a human for the same amount of attack speed. And then you simply just would be less effective. I, that's what I'm reading it as, too, Mirage. And I think they're just buffing their attack speed frames across the board to align them with the human attack speed frames. That makes sense. And honestly, that's a big buff. That's a big buff. I don't think they're changing like how the attack speed is applied though. Like it's a weapon thing, so. Yeah, I don't think they're fundamentally changing how the attack speed is applied though. I think the rules and the breakpoints. Otherwise, they would have said something about that. They had to have, right? I mean, I don't know. All right, anyway, that is really cool, and I think that's uh gonna help those builds out a lot i mean there's these aren't the strongest builds in the universe but they already have a lot of potential so this makes me think they could have even more potential now rabies more attack rating okay that's a bit of a pain point especially early on poison creeper synergy okay so they're buffing rabies a little bit now let me be honest with you chat how many people have attempted rabies in, in uh vanilla d2 dtr i don't know anything how many people have attempted rabies? How many people have attempted rabies? Never. Okay. Poison calculations just suck. Well, they said they've been fixing a lot of them, so I don't know. Not touching that? Meh. All right. Do you think that merely increasing its damage is enough? Now, I think it might help out in some areas where the monsters are really dense, like the cow level. But do you think that's really going to make rabies very good? I I was looking at this and thinking that's... Yeah, it's fun in PvP, sure. I mean, the damage increase will make it even better in PvP. Okay, so for PvP, for sure, for sure. I, I definitely like it for PvP. Hey, what's up, Onyx? How you doing, man? Haven't seen you in a little bit. What's up, man? It needs fixed poison duration, like Poison Nova and the new Plague Javits. Um, yeah, fixed poison duration would be nice. Um, maybe more AoE to its spread, so it's a little bit more lenient in how it spreads to other monsters. Uh, maybe like it persists a bit after like a monster dies with it or something, so that monster like instantly dies it doesn't spread if there's nothing nearby i don't know it's really clunky though like i i've i've tried using it i still wouldn't play rabies with this change um, unless it was like pvp for sure i i think it needs more i think it needs more help um let's see here fury more attack rating and that's not bad you know Honestly, especially without gear, that's going to help out early game for sure. Um, okay. Maul. Okay, so Fury, they've recognized it doesn't need a damage buff. It doesn't. Fury doesn't need a damage buff. Fury can get to absurd damage levels, especially in the late game. Like, it can one-shot thing players eight. It's pretty nuts. I don't think that needs a damage buff. I think it mostly needs a clunkiness buff or a clunkiness fix, which... It looks like they're getting to with some of these added skills and some 
pass delay problems and attack speed problems. They're definitely fixing a lot of it, so it's good stuff. Also taking a bit of a lighter touch. Shh, Maul. So Maul, they recognize that bears are significantly behind wolves already in terms of like DPS, and they're actually boosting Maul. So Maul, Maul does need more more help than Fury does for sure. Damage bonus per level increased from twenty to thirty percent. Huge. Attack rating bonus increased from twenty percent to forty percent baseline. Remember, this is also the attack speed increase on Werebear. Wow. Uh, and the stun value now properly capped at 10 seconds. That could be nice. That could be nice. Um, is it enough? Is it enough? I don't know. Maul comboing with Shockwave, though. Maybe does even more damage now, potentially, though. And they increase the shockwave mall synergy as well. So mall is looking quite a bit better. That bear is going to hit really hard. Um, is it going to be as good as Fury still? Unless they change bear breakpoints, which are so much more painful than wolf breakpoints, particularly block uh, breakpoints, like faster block rate and FHR. Uh... I don't know. I still think that the dominant approach is definitely going to be Wolf, um, no matter what. Uh, that being said, there's more of a reason for people that like to play the bear to play the bear, but I, I don't know. I feel like they're not addressing the elephant in the room once again there. Secondary for Fire Claw against Fire Immunes. Yeah, that's one way to look at it, I guess. Um, I don't know. I still see that it's, it's kind of like how Throw Mastery... Unless they address the quantity problem, unless they address the horrible bear frames, bear is going to, unless it does a billion damage, which is what a bear sorceress does, which is why a bear sorceress is fun. Bear sorceress also has a lot of mobility. Unless it has something like that, it's not going to compete with the werewolf standard. So that means bear sorceress will always be the goat werebear for sure. And as far as like wolf barb, since Wolf Barb doesn't have Fury, I think Druid is fine. So, I think the Druid Druid Fury Wolf is going to be nice for sure. Nice for sure. Um, they'd probably use Breath of the Dying Archon, Rib Cracker. I mean, it's the same as the Wolf, honestly. All the same options. Tomb Reaver. Just really, really high attack speed. Um, really higher attack speed, really high damage, though. It's, it's the same thing, really. The same way, the same thing. I am. I am streaming it. I'm doing an analysis, kind of like an in-depth analysis. This video is going to be very long. It's going to be funny. <laughs> uh, except I'm going to make a shorter video where I only go over the ring words and I kind of go over how I think they should be used or could be used um, after reading these notes. How are you over there? I just read this uh, stream. It looks like you have to buy a new account due to this. Mm, no, 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 you don't have to buy a new account. You just have to have a um, a legit, you just have to have D2 Resurrected attached to a legit Battle.net account that hasn't been banned. That's it. I, 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 I can access the public beta room right now. I checked yesterday. You don't need to buy another account. You just need the same account. All right, anyway. Um, what's up, Premier? I hope you're doing well. Okay, anyway, um, let's go. So we got um fire claws. Okay, this is interesting. I think fire claw could actually be really strong. Fire claw was never a slouch when it came to damage. It was the delivery of the damage that was typically difficult. Um, but what they tried to do is they tried to make it to where fire claw wasn't super dependent on skills that you couldn't use in bear or wolf form anyways. So they took out the fissure and the volcano. That makes a lot of sense to me. I don't. I mean, I understand thematically that they're fire skills, so they should be synergies for it. But it also means there's just a bunch of skills you can't use. Um, so and they're also just straight up increasing its damage massively, uh, partially to compensate for the loss of synergies. But it, it's gonna do a ton of damage now. That thing is gonna hit hard. 
Um, I think Fireclaw is going to be very good. This might be the most impactful of all the shape-shifting changes, besides maybe the attack speed thing, which we don't know for sure what it is. But I think Mirage has a good idea, which is that it's very possible that what they're trying to do is make it to where you're not so much slower comparatively as a werebear or werewolf than you are as a human with the same amount of attack speed, at least on the weapon. So, I don't know. We'll, we'll see if it means more than that. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Very cool. Summon skills and the end of the druid. So guys, take your Oak Sage, but they removed the weird oddity where the Oak Sage was physical immune and nightmare. I don't know if you guys caught this, but the Oak Sages, or all the Sages, were literally physical immune and nightmare. Um, but only a nightmare for some reason. <laughs> and then everywhere else, they had no physical resistance. Um, um, you might hit better breakpoints though, Mirage. Maybe you can hit them with just, like, jewels. Like, 15 attack speed all res jewels. Anyway, 25 DR is good. Yeah, man. Less getting chewed by fetishes. Yeah, dude. So, that means your Oak Sage isn't gonna get destroyed by physical damage, like, archers or tons of, like, Little guys, fetishes, whatever. Um, that's good. That's a buff. And I think that's a much needed buff because it dies way too easily. Um, way too easily. I think that's I think that's a good thing. Well, yeah, I mean, sure, your Oak Sage can still get nuked by plenty of abilities, but I mean anything that makes us survive more often is welcome to me. That includes all of these, by the way. And then, what does this exactly mean? Min life and max life values are average to always be the same, accurate to the tooltip. Can anyone give me more of an insight to what that means exactly? Armchair traveler. What's up? Anyone got an idea there? What does that mean? Does that mean that, like, sages have, like, a range? The life has a role? Man, I was never even aware of that. Okay. Well, now they don't. Now it's just average, all right? They should have just, like, maxed them out, honestly. Not the average, but I'll take it. It's kind of weird. Cool. More survivability for sages. Um... All right, so this is one of the most interesting things. This is one of the most interesting things about um, some of the changes that I've observed. And by the way, this isn't just for druids. This is to all thorns type attacker takes damage type things. What does that mean for us? That means there's more potential areas you can farm on each build, which means I'll have to update the D2R farming tiers guide with more builds and more areas. So it just means more fun, more potential things you can do in the game. Mm, you can make them fire, I mean, with flickering flame, I think. Could you though? Oh uh, yeah, guess you could, because you have a resist fire aura. Yeah. All right, anyway, we're, we're not there yet though. Anyway, saw bear immune bear immunes to fire. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool because that means the spirit won't die to like venom lords and things like that, which is another very common thing that kills them. Bear is immune to fire and light. Yeah, but how would you get resist lightning on them? Though? That's a bit different though. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, we'll we'll get to one thing at a time here. We'll get to one thing at a time. No, I think minions can get... They, minions can be immune. I mean, think about it. These used to have 100% physical uh, resistance, which is immunity. I don't know. It's weird. All right, anyway. um, Spirit of the Barbs, let's get into some of the thorns and attacker takes damage changes. This is very important, I think, because a lot of these skills are literally just useless. Like, literally just useless. You would never want to use them under... Um, um, you can play with players from other regions. Uh, you just have to join their region. Um, it is global servers. Uh, you just have to be in their region. That's all. 
So you have to uh, change your region. You can change your region using the globe next to the thing. Yeah, you can. No problem. All right. Yeah. Uh, if you change regions, though, your ping might be bad because it's it's a regional server. So. Yeah. Have fun with that, maybe. All right. Um, I saw someone's calculate region damage is pretty savage now. Okay. Anyway, so spirit of the bard. Aura no longer returns a percentage of damage when hit. Okay, so there's no more return damage, which was always crap anyway. Now the aura will deal a flat amount of damage when the aura affected targets are attacked. What does that mean exactly? What does that mean? How much damage? What does it mean when they're attacked? I don't know. We'll definitely find out when the PTR drops though. 100 to 200. Well, you know what's funny, though? Is it could be very impactful. It depends on how much damage, right? Does it mean that any attack on the monsters now deals more damage? Just straight up. Every attack deals more damage to them? So that means, like, let's say I cast a blizzard on a monster that has Spirit of the Barbs. Does that mean that they take this bonus damage no matter what because the spirit of the barb's aura is on the monsters so any monsters that are affected by the aura take more damage is it only physical damage is it all damage it might be all damage if it's all damage, that could be quite interesting in a group. It could mean quite a bit of extra damage. I think it works as return damage on items, just flat physical. Right, so it, it, it applies flat physical damage to them. But when does it apply this damage? And how does it apply this damage? That... So many questions about this. And, and by the way, Thorns apparently now works the same way. And so does, um, I believe, I don't know about Iron Maiden. Maybe it does. It means on attack attempt. Okay, not Iron Maiden. Okay, so Iron Maiden still returns damage normally, which would make sense because you can still use it to cheese bosses using. Play golem and whatnot. Mm. Okay. Okay, I think they mentioned that all Thorns attacks like that on Spirit of the Barbs. Thorns, Aura, Iron Golem are all going to interact on flat damages instead of percent. Right. But it says when they're attacked, not when they attack. So the way Thorns used to work is when you had Thorns on you. Okay. You'd have Florence on you, and then you're attacked. You know, as long as you take damage, you would return damage to them as a percent, which was. Right. But now it's when you attack them, they are now aura affected targets. So they're affected by an aura that allows you to deal a flat amount of damage to them just by attacking them. Hmm, that's what I'm that's that's what I'm thinking, hot balls and Ryan. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Dude, there's a lot of there's a lot of cool things going on here, Cormiria. I've I've been doing analysis all stream. I mean, it's a long it's a long thing, but huh, man, Diddy Kong race car, what's up, man? Okay, so we don't really know, but there's such a there's a lot of question marks, but there is potential for Spear of the Barbs to actually be viable under certain conditions. Let's say that. You have a, a bunch of casters, for instance. Maybe it just adds more flat damage to them. 
And then you're not dealing with part of the Wolverine because you don't need more damage, like physical damage. I don't know. I don't know. When do mobs have thorns? No, they don't. But now the mobs are affected by an aura that is produced by Spirit of the Barbs that will activate a flat amount of damage when they are attacked. I don't know what that means. I don't know what it means. We'll see. All right, anyway. Let's go. Yeah. Druid plus Necro Zoo with Amp. Yeah. Spirit of the Barb. Maybe every time they are attacked by a summon, it applies the damage. Wow, that could be crazy if summons apply it as well. But see, they're not specific, though. They're not specific. Maybe the summons do apply it. I don't know. Sim, thank you so much for the follow. Welcome to the Cold Xander's Day. Attacker is the mob in this description. Oh, okay. So when someone attempts an attack on them, it will do a flat amount of damage. But does that mean that this aura can be applied to all your summons? If so, that could apply a lot of extra damage. And it doesn't guarantee they have to be hit as well. Okay, I see what you're saying. So they have to be attacked. It's not when you attack. So anything that doesn't get hit often, it's not going to matter. But let's say you have like a bunch of minions or something. They always get attacked. Ah, well, I don't know. We'll see. Could be quite good. Mm, the affected target, I think, is anyone who's affected by the aura, which must be party members and allies and whatnot. When your wolves get hit, they get free damage. And right, exactly. So that might actually be quite good for a summon druid. Maybe. Is it better than Heart of the Wolverine for a summon druid? Maybe. As a matter of fact, Heart of the Wolverine might be better for things like Werebear now and for Werewolf because you're a single target. Whereas maybe when you have like 20 targets around you, you have a lot of summons. Maybe that's when you want to use Spirit of the Barbs because they're all adding tons of damage. I don't know. I don't know, but it could be quite interesting. That... I think it could be OP for, like, summons, for sure, if it works on minions. That's the key. All right, Raven. All right, number of hits per Raven reduced from 12 to 5. It no longer increases per level. All right, that sounds bad, actually, until you read the rest of it. I like how they start with the, the, uh, the nerf. Attack rating bonus per level increased from 15 to 30. Okay, so they get more attack rating, though. Modify the AI so the ravens are more active attacking them. Damage level scaling significantly increased. And adding synergies. So now ravens do damage. I don't know what this means for some things. It might mean raven lore is more impactful, but I, I'm assuming they still blind as well. And blinding plus all this damage can be really huge. And they're also untargetable, just like in PD2. This is a very PD2-like change, except, of course, you know, there's not billions of ravens, and they, uh, they don't do... Um, you can't summon, like, three at a time or anything like that. But that's a lot of damage, PD2-style. The damage from each of the synergies is PD2-style, for sure. So now the ravens look like it's a full-on raven is an 80-point build. That's what I'm looking at right here. Look at this, 80-point build. Uh, that means ravens might be the majority of your untargetable DPS, and that might make summoners do enough damage to actually push through hell. Uh, ravens get really strong when they get all these synergies. We've seen that in PD2. So uh, that could be very interesting. Sycamon Diablo, yeah, man, that's uh, that's OP, man. That's really good. That is really good stuff. Um, I think I think I really like this, and I think I like the fact that ravens might be more than just utility as well. It might actually be worth spamming them and taking them out. 
Summon Spirit Wolfus. All right, minimum life and maximum life values are average to always be the same. Accurate to the tooltip. Okay. Um, once again, I guess I didn't even know they spawn with random amounts of life, so okay, they're just trying to clean up the game a bit. Attacks now deal cold damage, so they're trying to separate spirit wolves from dire wolves, and so spirit wolves now freeze, so that's some utility which can prevent your summons from taking more damage um, by simply slowing down the other monsters. The damage level scaling increased by 10%. Base life increase. Yeah, they needed this. This is uh, they were way too weak. They died way too easily. Um, I think eighty percent will definitely make them survive a lot more. Uh, that, that that looks that looks about right. Life now increases about ten percent per level. Okay, so there's a lot of ways to make them tank here, and they do more damage and they freeze. So there's utility to them, and they actually going to help your army of am aminals. They're dangerous aminals. Are going to be strong. Okay. Summon Dire Wolf. Hmm. Same thing there. And damage level scaling increased by 30%. Yeah, so these are supposed to be your damage dealing wolves, and of course there's only three of them max, so it makes sense to make them do even more damage. Of course, they made them even tankier. And the base life was increased so much, they actually reduced the life synergy because the other two already get life. That makes sense. Updated the tooltip to display each synergy bonus value. All right. Yeah, these are the crowd control wolves, right? These are the damage wolves. This is probably most of your DPS, though. Like, the ravens... The ravens are going to hit so hard. That's a lot of damage. Uh, they get the synergies, too, so they get all the power. And then Summon Grizzly can still do insane damage to a single target, which you already know. Something I've shown on stream before. Uh, but they're increasing its life even more, even though it already has a ton of life. This this thing's the Mega Tank in general, so it's going to help uh, Wind Druids as well. So it's going to help them tank a bit more as well. Uh, that might help Speedrunners, actually, because uh, Grizzly will tank even more, so that's going to be nice. And it, you can even increase it by leveling it up. So if you go max Grizzly, it's going to have a ton of life. Wow. That's crazy. And I like how they also updated all the tooltips to display the bonus value for each synergy. So you actually know what you're getting when you're leveling them up and you don't really have to guess. Especially if you're a new player and you don't know the values. The hidden values are all revealed to the people. And you summon them all together. No. You can't. That's the big problem. So this is why you can go pure raven. It sounds like this is the summon druid. The summon druid, in my mind, is where you go pure ravens because these are where all your damage synergies are. Now... If you want some crowd control and utility, and you're a support druid, these look pretty nice. If you want to do solid damage while also having some tanks in front of you, it's pretty nice. They also tank a lot more, so maybe you could do these instead of grizzlies if you want. If you want a single mega tank, this is the approach for sure. Well, PD2 summon druid is insane, but... Even though this won't be as strong as that, I think there's potential for at least a Raven Druid to do enough damage to complete hell. Uh, will the rest of this stuff be insanely good necessarily at, like, gunning down monsters? No. But there's a lot of, like, combined tank and damage approaches here. And especially for early game, like, early, like, normal and... Nightmare, these are going to be better approaches for sure. Currently, they struggle in Nightmare. I think it's going to be a bit better. And I don't know. Ravens actually, I think they're trying to make Ravens the full build, which is, you can get these out, and then you can have Ravens on top of that. You can have Ravens on top of at least one of these, right? You just can't have all three of these, right? You can only have one at a time. One type of these. 
But you can have ravens on top of one of these, right? Pretty sure you can. I'm pretty sure you can have like ravens and a grizzly bear. Yeah, that's what I thought. So they're trying to make ravens the DPS and they're trying to give you various tanking options that also do some damage. I think you could actually complete hell with a summon druid now. Is it gonna be insanely good? I don't know. Mmm. Probably not, but it's gonna be viable and it actually might be strong enough. I think I think they would have to do more. I, I'm kind of confused why they don't allow you to summon like both types of wolves or like two bears alternatively. I feel like they could do more, but you know, it, it it's looking good. It's looking okay. Problem is, even if Raven is super strong, it's going to get boring fast to play. I mean, you know, you can also summon the wolves and whatnot, so you keep yourself safe. The wolves keep the monsters at bay, and then the Ravens peck their eyes out and kill them. That's because Blizzard had so many things going on with it, man. You gotta sell, man. You gotta sell. They could have probably sold it for so much more, but they just wanted to get out, man. They wanted to get out. You know what I think it was? A lot of the executives wanted a way out, right? They wanted their retirement package. And so in order to get their retirement... Yeah, I know why Microsoft did it, but I think the reason why Blizzard sold is it was their way to get their... It's, it's a way to run their way out of a... Uh, a bad media-played company. And a lot of, like, irk and negative uh, energy being directed towards them so they could just get out and they could get out their money. So they're like, you know what? We're not going to we're not gonna haggle too hard. And Microsoft's like, look, look we, we can take this all out. We can, we, can renew your, we can renew your brands. We'll maintain your stuff. We'll let you do what you're doing. We'll maintain your teams. Uh, we can just take that over in um, as long as it's not too expensive. Good idea. I don't know. I think it benefited both parties, to be honest. I think it made sense for the time, you know. All right. Here we go. Vines. So, no more diminishing calculations. So, they, they do something, but... I'm confused still to why you would ever use a vine still. Um, they're still really, really really squishy they might provide some more benefits but their ai is pretty shit it doesn't apply very often um poison creepers on the other hand you might actually use a poison creeper now because so for all those lovers of the quote unquote um tentacle druid um these actually could do significant damage now, potentially. You get a synergy. It's twice as tanky. The poison damage level scaling is significantly increased. Um, at least for a while, Poison Creeper maybe actually makes some sense. Maybe even in Hell Mode. Maybe. And maybe this is what you use along with Rabies. And maybe Rabies would be better with this. But it's still not very responsive, and it might still die a lot, even at 100% scaling. So I wouldn't get too excited. When it comes to these though, Carrion Vine will be nice on a Fury Druid. Well, okay, maybe not on Summon Druids. You definitely would never use these in Summon Druids probably, but I don't know. To be fair, even on PD2, these aren't good. So no one even uses on PD2, they instantly die. Yeah, I, I, I don't think this is going to be good enough here. This, I, I'm skeptical of, but it at least has a chance, right? This is, I, I don't know what I think. I don't know. It's not enough. They, they need more. They really need to help these abilities out to make them useful. Um, A lot. A lot more than that. So anyway, with the Druid, I'm really liking how Summon Druid can actually get through Hell now, probably. It's almost certain with the Raven damage and with the uh, increased tank and crowd control provided by the rest of them. Um, Sages are tankier, which is nice. Fear of the Barbs has the potential to be better than Heart of the Wolverine for uh, 
a summon druid, especially since Heart of the Wolverine doesn't apply to ravens. So if you guys don't know this, ravens can't have auras, but ravens are also untargetable. So Heart of the Wolverine wouldn't really be the approach on a summon druid anyway, especially looking at these other changes. It's very likely, though, that just having wolves out or something, or a bear, just to eat up hits, will cause Spirit of the Barbs to be the best approach. Right, wolves will eat the hits, bears will eat the hits, and then guess what? They do more damage just by virtue of having Spirit of the Barbs out. So I think Spirit of the Barbs might actually be the play on the Summon Druid. Uh, Heart of the Wolverine is more of the play on the physical damage druids. And of course, Oak Sage remains the play on the elemental druids. And that makes sense to me. Um, and then of course, I'm really liking the adds to Werebear. I still think Werewolf is the dominant play though. So that's good stuff. And then Rabies. Rabies is looking okay though. Uh, but I don't know. I, I still think Rabies is gonna be pretty crap. I still think Summon Druid is not going to be amazing, but it'll be viable. Uh, I, I still think Carrion and Solar Creeper are crap. Poison Creeper is probably also crap, but it's got some potential. Um, I love how the Werewolf and the Werebear are being boosted a lot. I think a lot more people are going to play these builds. I think that's going to be really good stuff for them, especially with some extra casts. And then... The Fire Druid, I think, got the best changes of all. I think the Fire Druid's going to be a whole tier uh, stronger for sure with these changes. Uh, this is going to be a beastly build, and I think it might even elevate the Druid to a better status as a whole in terms of overall power level um, versus other characters. Just having these things available and uh, having more utility available to it. So it's it's a hybrid utility damage class. It's never going to be uh, the strongest solo DPS uh, efficiency class. Not with, its, not with its current frames and whatnot intact, but it is looking a lot better, and just a lot better across the board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, very good stuff. All right, Necromancer, my second favorite character. Let's go. Necromancer. Of course, I mostly love Poison Necromancer, but I gotta say I love everything about it. Necromancer, they didn't do that many changes to the Necromancer. So, um, honestly, this is one of, I guess in their opinion, is one of the build uh, characters where most of the skills work pretty well. And they do. They do. You know, they work pretty well. They have a use. Um... So Decrepify now updated to show all the status changes of what happens to a monster when they're Decrepified. Weaken, they made it actually, you know, a reason to actually level it up. For Amplify, it's for Radius. For Lower Resist, it's more Lower Resist. For Weaken, there was never too much of a reason to level it up, but now um, you can further weaken enemies, and you can uh, really make them very weak. So that could be quite nice. Um, poison and bone skills. So I'm actually a little concerned about little some of these changes. This one, I like this change because it made no sense that I think this is one of the only skills in the game where the synergies for the skill were stronger than leveling up the skill itself, um, which is bone armor. That was really weird. Um, I'm glad they fixed that because that was kind of weird. Bone spear and bone spirit. Yeah. Rabies might work if they allowed you to cast Twister. Yeah, but you can't. You can't cast elemental abilities in the uh, shape-shifting form still. So, no. Not yet. Not yet. All right. Um, these ones, I like these changes. I do, I do, I do. Um, I like how they're buffing bone. Octo, thank you so much for 18 months as a member of Xana's Attack Squad, the Ghost of the Machine, the Hurricane Disciples chat. Spam those eyes of Xana in the chat for Octo. I really like how they're buffing these because I feel like, especially in late game, bone skills are lacking in damage a bit. So I like the fact they are making them stronger. 
I yes, that 2.4 man, 2.4. The first big update to Diablo 2 in over a decade. They're doing it. They're doing it, man. First massive rework of lots of skills that need help and whatnot. Yeah, so Ash, that is exactly what I was going to say. So for PvE, I like these changes because I feel like they could be more powerful in PvE. But I'm going to tell you right now. In PvP, there's going to be a serious problem with these changes. Now, they said some of this stuff might screw up PvP. They literally said that in some of their press conferences for releasing this patch and whatnot on the PTR. But this is going to fuck it up, for sure. That is so much more damage for PvP. And this is already one of the strongest PvP builds because it's magic damage. You can snipe people with it. You can do it from afar. You hit great FCR breakpoints. And the magic damage can't be sorted. It does tons of damage. You increase the damages even more. This is threatening to be one of the strongest PvP builds in the game, period. Nothing's gonna... Th this is gonna be one of the more outlier PvP scenarios for sure if they do this. Um, it's a little concerning. Uh, I don't know what they're going to do about it for PvP, but... Okay, I'll do some. Ellie Druid can't lock down target anymore in PvP. Um... Really? Is that just because of a bug? It sounds like a bug. Anyway. Hey, what's up, man? How you doing? Meta going shake like crazy. Mm. Well, I can tell you one thing, though. I don't think this is going to shake up the meta too much, because I still think summon, I still think summon necro and poison necro are going to be a lot stronger than any, like, bow necro approach for PvE. That being said, though, these are going to be a lot stronger just in general, so that's going to help them out quite a bit. True, true. I don't think it's going to shake up the meta too much, but what I do think is that this change will make PvP, it's making an already very strong build even more strong, so that, that is a little concerning. Um, yeah, I mean, it does something in PvE, it does, don't get me wrong, it's just... I mean, this is really good, especially for leveling a Necro, because if you think about it, when you level a Necro, your strongest abilities are the Bone abilities. They are. When you're leveling a Necro, this is... Necros don't do a lot of damage. It, they really suffer trying to get through Hell, so I understand why they're doing this. They're doing this for players that just want to get through Hell on their Necromancer, and they don't have gear. And then if you have gear, you're probably not a bone necro, you're a summon necro or a poison necro, and that's fine. What I don't think they realize is how much they're already super strong in PvP at the highest level. So they're going to have to change like early game scaling versus late game scaling or something, because currently it's, uh, it's nasty. That would be nasty for sure in PvP, I could tell you. That's going to be insane. I got destroyed by so many bone necros in PvP. It's so hard to avoid the damage, and you just take tons of damage. And, and they're making them even stronger. That's crazy. Mm -mm -mm. Oh yeah, privilege. There you go, man. Sivrub's cudgel. Is spear used much in PvP? Yeah. Yeah. Um, in PvP, it's mostly bone spirit and bone spear. So, bone spirit for really long range, and then spear for somewhat closer range. That's usually how you play PvP on a Bone Necro. You can also use Teeth from, like, really far back, but... Eh. Kind of weird. Alright, anyway. Summon! Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, I don't think I've gotten to that yet. We're, we're, I'm commenting on every change, so we haven't, uh, we haven't gotten to that change yet. All right, raise skeletal mage. So they're making mages viable. Look at this. Okay, you know how everyone says poison mages do no damage? Look at this. 750% scaling on poison. <laughs> Does that mean they're going to do damage now? I don't know. What's 750 times zero? 
zero. What's 750 times one? One. What's 750 times two? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, I'm thinking. I'm, I'm, it, 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 depends, it depends on how close it is to zero, I guess. What we'll happens if well, the duration no longer scales and now lasts four seconds? Ah, see? And now they're fixing the poison scaling problem with this ability, too. And they're increasing the lightning scaling. By the way, these have always been the best mages, just the lightning mages. Everyone knew that if you actually wanted your mages to do damage, you had to get a full flock of lightning mages, otherwise they did no damage. Um, so the lightning mages do a bit more damage, the cold mages do even more damage. Fire mages also do a lot of damage. Uh, fire mages and lightning mages were always the best, and then it's the tooltip now properly display the light scaling per level. Okay, cool. I don't know if that's going to be enough to make people actually want to use the mages, but maybe. Maybe. No, they don't get in the way of the skellies. I think the thing is, is that, okay, so this is my problem with mages. Are they worth the 20 points? Are the mages, well, see, they're increasing their HP per level. Are they worth the 20 points? So you have to ask yourself, is this going to make them worth the 20 points? Are they worth those 20 points? Currently, when I play Necromancer, they are not worth 20 points. They're not worth summoning. They don't do any, they don't do enough. Is this going to make them worth the 20 points? My other problem is that cold damage from the cold mages, guess what they do? They freeze the monsters. What does that mean? That means the corpses freeze. What does that mean? That means you can't use the corpse explosion on them. So they really have to be worth it. That's all I'm going to say. Um, I'm just giving you my insights. I don't know. It's possible they could be worth it now. Maybe, sort of. At least early game. At least early game. I'll say, at least before Hell Mode and before you get, like, you know, a max build with, like, shit items, I think they're worth it, 100%. So, like, early mid game, I think this will make them worth it. Is this going to be worth it in end game build? I'm highly skeptical. Highly skeptical. Probably not. Breaking news, skeletal mage is just a yeah, but that's 750% on poison damage only. We'll have to see. We'll have to see. Maybe they are worth it. No, it's true. It's true. It's true, Ash. They were absolutely destroyed. So maybe this maybe this will fix all their problems. This might be what you want. Blood golems. More damage scaling on the blood golem. Okay. I'm not sure how this would ever make it better than Clay Golem, which slows targets, though. The Golem doesn't do that much damage to begin with. I don't know. I'm not convinced Blood Golems are any good still, but I don't know. Iron Golems. Now, this is interesting, because most endgame necromancers use iron golems, especially with aura weapons and items and things of that nature. This means that now, when the aura affected targets are attacked, such as you or the iron golem, it deals even more damage. So a poison nova necromancer actually got a bit of a buff with this. I don't know how much it buffed it. I don't know anything about this flat damage stuff, but I do know it exists. Hmm. Blood Golem needs like open wounds or something. Yeah, I think so. It needs something a bit more interesting. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Anyway, chat, what do you guys think about Iron Golem? What do you guys think? Just having that Thorns Aura, man. Flat amount of damage. More damage. Or free. Or free. It's just free damage. Interesting. Also, if you're a summon necromancer and you use an iron golem, that means that all of your summons now also return this damage when attacked as flat damage. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I use Iron Golem anyway, man. You use Iron Golem anyway, so it's just a free buff for every build that uses Iron Golem, which most builds do on an endgame Necromancer because you want the auras, like from an insight or something. So that's just a buff. That's just a buff straight up to the Necromancer. Well, I mean, I don't know. It's flat damage. We don't know how much damage it is. Maybe that's not a lot of damage. I don't know. It might not be much damage at all, but it is a buff. For whom the bell trolls, they don't have any more information than that. So we don't. Scorpion Cat, I think it's so much for the follow. Welcome to the Coles Dan Andrew State. That flat damage has to scale through difficulties, though, right? The health pool scaling from Norm, Nightmare, and Hell is huge on mobs. Yeah, we that's what I mean. Like it could mean any it could be nothing almost, or it could mean a lot. Holy fire level bonus per level increased from one to two. Oh man. That's not gonna do a lot for um for PvE, but that does mean that if you use a fire golem on a poison necro for PvP, that uh People that have one life or get close to one life are going to die even easier. And it's going to be easier to finish them off. Interesting. PvP buff to uh, Poison Necro chat. Fire Golem. More Holy Fire level. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, so that's all the Necro. That's it. Um, honestly, I think this class got the fewest changes. The least impactful changes overall. But when it comes to leveling a Necromancer, when you don't have any gear, you definitely would much rather have a stronger Bone Spirit and Bone Spear because th these are the problems. The problem is you don't do enough damage at Hell, and this would fix it. Uh, this would also, of course, make the builds even more viable later in the game. Maybe not that much more, um, but it would make them more viable later in the game. However, However, um, I think this is going to really make the uh, Bone Necro even more absurd in PvP. And uh, Mages definitely will be definitely be a much better idea earlier on in the game. Um, I don't know if that makes them worth it later. That has to be tested. It's kind of hard to tell. And we don't know anything about that thing, so who knows. Iron Golem just might be a free buff, though. Blood Golem will do nothing. Fire Golem, that won't do very much except for PvP most likely. Uh, finishing off 1 HP uh, uh, enemies will be even easier, even if they have a lot of fire res because he has a higher level of holy fire. And of course, that ability works a bit differently now, so you're good to go. And there's now a reason to actually put additional points in the weaken, which there never was before, which was definitely the Probably the most useless curse you can imagine. So this is a that's good. More and more support skills, good stuff. I I I think Necromancer is one of those classes where most of the skills are viable or at least somewhat useful anyway, so it makes sense that they don't actually have to do that much to the Necromancer. And if you know anything about poison necromancer, you know it's ridiculous in the late game. And if you know anything about Summon Necromancer, it is also ridiculous in the late game. And Corpse Explosion is like one of the most ridiculous abilities there is. So Necromancer is uh is doing fine. Yeah, they should have made it half physical, half magic, and then buff the damage. Um Right, right. So they could have hybridized the damage, or the damage they added to the bone spears and whatnot could have been physical and then in pvp you could deal with it with damage reduction right yeah now you're just going to get destroyed in pvp with it. hey man you know make those bone neckers for pvp you know kill them man start collecting ears man it's gonna be easy all right uh paladin defensive auras resist fire all right so now you know about the hidden max resist bonus you get for every two levels you put into the resist skills. If you didn't already know, if you put two points into resist lightning, resist cold, or resist fire, 
you get one maximum res for that res. That means that your, your res cap will be raised to 76. The second you put two hard points in a resist fire, you have 76 fire res. If you put two more in it, you have 77 capped fire res. So now people will know that's a thing because they never actually had it. It was a hidden bonus. Um, there's a lot of hidden bonuses and they're trying to make them all more transparent, which I think is good because those hidden bonuses are actually very useful. I actually describe them in a lot of my guides. Um, I actually uh, tell people to put more points in resist lightning to deal with Ubers easier and for Worldstone Keep and things of that matter on things like Zealers that don't need a lot of skill points so that they can increase their survivability. But most people don't realize why that is. You know, obviously I explained it there, but it's because it gives you more max race. Support is stuff. And then you don't even need T gods. Mm, defines passively buffs defense. No, that's a synergy for um, Holy Shield Mirage. Mirage, it is officially listed as a synergy for Holy Shield. That's why it appears like it passively buffs defense because you are always using Holy Shield. You're on a Paladin, pretty much. It doesn't passively buff it though. It, it's a synergy for Holy Shield. It, it buffs the other one. I don't think they have to do that. I think they're fine. Offensive auras. It's only hard points. Yeah, so if you put a hard point into defiance, then uh, you get the synergy bonus for Holy Shield. Holy Shield has a defense bonus from defiance. If you put hard points in it, then you get it. Simple. Synergies work from hard points only, not passive points. Something to mention, maybe for some new viewers or for people that don't understand that. That's how skills work in Diablo 2. If you think just your all skills increasing your level of a synergy is going to matter, those are soft points. You need hard points for the synergy uh, bonuses to be applied to a skill. Okay. Anyway, let's go. Offensive wars. Let's aim. All right, there's another hidden bonus. Yes, the passive attack rating bonus from putting hard points into blessed aim. Yes, that is a known one by most people, but not everyone knows that. Holy fire. Area damage now scales based on... Okay, so this is where some of the interesting stuff starts to happen on the Paladin. So... Defensive aura is pretty boring. I mean, most of the defensive auras are useful in one situation or another. Paladin has a very strong set of defensive auras, especially for group play. I think everyone knows that. Um, I don't think, you know, they need to make too many modifications to it, so it makes sense that they didn't do much to it. Once we get to the offensive auras, this is where some of the um, more interesting stuff starts happening. Now, not all of these offensive auras have always been useful or very good, or interesting. Um, fire Golem looks legit with the Holy Fire buff. I mean, with this Holy Fire buff too, potentially, yeah, because the damage scaling is there. And it doesn't have synergies, though. And it deals more damage. I think the closer it is whoever has the source of the holy fire so that would be you in the case of a paladin um so the aura now does more damage so the first thing i thought of when i saw this particular bonus now they buffed holy fire more because it makes sense that holy fire should do more damage because it's a fire skill so the fire skill should do more damage overall what this means, what this means theoretically, is what is possible, or what is possible on our hands here is a um, a double dragon hand of justice build, or just a hand of justice dragon build with Enigma, might actually be able to compete now with double dream. Uh, maybe even in exceed Double Dream under conditions of wearing Enigma. And if you're wearing Double Dream, the hybrid build where you wear Double Dream and where you wear Hand of Justice and Dragon might be really, really strong now. 
um, which is something that is, I currently have as a variant in my Dream Paladin guide. So this is very interesting stuff. Uh, I think you're going to melt. Yeah, this is going to hit really, really hard. The aura damage is hitting even harder if you're closer to the monsters. The damage level scaling is even higher. I think for on hit and the aura. I'm not sure if one or the other, but I'm assuming both. And more damage from a synergy. And remember, these synergies, if you level up these synergies, um, they will increase... Um, if you level up these synergies, they will increase the damage of item granted holy fire so that includes dragons and hand of justice that is interesting that is so interesting in fact that i think that it is very possible that the dream paladin has a rival in a more fire oriented approach or at least a hybrid approach for overall dps now is the dream approach still very good yes because you can use other very strong um synergies with it you can use like more physical damage using a grief you can go enigma and it's going to have a lot of damage and be very efficient um, however even with holy shock being dominant probably still in the end game i think this is going to be a very strong approach um, for earlier in the game i think holy fire chargers and zealers will become much more commonplace and you're going to see a lot more of those I think that's a very cool change, and I think it's going to make people actually want to play Holy Fire ones and not just Holy Shock ones. That being said, though, it does appear like Holy Shock also got a buff. So Holy Shock auras are already do insane damage. Even to Hell Monsters, the aura itself does a ton of damage. Now imagine that. And imagine like them getting double damage when they're close to you. That's that's a lot. So that means that Tesladin got a buff too. So it's not just the Holy Fire, even though I think the Holy Fire this could be broken. Even I'm not a hundred percent sure, but looking at some of these numbers, <laughs> we'll see, man. We'll see. We'll see, man. That could be some broken ass auras. I don't know. We'll have to find out. Holy Shock's pretty broken as it is, though. And you give that even more damage close to it. So now Tesladin's even stronger. So Tesladin's fine. Tesladin's, uh, Tesladin's strong anyway, so it doesn't care. Terms HC. Thank you so much for the follow. Welcome to Paul Xander say it turns hardcore. Let's go. We're doing hardcore D2 our ladder, by the way, if anyone doesn't know. And it drops. Hey, what's up, Moose? How you doing? Um, yeah, it makes me happy. I like Tesla. Now, the other thing that's cool, too, is they're also buffing Holy Freeze. Not a lot, though. And I think, they're re I think they recognize that Holy Freeze is not the damage aura. It's mostly the utility aura, and that's correct. It is. Uh, you, there's only one rune word that gives Holy Freeze anyway, which is Doom. So you can't stack it. Like, there's, you could have two dreams. You could have a Dream Helm and a Dream Shield. For Holy Fire, you could actually have a Dream Weapon, I mean, a, a, a Hand of Justice, which is a weapon, a Dragon Armor, and a Dragon Shield. So, level 44 Holy Fire, we're going to have to test that. That's going to be insane. Um, definitely going to be the craziest damage, I think. I don't think uh, Dream's going to be able to exceed the damage output, which is pure lightning damage. Maybe the Usually with the Tesladin, though, it's usually hybrid physical lightning damage anyway, so it's fine. Holy Freeze is still the utility approach, though. So it's to freeze the monsters. It's the safe approach. Um, it's supposed to be, but apparently they also wanted to boost the strength of the aura itself. So leveling up as a Holy Freeze dealer, maybe on Hardcore or something, is actually something that's more realistic. And then, of course, the Holy Fire. Yeah, that's going to be some serious pain. That is, uh, that's looking insanely strong now. Um, just from my testing before as well, like that's going to be a lot of damage. We're going to have to see how that stuff scales, but I imagine it's going to be pretty crazy. 
Someone said it one shots cows on players one at conviction max range with the new calculation. I believe it, man. Uh, it might be broken. I think they might have to tone some of these numbers down. We'll see, though. We'll see. We'll see. I mean, to be fair, Holy Shock does... Um, Holy Shock also one-shots monsters in uh, Players 1 Ash in, in Hell as well. Not cows necessarily, though. It does one-shot monsters. I'll have to see how strong that is, though. Mm -mm -mm. Tasty stuff, man. Tasty stuff. All right, anyway, Thorns. We talked about Thorns on Iron Golem. We also talked about it in Spirit of the Barbs. We don't know what this means. But it's possible that it could be useful for a party with lots of minions. I don't know. Maybe we have another good support build with all this extra flat damage that can be just applied to monsters that are attacking your party. I don't know. We'll have to see. Same for eight. Because they don't they don't have they don't even have numbers in here. See when they have numbers, it makes it a little bit easier to envision how powerful it's gonna be. Uh that one it's a lot tougher. This is a fire patch, dude. They really are. Okay, so I first of all, I'm really glad to see this, but they really are trying to make fire so much stronger. They're also they're also making more areas that don't have fire immunes better areas to farm. They really want fire builds to have more prominence, and I agree with them on this. It's it's a tough world for fire builds, especially without infinity. With infinity, eh, it's not that tough of a world. But without it, forget about it. So hard to do anything. Like you can do a couple things in the game, and that's about it. And you mostly have to just pass up the monsters. You can farm bosses, sure. Um, you can farm lots of bosses with fire, but <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, fire's looking good. Fire, I think they recognize that fire was hurting, especially early game. And that's where a lot of their focus has been. And especially with a lot of different abilities that aren't fireball, you know. Like, fireball is the one fire ability in D2, or maybe meteor, that you think of as, oh, damn. Or, like, enchant, I guess. You could also put enchant in that category where it's like, those are nice fire abilities. But guess what? They're all sorceress fire abilities. Um... And all the other fire damage in the game, pfft, no one would do it, man. No one would play it. And you know what? They're actually making them all very playable now. They're actually making it better. I like this because, I don't know, it's one of people's like primary, I would say it's a major chief complaint of a lot of the D2 community since the beginning that it really didn't pay off to make a fire damage build. And now it can. Now it can, so... Now it can. So I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fire is also the best looking in D2R2. Yeah, graphics wise, fire is on point. Oh yeah, Sanctuary, same thing with the Sanctuary as well. The magic damage or the uh, undead damage. So yeah, they're just trying to make them uh, the, the auras a bit feel more impactful. And it also... Um, it encourages melee play with the with the auras so by making the aura up to twice as strong uh close to your character so yeah crazy stuff mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all right combat skills let's go into the combat skills damn this video is gonna be long this is a full analysis. I'm going to make a much shorter video just for the root words, though. Anyone wants to get my analysis, though, they can, though. I go, I, we, we, go, we go pretty deep on some of this stuff, but... All right, so combat skills. Um, damn, bro. Sacrifice. Okay. Does anyone see this actually encouraging people to play Sacrifice? Maybe early on, just because it makes it like less painful to play it. But we're talking like really early game here. Yeah, better for level 1 through 11. Right, I think that was the point too. I think they just wanted to encourage... Um, maybe wanted to make it a little less painful to play this build. 1 to 11. 
I think people were probably complaining about dying as they were just trying to make a zealer. I don't know. I dropped some points in this, uh, sack. Well, yeah, I mean, I do too. Eh, okay. I mean, good early game change, I guess. It's not going to make it like viable late game, but since it's a zero point skill anyway, I guess, or level zero skill, I think it's fine. Yeah, that's true. All right. Yeah, level zero skill shouldn't be viable in the late, late game anyway, so. At least I don't think so, so I think that's fine. Conversion! Hmm. Interesting. I don't know if this would actually encourage too many people to use it. Unless they felt like they couldn't just outright kill the monsters. So if they felt like maybe they were like in a jam and there's like too many monsters surrounding them, maybe they would make conversion work i don't know i mean maybe it's a maybe it's a 1.1 wonder now you put one into conversion and you can save yourself as a melee paladin i don't know i don't know. i don't think it's a build i think it's still i think it's a support skill could be interesting 50 percent was kind of trash so 90 percent actually makes it viable as a support skill because now when you use conversion most of the time when you hit something it's going to convert it yeah, exactly. You convert the death lords, right? So it might be, it just might be a nice quality of life support for, I don't know, all these new melee offensive war builds we're trying to make, or just, you know, Zealer's standard builds. I don't know. I, I think that's actually promising. 90%'s a lot. 50%, I think, was the main problem. Is like, why would you use a skill that is trash, doesn't do a lot of damage, has no damage on it, actually, but it converts. Only 50% of the time. Super unreliable, you know. I don't think they follow you, no. But it's it's good for the area that you're in, so. I don't know, 90%. That's maybe good enough. Duration is still meh. Yeah, that might be something they might need to help with. Yeah. I don't know. It it might be. I'm not saying it will be, but I th I could see people using this now. I before I couldn't even see people using this at all. Now I see it as something that you might actually want to use for uh, some extra bodyguards when you need them on demand. On demand. My tool tip now shows that the skill always hits. I might even want to put something about that. Um. Okay. Well, I mean, if you didn't know that Smite always hits, then uh, you haven't played for a very long time, probably. <laughs> now, to be fair, I'm glad they're trying to make this more obvious to players. Like, why do you use Smite if it doesn't damage? It hits. No, of course they wouldn't change Smite. Yeah, it's fine. Guys, they are trying to maintain the integrity of things that work and trying to fix things that don't work. That is the main goal of their patch here. Um, and I think that is a great goal. I think that is a very honorable goal, and I think that's what they should be going for. So they're doing... They, I think their philosophy behind this patch, as you can see so far, is a good philosophy. Are they making all the right changes? Are they doing enough for some skills? Maybe there's some skills they're not doing enough for, but a lot of them they probably are. And when you think about it, like, the philosophy itself is a good philosophy. It is to make it to where the stuff that isn't working, or just, you know, people never play because it's trash and it's garbage, like, this just doesn't do anything, does something, and you would actually want to play it. Is it going to be, are they going to be S-tier abilities necessarily always? No. I mean, I don't see Raid Skeleton Mage being the S-tier approach in late game. But it definitely can help out people leveling or even just playing through the game normally as a summon necromancer, which can be a problem. You know? Is it going to make these S tier abilities for PvE? No, but it helps, you know, playing through the game as a teeth necromancer. Is it going to make it broken for PvP? Probably. Um, but yeah, you get the idea, though. You know, you can play through the game as a summon druid now. It's actually possible. You get enough damage on summons and you have enough tank potential to make it work. You know, it's like, well, and when you think about it, you know, people want these things, you know, they do. 
Mm, holy bowl changes are huge for team play. Oh yeah, let's go into combat skills, but we didn't finish right. So holy bolt removed synergy blessed hammer. Damage increased by 50%, which is only to undead enemies, by the way. Now pierces targets, undead and allies. That's huge, actually. Because now you can heal multiple allies at the same time. That also means you can hold, uh, heal multiple minions at the same time, and mercenaries, and allies. It pierces. It pierces all the way through. And it doesn't stop when it heals an ally. It actually pierces through, and it does damage to undead enemies. So now there's a way to clear Wave 2. Exactly! Wave 2 bail! Wave 2 bail, so that means when you're sitting there in a group, and you have Holy Bolt, you can heal the people that are, you know, trying to kill the wave on top of it, the melee classes and the people that attack in melee range, like Hammerdins and whatever else. And then you can heal them, and they can clear the mages, and then you can clear the Unravelers, because it pierces through the Unravelers. So it will pierce through all undead targets. That means it can pierce through Unravelers, too. And that also means that Hammerdins now have a better solution for killing magic damage monsters. This is a little bit insta pindle killer. Yeah, this could be very good for killing a pindle too. Um, you know, I actually see a holy bolt or a heladin potentially being a build now. Because there are areas you can clear with just holy bolt now. Yeah. And maybe Fist of the Heavens, which is interesting. And you can make it as a support build. So I think that's actually big because people, it, it was kind of clunky to use. It was like a last resort skill people might use sometimes to kill a single undead one at a time. Of course, they're also increasing its damage just across the board. So this thing's going to do a lot of damage now. Um, it re did remove the Blessed Hammer synergy, though. So I think that's not going to really increase its damage that much. I think because they realized they didn't want to buff uh, Hammered in even more. I think that's why they did that. Um, with the Pierce change. And that makes sense. Uh, except, I feel like this is still a buff to a Hammered in, right? Think how fast the Holy Paladin will clear the Crypt. Yeah, or Mausoleum, or Stony Tomb even. It should, it should clear Stony Tomb pretty fast. It's another 85 area. Uh, it can clear Pendle Skin. Pendle Skin will get destroyed by this thing. Blood more. Yeah. I mean, that should be viable now, 100%. So a Heladin support that also does damage. I think Heladin is actually a build now, strangely enough. Hmm. Heladin was like more of a meme. It was a build, but it was kind of a meme. Now maybe it's not a meme. Maybe it actually makes sense. And you can play this build and it helps your team and you can play it solo. It's possible. I'm just saying, like, I'm just thinking of the possibilities here. Like, dude, there's ways you can do things. Also, there were, okay, so, oh yeah, so by the way, I still think this is a buff to Hammerdin. What do you guys think? Do you guys think, do you guys think that um, Hammerdin Got a buff from the Holy Bolt change here. Yeah, it kind of did. Because if you think about it, one of the only main weaknesses of the Hammered in is what? You can't kill magic immunes. And guess what all magic immunes are, except for like one type of magic immune in the whole game, which is a Wailing Beast. They're all undead. Which means that if it can pierce, you could potentially even wipe out magic immunes with a Hammered in. You could. And now there's actually more of a reason instead of to max out Holy Shield or to max out Defiance when you're done with Holy Shield, if you want to go a more offensive approach on a Hammered In, you can get the damage to do it because you can max out Holy Bolt. People do max out Holy Shield, but you don't need to. Exactly. So th this, is the, this is the analysis stream. We got to do all the analysis, right? So let's talk about how this can be used and what it actually means, right? Okay, so you know, we talked about how the Iron Golem can be used on all the Necromancer builds, and we talk about all this stuff. This is a Hammered in buff. 
I'm just saying, PK Addict needs to move to the fall. Welcome to Cole Anderson. This is a hammer debuff. Because you don't need Holy Shield on a hammer to be maxed. You can max Holy Shield. It helps. It does. But you do. You usually have P combs anyway, right? So you usually have enough like soft points in the Holy Shield that it carries to the soft points. So you have enough soft points for duration, defense, to have decent defense. You could max out Holy Shield. It'll give you more life through you know saving decks, and it will give you more um, defense. And of course, it'll increase its smite damage. But that's you're not a smiter. You're a hammer. So in the case of this example, I think that's a hammer buff. I think what happens is now what you want to do on a hammered in, especially if you're planning on doing Bale a lot, it kind of depends on what you're doing on the hammered in. Let's say you're doing Chaos. If you're doing Chaos, uh, I wouldn't, I, I do Holy Shield for sure. But if you're doing mostly Bale and World Stone, Unravelers, Bale Wave 2, makes sense. Makes sense. Max out Holy Bolt. The Max Holy Bolt build on the Hammerdin makes a lot more sense in more scenarios now. And anyway, that's a buff to the Hammerdin because it makes him more versatile and makes him more capable of destroying those areas as well. Hammerdin's already an S tier build. So just like with the Battle Order synergy change on uh, Berserk Barbarian, some of those S tier builds are getting buffs indirectly through changing other skills, which is pretty crazy. So some of these already insanely strong builds are seeing uh, some crazy buffs here. Their goal is only buffs. They're trying to make things that don't work work and things that already work stay the same, except some things that are already working, you might notice have also gotten buffed, but only slightly. So these are kind of slight buffs. I wouldn't say it's like huge buff to a hammered in, but it makes them more versatile, so that's, that's something. Um, I mean, I wouldn't say the uh, Battle Order's buff is enormous for Berserk, but it, it definitely helps. Can't say it doesn't. Alright, Fist of the Heavens. Casting delay reduced from 1 second to 0.4 seconds. Alright, so guys, um, I recommend not PvPing ever again. And the second uh, you see a, uh, a, 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 a Paladin with Conviction Aura under them, just... just Run back into town and kiss a Kara cause for the rest of eternity because you, you're not going to want to go back out there, bro. Um. <laughs> okay, so remember how I said Bone Necro is going to be broken in PvP? All right, so this is another interesting analysis point. So Fist of the Heavens is already a very powerful PvP ability. Why? Because it does a shit ton of lightning damage. And it, it auto-targets as long as your cursor is somewhere near where they're at. And um, it will, uh, a matter of fact, they even improve the targeting functionality. So, you don't worry about that either. Um, and it has, uh, you max out Conviction. And uh, yeah, if you're not like stacked to the brim on Lightning Res, you are going to be smoked with this shit so vt that is a pvp build he's talking about the uh vindicator templar it's the name of a type of a pvp build that hybridizes i believe smite and fist of the heavens if i'm correct am i correct ash pretty sure um yeah i'm pretty sure it's smite fist of the heavens hybrid so what he's talking about is that now even if they have the light res, you can just jump on them with smite and kill them. So you have smite, and now you have a fist of the heavens with less cast delay, which means you can fire this thing off way faster. Doesn't have the shared cooldown. So reduce the casting delay, which means this thing is going to kill you fast. That damage is going to be on you like a hot tamale. It's going to be on you very fast. So instead of waiting super long for it to hit something, it's a lot faster. Now, I think this change was for PvE, and it helps PvE quite a bit because now you can kind of just railgun the monsters from the sky. That's good stuff. It's especially going to be good uh, with the Holy Bolts piercing the undead and the allies as well. So in I can see Fist of the Heavens um, doing very, very well 
like in, let's say in Stony Tomb once again, or from Pendleskin. As a matter of fact, for damage, the primary approach might be Fist of the Heavens. And then if you want the summon or the support approach, it's gonna be Holy Bolt. That is gonna clear so fast, it will. So I don't think Holy Bolt will be the primary damage approach. However, it does even more damage with the Holy Bolts itself, so maybe it will. Maybe this is gonna be how you kill Pendleskin, and this is how you clear the Crypt and Mausoleum and Stony Tomb and things of that nature. I don't know. All I can tell you is that it's looking a lot better. That, that Castle is a pretty big deal. Um, and the piercing targets is a big deal as well. And it doesn't force you to attack using a regular attack when you're out of mana, so they remove some of the awkwardness as well. So I don't see it being like a super top tier PvE skill in either of these really, but what I do think is that they're going to be a lot more useful. Very much so. So... This is dangerous for PvE, though, because Fist of the Heavens, like Bone Necro, is also one of the strongest PvP skills. So for PvP, this could be a problem, making this even more ridiculous, um, for sure. And since there's ways to hybridize not just pure Fist of the Heavens builds, like with pure Griswold set or whatever, you can even use like Smite and Charge on top of it, it's going to be nasty. Um, yeah, it's gonna be nasty. I, I see I see some already very strong PvP builds being made even stronger. And that's uh <laughs> it's dangerous stuff, man. What's up, Laomi? How you doing? Pretty excited about the sin and the zon changes. Yeah, yeah, lots of good changes. Anyway, so that was the paladin. And I'm most excited to see just how ridiculous holy fire is. Some very nice buffs here. Definitely some interesting potential for the healing and the damage. And overall expanding the functionality of the auras and the skills that need more help and that don't get used. And even a small buff to a Blessed Hammerden that points into Holy Vault. Which might be smaller than a small buff. Be pretty big in some areas. I don't think the Hammered Inn is going to fear uh, areas like Ancient Tunnels and Beowave 2 quite as much as they used to. Uh, I think the Hammered Inn now has full dominion, once again. <laughs> but you know what? The Hammered Inn has always been uh, a great build. The thing about the Hammered Inn, though, is some people think it's automatically like the best build. Not necessarily. The way it deals damage isn't always the most efficient for a lot of areas. It's very efficient for Chaos, arguably maybe the most efficient for Chaos. But it's never going to be like the most efficient way of dealing damage in every area of the game because of how the ability works. But you're absurdly tanky, you do an absurd amount of damage, and you can kill almost every monster. So there's that. Alright, um, Sorceress, let's go. Alright, so Sorceress, this is my favorite class. This is the character I'll likely try to get to 99 on Hardcore. She can be very squishy, but you can also build her very tanky if you know how to. Sorceress arguably is the strongest class overall in the game. So any buffs to any of this stuff or any improved functionalities will mostly just be improved functionalities. The Blizzard does a ton of damage. Um, you have Teleport, of course, granted on the Teleport uh, on the Sorceress, so it's crazy. Frozen Orb could use a small damage buff, but they're not giving it it, so that's okay. Frost Nova. This is interesting. So, Frost Nova and Nova, Nova's getting a synergy, static fuel, and Frost Nova is getting a damage buff. What do you think this means to me? What do you think this makes me want to do? If I could get three piece towels, and I get a good or like Oculus and a lot of just all skills all over my build, and then I get a lot of magic fine. I see a lot of potential in a build that doesn't currently exist because it makes no sense. But if you get enough damage on Frost Nova, it almost does enough damage already. With 25%, it should do enough damage based on all the testing I've done. 
And if you give static field, as a synergy on Nova, this is what you can do. The hula hoop sort, exactly. Double Nova. So this is the double Nova Sorceress. Jack, thank you so much for the follow. Welcome to Cold Zan and Day. So, oh yes, it is. I'm not, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about that more when I get to Nova, but max out Static Field, max out Nova, max out Lightning Mastery, max out Frost Nova, and then guess what? Guess what? Max out Cold Mastery. What do you think happens? Put the rest of the points into the support skills if you want. Double Nova. Bro. Bro. Double Nova, bro. So you could get up to 7k Lightning Nova. And you can get Cold Nova. So this means that you don't have to fear immunities at all, pretty much. And you can blast the enemies, which with ever Nova, they are going to be weakest against, according to their resistances or immunities, or just how much damage each one does. So you can have a double Nova Sorceress. That's correct. Uh, that does appear to be something that is very, very viable here. And it's going to 100% be viable. If you have an affinity, oh, bro, if you have an affinity on top of this, crazy. Also... With such a high level static field, you could even hit bosses from like across the screen, take them down to half, and then just use like lightning Nova on them. Double Nova Sorceress, yeah. And it, it's gonna be possible. You could use three piece towels, full towels, double Nova Sorceress, um, magic find 100%. I see double Nova being very possible with this change. Um, yeah. Frost Nova almost one shots a lot of mobs already in the ancient tunnels in P1. Gets a 25% damage scaling. It will one shot the mobs if there's one. Um, you know, let's actually take a look at something, actually. Let's take a look at Frost Nova. Just to check this out here. So it does receive synergies though. So you could. You could, you could focus Nova, which does make maybe some more sense because it benefits more from conviction. And then you could have Frost Nova as like a secondary Nova. Or you can go main Frost Nova, and then you could have Lightning be the secondary Nova. And it just depends on which areas you want to farm. So the Hula Hoop Sorceress is going to be a, a build as uh, Mirage has so aptly called it. Um, that's going to be very interesting. Um, I think you could also just go pure Frost Nova, believe it or not, or pure Nova. And you could also do something like Hydra, maybe. Um, so you could put down Hydras, and then you could do that as well. Uh, there's a lot of combinations that are going to be more possible because of some of these changes. Uh, Sorceress already has a lot of hybrid combinations, and now I think there's going to be even more. You could do like Fireball Blizzard already, Fireball Nova. Fireball Nova will likely not even be affected by that change at all. But they're all very valid changes. Nova plus Frozen Orb looks pretty high DPS. True. And you could also go things like that. Except those abilities work almost so different that the builds would kind of clash a little bit. Because like one of them is a cooldown ability and the other one's an FCR ability. You have to be careful. It's, there, there's some hybrids that don't make too much sense. Like, I think the double Nova build makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think... Um, I think Hydra would make sense because you put it down and forget about it, and then you start nova -ing. But you can't do Orb and Nova at the same time, so... Uh, I mean, it works against things that are immune, of course, but... I don't know. Not every combination works as good as uh, every combination, but... Yeah. Blizzard. Casting delay will no longer share its cooldown with other skills. Yes, okay. Same thing. Frozen orb. Um, frozen armor. All right. They increased the level one duration. 
which just makes it last longer. It's already like the strongest armor. But let's talk about this here. This is this is something I saw that was fascinating. Um, why do you feel sorry for Zahn, Druid, and Barb? Um, they are pretty solid. Uh, Barb already has some of the best PVE builds. So does Zahn. Um, Zahn got huge buffs to some of its skills. I wouldn't feel too sorry for the Zahn. Druid got some huge buffs too. Druid is, Druid is probably still not like insane or anything, but that's okay. I don't think Druid's like that insane, but Druid's gonna still be uh it's gonna be a lot better than it was. A lot of the skills are gonna feel better. Yeah, we we haven't even gotten to that yet, Ash, but yeah, we will. Alright, um So we can check that out. This is interesting stuff. Okay, so remember how I, I talked about my shiver armor sorceress that I used to PvP with and I used to kill like zeal barbs and shit and like whirlwind barbs and like GM PvP. Well, guess what? If you thought it was a meme then, do you still think it's a meme now? Just have to ask you that question. If I'm fighting, I'm a sorceress, and I want to kill a guided arrow zone, and I go 25,000 defense sorceress with max block and max DR, and I get energy shield and all that stuff. Oh, it does. It already does, Ash. It does. It already destroys them. Oh, yeah, it shreds them. If they don't have max cold res and tons of cold absorb, they die really fast. They, if they only have one Raven or Frost, they will die usually before they kill you. And that's now. Damage level scaling increased by 25 Oh, man. If I PvP, man, I'm remaking this shit, dude. <laughs> I'm making it. I got the chilling armor bonus too, and it's two hundred percent. This means I could even kill sorceresses, maybe with this shit. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm oh yeah. This is a real build, bro. It already works. That's the crazy part. And now it's gonna be even stronger. Now the funny thing about this, though. Is that for the most part, most people aren't really concerned about that. They're concerned about the duration, especially of frozen armor for speedrunners. But chilling armor, if you want the most amount of defense, you want chilling armor. And of course, it retaliates against ranged enemies. But if you want the most defense bonus, you don't go frozen armor anymore or shiver armor, you go chilling armor. And it makes sense because it is the one on the bottom. So, it's the one that's the hardest to get to. So I can see this being useful on a sorceress that has a ton of defense or that has like maybe like an F up scolders or something. You can increase your defense even further by focusing on chilling armor. So now there's more approaches than just going frozen armor. That being said, frozen armor freezing the enemies in place is very good to avoid FHR lock. So I still think most people are still going to use frozen armor. But now there's options potentially for doing. Um, yeah, there's actually options for doing this. Prereqs not removed from Armageddon is dog shit. Oh, you mean the cold ones? Yeah, but the fire druid's still really good now. Like, honestly, they fixed most of the big problems. That's not even a big problem. At least you get hurricane and uh, cyclone armor for, for free, right? So, yeah. No, that's really good. That's really good. I actually really like this, and it gives more of a reason to use these things. Um... You could just go a pure passive uh, sorceress now, though, especially with that change. So you can do a passive sorceress, and on top of that, it already destroyed in PvP with the right gear. I've proven this. I even have a build for it. Wait, I should post it in the chat so people can... This is one potential build type. Oh, what is it? 
What is it called? There you go. There you go. That's a Shiver Armor Sorceress. There you go. Um, it's a build that gets a lot of pre-buff. So you basically get a lot of like Shilling and Shiver Armor pre-buff. You get a ton of defensive stats. You get a ton of base life. Um, you could also go the Energy Shield approach, though, which is where you go a lot of flat MDR and DR and then rely mostly on Energy Shields. So you could do that as well. Uh, that's not the approach I was using, but you could just as easily do that. Um, there is a, there's like two major approaches for it, but anyway, either one is, can be very good, They're just different in different situations. So anyway, and they're actually really fun builds, uh, to do. So I think that's actually kind of neat. Lightning skills, statics, okay, so here we go with the Nova. We already talked about double Nova a bit, but let's talk about something else. So Nova is already one of the, uh, Nova... Static Field is already one of the best leveling Sorceress builds once you hit 18. So the second you hit 18, you put one point into Teleport. You have your one point of Telekinesis, you get one point of Frozen Armor. Maybe get one point into Frost Nova if you don't have it on an Orb or Swap or something. And then you put all the rest of your points into Nova in Static Field. That is already one of the most dominant builds, if not the most dominant build for speedrunning a Sorceress. It is the most dominant build for speedrunning a sorceress, but that change right there just makes that approach even better because it gives Nova free damage from doing what you're already going to do at level 18, which is put half your points into static field. Why do you put so many points into static field on the speedrun of sorceress? Because you want to increase the range. Static field is super overpowered, especially a normal, because you can get monsters down to 1 HP. Uh, in Nightmare, it's only down to 33%, and I think in Hell, is 50%. But, you put half those points even at level 18 just to get such a huge static field. So what you do is you jump into a mob, you cast Frost Nova, so they're super slow, and then you just pound down those static fields until they're within kill range on one or two Novas, or a few Novas. That's how you do it. And... Now it was just even stronger with that approach. So now static doubles Nova's damage since Light Mastery is a separate multiplier from the synergies. Right. So now, now Nova is really strong. As a matter of fact, it's so strong that it makes me wonder if switching to Blizzard is even still the meta once you hit Nightmare. It might be, especially if you're concerned about survivability and you don't have enough res. You didn't get your Ancients Pledge and you didn't get all your other stuff. But. Hey, I know it has big mana costs, but it makes me wonder, though, if you can't just pound out Nightmare with Nova rather than just, like, Blizzard. You could maybe just stick with Nova the whole way now. I mean, it's possible. Possible. Not saying it's likely, but it's possible. Possible, possible, possible. It's possible, man. It is what it is. It is what it is. And and even better, you could go Fireball Nova or something. And you can get a lot out of it. Lake Javelin does look pretty legit now. You're going to have to see how it works. Mm-mm-mm. All right, so static field, thunderstorm, static field synergy added, seven percent lightning damage per level. Hmm. Okay, so static field, nova, and thunderstorm all appear to be kind of keying off of one another. So you max out static field, and not only do you get a maxed out nova when you max a nova, but if you max out thunderstorm. You also get a very high damage thunderstorm. Wow. So pure Nova is a full build now, chat. Thunderstorm might actually finish some things off. Oh, I think it will. It already can one-shot mobs in players one. I mean, it's copying PD2 in some ways, Carmiria. But not always. It's not copying it in always. It's copying it in a lot of ways. 
So that's really good stuff. That's really good stuff. Um, it, it, it is copying it in a lot of ways, though, for sure. I agree with that, 110%. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. There aren't. It isn't a carbon copy, though. So you, you got to be careful about saying that they just stole everything from PD2. I think some people might say that, but let's be real here. Um, PD2 just removed Frozen Armor, okay? <laughs> they just removed it. And they didn't do these things to it, I'll tell you that much. Uh, they removed cooldown on Frozen Orb completely. I mean, I can just go through this and just say how there's so many differences. Like, Holy Bolt, you can have, like, multiple missiles. Fist of the Heavens, the Holy Bolts damage everything, not just undead. Um, let's see. Uh, these auras, they just massively increase their damage. They don't really change how they work necessarily in PD2. Um, let's see here. I mean, up to three bone spears. I mean, they make it to where you can have multiple golems and how Skeletal Mage Pure can be a build. Uh, one thing that's similar, though, is that Carrion Vine and Stellar Creepers still suck balls. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, they make it to where you can summon multiple things at the same time instead of putting all the damage into just Ravens, even though on PD2, they also put a lot of the damage into Ravens, and arguably it is the only damage against Uber. So there is some similarity there. I, I think I noted that was probably one of the biggest similarities between PD2 and D2R now is the Raven emphasis, but they didn't do it nearly the same way. Um, definitely different scaling on all these abilities. I don't know. This isn't really quite the same on PD2. Well, actually on PD2, they kind of did make the Elemental Druid pretty similar to this. They did remove a lot of the cooldown stuff. But that makes sense. Double throw, they still haven't like they haven't made infinite quantity or anything, so they're they're kind of going a slightly different direction, but it is similar. They added Pierce. They added Pierce. Grim Ward is actually quite a bit different though. Um These are quite these are actually similar to PD2 too, though. I have to admit, um the adding synergies to all the blade skills, that is pretty similar to PD2. Uh, but their emphasis on weapon damage and some other things is a little bit different. And then uh, changing how these abilities work, quite a bit different. But Death Sentry is still a beast, though, on D2R, no doubt. So I don't know. And then this works quite a bit differently than it does on P2, where there's no third charge and it just automatically consumes them. And you don't need to use finishers, so you can just like spam one of these abilities. It's quite a bit different. For martial arts. Martial arts rework in D2R is very different than in PD2. Um, that's a very different approach. I'm not sure which is better, actually. It's kind of a... We'll find out. Um, I mean, strafe overall, very similar stuff, I would say, because I think uh, I think they also removed the weapon penalty on, uh, on PD2. I'd say Martial Arts Assassin is a very simple approach on PD2. I agree with that. And that can make it boring as well, though. So I think maybe... I, I might even like the D2R Martial Arts rework more than the PD2 Martial Arts rework. I'm not going to say which one I like better now, but I'd prepare yourself for me saying maybe a very surprising thing when I come across it. You never know. Volcron, thank you so much for the follow. Welcome to the Colt Xander's Day. Um... I actually think this Fen change might make Fen better on D2R than D2, uh, PD2, actually. PD2 doesn't do this. PD2 doesn't do this with Impale, either. I think they just removed Impale. I think I think, I think think PD2 removed Impale, actually. I think they removed the skill, if I remember right. Uh, they also increased AoE on these, but if you give them enough damage and make them less clunkier, you might actually... I don't know. They took a very different approach to Plague and Poison Javelin, too. So they're very different, guys. It's not... Don't don't think this is just stealing things from PD2. There are some things that are similar, and even in a few cases, they're almost identical. 
But, but I, I don't, I, I don't know. I think they, I think the D2R team was thinking of their own approaches, uh, trying to keep the game as um, dynamic as possible, not making anything too broken. And in order to do that, you can't go too hard on some things, but you do have to recognize that some things just don't work. So I, I think there's quite different approaches here. Um, quite different approaches, but yeah. Um, anyway, I haven't gone through all the changes yet, though, so we can't do that one yet, PK Addict. Ask me that at the end. Anyway, um, someone just asked me about, like, some people were talking about, like, PD2 versus D2R. Uh, if you don't know, PD2 is Project Diablo 2. It's, like, the most popular mod in D2. They're very different stuff. Um, it, they, they, they made their own reworks of a lot of abilities and a lot of skills. They did their own stuff, and they did, had, I'd say there's very different approaches, though. I think in D2R, they haven't created any skills. I think in PD2, they created their own skills. They've deleted skills. Uh, it's definitely a lot more radical in PD2, and it definitely shows. I mean, even Teeth is like an endgame ability in PD2. Uh, it's not meant to be an endgame ability, uh, especially as a level 0 skill in D2R. And there's no Teeth there. So it, there's just so many, there's, there's so many differences, it's crazy. Um, unless it starts becoming more and more similar, you could probably say that. I think the Nova Thunderstorm synergizing thing, though, they don't totally synergize like in PD2, but there is some similarity into where they're making a uh, Thunderstorm like Eye of the Storm, like a Nova um, focus, which is something I really like. And I like that Nova and Thunderstorm are going to go together, and it might make T-Storm actually pretty good for PvE, potentially. You can go pure Nova now, too. You don't have to hybridize it. You can just go pure Nova, especially with this change to Thunderstorm. Uh, one thing that concerns me about this change of Thunderstorm, though, is guess what? What do you think I'm going to say, chat? What have I been concerned about with some of these uh, skills already? Yo. Uh, especially some we just went over. Um, well, we haven't tested it, J-Ro, but it's looking very... Very promising. Um, I'm really thinking, I think Fire Arrow is going to be really good. D2R did it perfectly. Buff the charge ups and keep the finishers useful. Bingo. Yeah, I think D2R's martial rework might actually be better. I think it might be more interesting. Uh, I think it might keep the dynamism of the uh, martial arts um, alive. I think it's going to be good stuff. Um, I don't know. I, I think so. I, 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 I can't criticize PD2's approach too much, but what I can say is one thing that kind of feels bad in PD2 is that you're literally just repetitively using one skill over and over, which is kind of... Eh. Yeah, man. All right, anyway. Um. All right, so... Here we go. I mean, it's not bad. It's okay, but, you know, that's the approach they took, though. I didn't even put it in my feedback. By the way, there is a Season 5 PD2 feedback document up. I posted it in my Discord. Um, I think it's live on here as well. So if I go, let's see, is it here? Yeah, there it is. Yes, sir. That's it. Okay, anyway. We're, we're, we're not doing that right now. Um, anyway, if you guys want to contribute to uh, Season 5 PD2 feedback, um, let me know. It's a 16-page document currently. I also posted it on Reddit, so go check that out if you're interested in improving Project Diablo 2 for Season 5. We are starting to close our PD2 content, and it will 100% be closed by the 25th of January. When we start this, um, we will be doing D2R uh, for quite a while until... Uh, Likely until PD2 Season 5 is on the horizon. 11 months, that guy, Zodiac, thank you so much, dude. For 11 months, as a member of Xana's Attack Squad, the Ghost of the Machine, the American Disciples. Chat, spam those items of Xana in the chat for that guy, Zodiac. All right. Anyway. So, what do you think I'm concerned about, though? What do you think I'm concerned about, Thunderstorm-wise, chat? Act 5 Merc casting Battlecry to ruin Lobringer Act 5 Merc, which is like the only reason to use one. 
I don't like that, no. Um, I don't like that Battlecry can override Decrepify. I think they need to fix that Ultimus. I think that's a potential problem, but we haven't gotten to the Act 5 Mercenary yet. Uh, when we get to that, we'll talk about it more. What do you think is the problem with this Thunderstorm buff, chat? What do you think could be bad about this? Please tell me someone's experienced this before. Come on. Please. Anyone in the D2 community. Yeah, I think they should be able to stack ultimates. I agree. I don't think it should override curses. That's right. Do you know how annoying it is? Okay, Alex, Alex knows. Do you know how annoying it is? In Infinity Scythe. Energy shield, just teleport around. All you have to do is just teleport around and then you die. If you don't have like crazy light res. He gets Infinity Scythe, has tons of negative light res, and you literally just teleport around and Thunderstorm kills you. That is a PvP build, believe it or not. And once again, just like Fist of the Heavens. <laughs> just like just like Fist of the Heavens. This is going to make that build even stronger. <laughs> and it was already annoying. And it's going to make it even more annoying. It's going to teleport around and kill you in like two shots just with thunderstorms. It's going to be stupid. And, and see, the, the, the shitty part is you can't kill them. The shitty part is you can't kill them because they'll just teleport around. They have like at least 105 FCR and they're just buzzing around you like a fly. And so they can constantly evade your attacks because all they have to do is teleport. Like the most annoying build ever. Yeah. ACL, thank you so much for four months as a member of Zan's attack squad that goes to the Machine Arcan Disciples. That is one problem I see with this. Uh, once again, some really weird PvP interactions that can occur here that can just make some of the more annoying builds even more annoying. That is, uh, that's the truth. Fist of the Heavens and Thunderstorm. Uh... Crazy bone spirit and spear damage from afar. Oh, it's gonna hurt, man. It's gonna hurt. Alright, energy shield. Tooltip updated to display more information. Yay! People will now finally know what the telekinesis synergy does. Yay! They actually knows that it will reduce the amount of mana taken per point of health and damage. Yay! <laughs> we'll actually know. People are like, what? telekinesis do dark humility it just says it's a synergy for energy shield Aha! we'll finally know well, i already know but everyone will finally know like oh it strengthens the energy shield uh russia banned bitcoin rip I'm not invested in Bitcoin right now. It's too volatile. Uh, too many governments are cracking down on it. I, I it's, it's too crazy, man. It, it's got to be more stable for me, man. But you know, if you like to gamble, do it. It's a great gamble, dude. It's like, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's the new, it's, it's the 21st century casino uh, cryptocurrency. Get at it, man. Invest. Don't lose it all. At least try not to. It's the ultimate casino, dude good shit all right anyway fire skills burn it hmm yeah it's probably what it is yeah they, <laughs> it's too easy to hack hmm maybe all right so inferno is quite interesting actually inferno is very interesting so Kind of like with Arctic Blast, they're almost doubling this one's damage. They're probably more than doubling this one's damage with Warmth. Because it's fire damage, they want to do more than cold damage. And they're also reducing the mana cost and they're increasing its range. Now this kind of does scream a little bit PD2. Like some people are like, oh, it's copying PD2 in some ways. Like Kermiria mentioned that. And... This one's pretty similar, yeah. This is very similar to the PD2 change in Inferno. Massively increasing its range. Increasing the synergy. Increasing the scaling. Should be interesting. I kind of like this, though. Um, it's kind of fun. I, I don't think this is, like, super efficient or anything, but it could be kind of fun. Blaze. 
Oh yeah, one thing I didn't mention on the druid when I talked about Arctic Blast, I actually forgot to talk about this. So if you look very carefully, you will see that Twister, one of its synergies is Arctic Blast. This means that theoretically, you could make an Arctic Blast Druid that focuses on cold damage and Hurricane. And then you could stun all the enemies in front of you with a crazy stun duration from Twister. So first you throw out the Twister, and then you usually go... And then they're just like stunned for like five minutes. And they're just stuck there, the monsters. And then you're just like... And you just flatten them. You could do that. That is actually an approach now. With the changes they made here. Remember, Arctic Blast increases the stun duration of Twister. You just have to throw out one Twister and you can accomplish that. Kind of interesting. Kind of interesting in some of these weird interactions they've done. Um, Inferno here. 75%. Bam. You made 10 million, so you can't afford to be greedy. Yeah, yeah maybe. I don't know, man. All right, so that's pretty good. Um, I don't think, you don't really have a stun ability on a sorceress, though, so you might need some help actually dealing the damage on this. But one thing that I think is even more interesting, though, is Blaze. Now, think about, think about how good Blaze could be. Um just like putting one point into it on a speed run or something you put like one point into it and then you could even like boost it by having a leaf staff on swap and then you can cast blaze and then you run but then again most of the time you're usually just teleporting so i don't know if that would actually well maybe it's pre-level 18 i don't know pre-level 18 yeah inferno stride bro on any character, because that will also boost Blaze in general. Remember, this doesn't just boost the skill on the character. It also boosts the skill when it's on an item. So that's kind of interesting. I like that. Ooh, dude, all those Inferno start stride up barbs. Yeah, try Blaze. They also increase the synergy, increase the damage scaling massively. Wow. Huh. Could you actually clear an area like Stony Tomb just by running throughout the Stony Tomb at light speed and just like burning all the monsters? <laughs> it's gonna be hard to check the items, but okay. Remember, PD two also added an explosion to Blaze, so this is a little different from PD two. But I will note one thing: there is a nod to PD two here, and that is that it is increasing run walk speed. That is also what PD two did with this skill. So once again, there are some similarities to the reworks on some of these abilities. Uh, but they didn't introduce an explosion. Maybe the explosion was a good idea, though, so maybe this isn't enough. I don't know. Firewall. Casting delay will no longer share its cooldown with other skills that have casting delays. Perfect. So now you can cast Blizzard and then cast Firewall. And then you can cast Blizzard again, and then you can cast Firewall. By the way, I think Blizzard Firewall, Hybrid Sorceress, might actually be a thing. Or Frozen Orb Fire. Oh, even better, actually. Frozen Orb Firewall, yeah. Even better. Even better, Ash. Even better. Frozen Orb Firewall. Mm -hmm. Dubal, bad Firewall got murdered. Bro, it was broken. They, they broke it. It's it's still super strong, man. No, if you go orb, if you go orb firewall, that could max out your DPS on that bill. I, I would think. Oh. That could be quite a bit. Meteor. Once again, no more shared caster delays. You want to go like meteor sorceress. You don't have to worry about waiting till the delay is up from orb. You can just cast a meteor. So that could be another combination. But Meteor Absorc is already built. It's already known. So that's kind of cool. Hydra. Okay, so Hydra might 
actually be good now. Because they removed the casting delay, so now you can just instantly spawn all the hiders. You can instantly spawn all the hydras. One, two, three, four, five, six. And you can actually get six of them because the casting delay is removed. Um, so apparently the problem with getting six before is there's a large casting delay. Now there's not a large casting delay. And now you can get up to six, and now they do a lot more damage. So I think hydras are going to hurt a lot. But I also see this being a nightmare for people trying to fight a hydra sorceress in PvP once again. Hydra Sorceresses weren't bad in PvP, especially if you didn't have tons of fire res, because you would just get hit by their, their Hydra Sentries, and now they could put up 6 Sentries, and they do even more damage. Ah, uh, could be a problem. But then again, maybe they can actually kill Trapsins with this, who knows. If I was a, if I was a Trapsin, I'd be very uh, scared of this. I don't know if this will be too broken in PvP, though. I think this is just going to make Hydra good, whereas it wasn't good before. So Hydra's going to be nice. And that also means that you can maybe do like Hydra Orb. There's a lot of combinations. You can put down Hydras. You can do Hydra Nova. Uh, there's so many Sorceress combos now. It's actually nuts. Like there's probably 20 different hybrid Sorceresses you can make that are actually going to be good. I think before I would have said maybe there's like probably like somewhere between five and six hybrid Sorceresses maybe eight if we were lucky. Now I'm thinking there's about 20 hybrid builds based on all these changes. Just look at the changes. I mean, they're making all of these abilities that don't require a ton of synergies to begin with a lot stronger. And they're like, I don't know, man. There's so many things you can try here, chat. I don't know, if you really like Sorceress, I mean, especially for early game, I think your early game farming options are amazing now. There's so many things you can do. And even if Sorceress is still the most efficient early game farmer, which almost certainly always will be, unless they, you know, fuck up Teleport, but they're not going to fuck up Teleport because that's going to change the fundamental feeling of the game and it's going to make people mad, especially Sorceress players. Uh, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really like the teleport in PD2, to be honest. Um, I, I don't think... I don't know. I don't like it. I mean, I can understand why they did it, but it's not even needed because maps are the end game anyway and you can teleport this. I don't like that. So, I actually really like this and I like how they're creating even more options for skills on Sorceress. But I have to say, the Sorceress is already like one of the strongest characters, if not the strongest overall at all points of the game. And now there's even more options. So, if you love Sorceresses like I do, Damn, you do almost whatever you want. <laughs> uh, notice, though, there's some skills that are noticeably missing from any kind of discussion. There's no lightning or chain lightning because they're already super powerful in the late game. You don't have to worry about that. Um, there's also... Um, there's also, whatchamacallit, I mean, there's, there's, there's Fireball. They yeah, didn't touch Fireball. Fireball's already good. Uh, the only thing they touched on Blizzard was make it to where, uh, you know, it doesn't share its cooldown, but that's about it. It makes it to where you can hybridize a bit easier, and it makes it feel better. If FTR did not affect teleport, 80% game would be 80% more balanced. You know, that's an interesting take, actually. Hmm. Good point. So we finished the characters, by the way, guys. We finished all the... Characters. I, I think, um, so now we're just going to be going over some of the other changes. The character changes, I think, were the biggest ones, but the other ones are pretty important as well, and they fit into the context of a lot of the skill changes, so it kind of all fits together like a puzzle. Well, I mean, Fireball Nova is incredible, man. Fireball Nova is like beastly but i think it already was beastly but you could even go like nova fireball now see that's the thing you could actually do the reverse because make it
Well, you know, we've already had a couple of big brain takes, Sky. That's kind of what I'm doing. I'm doing analysis. I finished the characters just now, though, but 13 months as a member of Xan's attacks called the Ghost of the Machine, the Arcane Disciples. Guys, spam those eyes Xan in the chat for our man Sky. Get him in there. Member of Xan's army. Loyal as always. Yo, so. So, are you ready for Hula Hoop Sorceress, Sky? <laughs> you ready, man? You ready for uh, Frost Nova Nova Sorceress? <laughs> oh, you're gonna have two Novas on the same character, dude. <laughs> it, it works. It's gonna work with these with these changes. It's gonna work. Ghoul spec, yeah. Oh yeah, dude. Frost Nova is already decent in some areas, believe it or not. At least in P one. I don't know. Some people don't know that. It's already decent. Mmm, Dual Nova, that's right. You can do it. Dual Nova Sorceress will actually be viable. Mana Drain? Eh. it has gotta be a downside, you know. Sorceresses are already crazy. I know, though. I know. You know, though, Mana Per Kill does not bad, though. Yeah, it's getting... No, it's... Frozen Orb's not getting cast delay removal. No, 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 no. No, 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 it still has cast delay. It's just not going to share the cooldown with other abilities. This means that you can now cast Frozen Orb and then immediately cast Blizzard. That doesn't mean you can um, spam Frozen Orbs, if that makes any sense. Yeah. No, 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 no. If it, but I, I, do, I do agree that Frozen Orb could use a little more damage, I think, at least on the high end. But then again, with all those hybrid builds, they probably don't want to make it broken again so i can understand i don't think they'd have to buff it that much all right let's go into mercenaries all right so mercenaries adding freezing arrow to cold mercenaries so adding explosion arrows to fire mercenaries i like these things because it's actually going to make the mercenaries more effective at dealing damage and there are ways of course to increase this damage with certain kinds of bows could use an ice mercenary bow. You can use a um, hand of justice fire bow, and they will do a lot of damage for you. That's end game stuff, though. What I really think is going on here is that for most of these mercenary changes, remixing so much of the fall welcome to cold dander day, which I've already read them all, are mostly geared towards the early mid game when you don't have maxed out builds. And that also goes with the rune words too, which we'll get into. Uh, but what you're mostly going to be looking at here, chat. <laughs> you forgot you followed. Thank you, man. Um, <laughs> I guess the rotation is blizz, orb, spike, and repeat. Um, maybe mirage i mean the it depends on what the how much damage you're doing that rotation could still be blizzard uh ice blast though i mean i don't dude there's so many things you could do on a sorceress now that are probably totally totally viable like no joke like there's so many combinations i only touched on some of the ones that are possible uh have fun man just go for it fish in space thank you so much for the follow welcome to cold xanadar's say i think the hula hoop sorceress is gonna be insane though <laughs> I think it's just like, hmm, lightning immunes, switch to Frost Nova. All right, no no lightning immunes, let's just use Nova. And you go back to, I think Nova would probably be the primary most of the time. But you could you could even make Frost Nova primary in areas like Ancient Tunnels and whatnot, so it's going to be pretty fascinating stuff. Good stuff, good stuff, and you just like jump on top of them and blow them up, basically. It's going to be fun. Um, mercenaries. Okay, so... I like what they're doing here. They're making it to where you might actually want to use an Act 1 Mercenary early game because they actually do damage. Wow, they're not just hitting one target with a weak-ass ability. Okay. I can see that. Uh, they're also fixing it to where normal and hell difficulty mercenaries aren't different, and they're even making it for the Act 2 Mercenary to where you can hire every single aura of mercenary in Nightmare and Hell. So they're just making it more easily accessible and they're making it to where you don't have to go to a certain difficulty to necessarily get your strongest mercenary or the aura that you want. 
I think that's a good thing because it's kind of wonky, honestly. It's like, I'm in hell. Why do I have to go back to Nightmare just to grab a certain type of mercenary? It's kind of weird, right? Kind of weird. And, you know, they're fixing the problem. If you guys didn't already know, I should tell YouTube this as well. If you didn't already know, there's always been a bug where hell mercenaries were weaker in stats than a normal mercenary that got leveled up with you. Um, it's kind of weird. Or, or just buying a mercenary in normal versus buying a mercenary in hell. The hell mercenaries were weaker. They fixed that. So they, they fixed some of those weird stuff that's kind of strange. Uh, weaker in terms of like stat scaling and just overall stats. Just they're, just they're just down a level in stats and it's kind of weird. Anyway. Um, so yeah, this is going to be good stuff. And as you will see with some of the... Uh, some of the rune words, or particularly a couple rune word changes, uh, this is going to make, uh, especially early game, a lot more sense to use something that isn't necessarily an Act 2 mercenary. So you might actually prefer to use one of these mercenaries because it has explosion and freezing. I will say, though, uh, the freezing arrow is going to have insane utility. This is a pretty big deal. So freezing arrow already has crazy utility on its own, which you guys might already know. However, the main problem with people only choosing Act 2 mercenaries, it seems, is that the cold damage options on the other characters don't freeze enough monsters. If you have Freezing Arrow, though, on a Rogue Archer, though, that might change that, and it might actually make you prefer to use this over the Act 2 mercenary um, at all points in the game, but especially in the early game. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah, the leveling doesn't matter. You just get less stats in Nightmare and Hell. Yep, that's that's why I kind of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I explained it a bit better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, it will fix rehiring mercenaries. Yes, they fixed the problem. They fixed those weird, wonky things. I, I read that all, and they fixed it. All right. What is up, LT Chef? What's up, man? All right, Thorns. Okay, so let's talk about Act 2 Mercenaries. We already know Act 2 Mercenaries are the strongest, particularly in the late game, mostly because of the Rune Word options, particularly things like Pride, Infinity, uh, Reaper's Toll, uh, things of that nature. All those pull arms are just super powerful, super strong. Inside, of course, is a pull arm. So we already know. We already know they're just crazy strong. You can even use Breath of the Dying in a pull arm, and it's just super strong. They attack very fast, they're responsive. So they're already in a good place, so they're not really going to be upgrading the Act 2 Mercenaries, which is fun. Are the new arrow skill only unlocked at level 30? Uh, you know, I don't know the answer to that. Maybe they actually made them unlockable from level 1. That would be interesting, because then more people would probably use them at level 1. Maybe not. Maybe they made them special. That'd be kind of cool. I think I think it's meant to be more of an early game thing. Uh, all right, anyway, Thorns is combat nightmare. Thorns or a level scaling increase and will not continue scaling up beyond the highest level threshold up to max level. So remember the Thorns changes with the uh, reflects flat amount of damage if something attempts to attack you. Could be interesting to have a Thorns mercenary, particularly in a party or particularly if you're using um, a lot of summons. But I'm not convinced, especially if you can stack your summons, that it would ever beat Might. But it's interesting. It's interesting. So they're just uh, trying to help the one aura on an Act 2 Mercenary that like, nobody ever uses. Um, all the other auras get used on an Act 2 Mercenary. You can trust me when I say that. I, I found uses for all the other ones. This one's kind of weak. And more options in the Act 1. Um, but... Remember, keep in mind there's also some new rune word changes, so um, before you make any judgments about whether these mercenary changes are effective, you do also have to keep in mind that there's some rune word changes as well. All right, so Act 3, Iron Wolf. So, yeah, they fixed the problems there. So they massively increased the tankiness on the Iron Wolves. Massively. So they made them, remember these things were super weak and would like die super easily? 
Well, now the die about as easily as an archer, which is, you know, it's not super tanky, but they survive. It has defense scaling uh, closer to the archer as well. And now it has the highest resistances, the base resistances out of any mercenary. So that means that as a ranged unit, it has more potential to survive things like, let's say, souls or venom lords and whatnot. Just by virtue of having tons of res. So playing this in certain areas might be a pretty good idea now. It has more crowd control, so once again it's focusing the the cold builds are trying to focus on crowd control that might be comparable to Holy Freeze. That's what they're kind of trying to do here. That appears to be what they're doing. Um that could be very useful for speedrunning. So I could see speedrunners using Act 3 mercenaries more often with Glacial Spike. The level has been increased. And I guess they get more defense through their frozen armor. So they get even more defense. Nice. Um, sweet. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, fire. They removed the stupid skill. Nice. They added firebolt. The increased chance of the Iron Wolf casting Fireball. So they're trying to make them actually deal the damage. This is the damage dealing Act 3 Mercenary. And it even enchants automatic. Wow. That's actually a pretty big deal. Like, no joke. Yeah, I wonder if Senpai will steal the enchant too. That's actually pretty smart, Sky. That's pretty smart. I like the enchant thing. Because if you think about it now, that, that's a reason to use it on a physical damage character. Let's say you don't have a really good pull arm, or you don't need the might aura or anything. You want more AR and you want fire damage, but you also want your mercenary to do damage too. You just pick up an Act 3 mercenary, he's going to enchant you. If you're a physical damage character, that could help you do more damage. So it also helps out physical damage builds without necessarily needing a good pull arm. So once again, a lot of these mercenary changes are kind of geared towards early mid game. Um, that being said, though, um, not bad. To have. I don't see it as being better for overall raw damage than might work. Definitely not. Combined with another damage or on an Act Two mercenary, definitely not. Um, but that's quite good. I think you can enchant all the summons too. Does enchant give as much AR as blessed aim mercenary though? Maybe not, but it also gives damage though. And I think it'd probably do more damage and be safer in some situations. If you're a melee character, it doesn't go into melee range, so it'll be attacking behind you for the most part. So it'll be behind you and doing more damage. Yeah, because you can use plague can be used in swords, which is something we're gonna get to. Uh, like I said, the rune words do complement some of these changes, so we'll get into them. I, I think it's interesting. They definitely recognize that these mercenaries were too weak overall, and they also recognize that the archers didn't have abilities that really did much. Um, my my initial analysis so far with all these changes, and by the way, there's also lightning that has like added. Static field, charge bolt, level scaling, increased chance of the Iron Wolf casting lighting. That's all good stuff. By the way, this is taken from PD2, probably. I mean, I don't know. This is one of those PD2 things. For you, so, so for those of you guys that think that they're copying PD2, this is very similar right here. They added static field to the lightning one. It's like exactly what they did there. It's exactly. Um, I think... I mean, obviously, Static Field does something different in PD2, but at the same time, that's pretty cool that, like, let's say you're a Lightning Sorceress, or you're any character, really, and you don't have Static Field. That's pretty huge. That's pretty huge. This is LOD Static Field, too, Sky. Think about this. So let's say I'm a... I don't know. Let's say I just want something that could, like, help me kill the bosses more. Like, it's going to lower the HP of nearby monsters, including bosses, even on characters that aren't a sorceress. It's, it's true. It's not a copy of PD2. It's true. It's not the exact same ability. 
But see, on PD2, static field doesn't lower HP that low. It mostly implies the lightning debuff. So it's mostly useful on lightning characters on PD2. But see, on D2R, what a static field Act 3 mercenary means is that now you get monsters getting chunked, um, potentially getting chunked. I don't know how often they use it, but they, they get potentially chunked really hard, and you don't even need a sorceress to apply it. Um, it's quite interesting, actually. That's quite interesting. And it's not just useful for lightning characters, so this is definitely a consideration. Um, if you're running a lot of bosses, let's say... Let's say I'm on a... Okay, let's say I'm on a Barbarian, right? And I want to kill... I don't know, Mephisto or Indario. All right, let's just give an example, okay? And, you know, all I have is my two Black Flails, so I'm going to be chunking them with, like, some crushing blow here and there. It might be hard to hit them without Battle Cry, but... I could get the Battle Cry in the Act 5 Mercenary for sure. I could use it. But... Imagine I have an Act 3 Mercenary, and he casts some Static Field on Mephisto right when I jump on top of him. And uh, he pumps Mephisto down with that. That's a pretty big deal. That's a pretty big deal. Give me 2.4 indeed, man. Uh, owner. 15 months as a member of Zane's attacks called the Ghost of the Machine, the Arcane Disciples. Guys, spam the size of Zane in the chat for him. Watch me die to Rathma on uh, in PD2. That was fun. Um, we almost did it though. Yeah, yeah. So I am. I don't know how often they'll cast this. So this is definitely something to investigate. But it has potential. The concept has potential. It has potential to help, especially boss farming on characters that maybe struggle to kill the bosses or don't deal as much raw damage, and maybe have more survivability to compensate. So there's meaningful reasons I'd say to choose all of these. And it you could potentially choose like cold like would be great for um the uh crowd control and whatnot. And then I don't know, on like physical damage characters, you get cleansing, you just get nice curse removal and everything and poison removal, and then they can also enchant you. And so you can make yourself really tanky as well. I can see that approach being nice on hardcore if you get a play going. Not bad. Um, definitely more useful in the end game, but definitely way more useful in the early game and in the early mid game. So speedrunning might find a lot of these things a lot more useful. I think speedrunning will become more dynamic on D2R. And anyone that's just trying to complete the game, I think, will find a lot more ways to do it that doesn't necessarily involve the Desert Mercenary. The Desert Mercenary might not even be the dominant approach for most uh, of the early game and the early mid game anymore. But one thing I will say overall, with all these changes, including the uh, Barbarian, the Act 5 one, which I'll go to in a second, is that it seems like for the late game, the late game is largely unscathed. What does that mean? That means that you're still going to want an Act 2 Mercenary most of the time, the vast majority of the time in the late game on most builds. Uh, that appears to be pretty obvious to me. Uh, you just can't beat two auras, man. It's really tough. Um, you can have whatever else you want, but two auras is, is a tough thing to beat. You can beat it, but when it comes to efficiency and just damage output, it's just really tough. Uh, there's definitely going to be situations where the Rogue Archer will definitely compete when it gives you faith and whatnot. And there's other things that can compete as well. Uh, but I think for the average player just playing through the game, these are really good changes. If you're looking for a, a upset of the end game meta, though, I think you're looking in the wrong place. Uh, that's that's not going to do it. Um, to be fair, there are some upsets to the late game meta, especially when it comes to a lot of these skill changes, but not all of them. Uh, if you ask me, the Sorcerer's probably got the most like late game changes in terms of things that are actually instrumental in the late game. Um, but, you know, all, all the characters got them to some extent. It's just that, like, it depends on the character. It depends on the build. Um, I'd say that Druid also got a ton as well. But I will say that overall, like, the, the, the Mercenaries... Yeah, Act 2 Mercenary is still best in slot. Others are now Mimi now, at least, though. I wouldn't say Mimi. I would just say, like, if you don't have gear yet, Sky, if you're not geared, they're good. They're actually good if you're not geared. Think about it. 
And, and when, once we see the rune words, I mean, we'll see why. Like, if you don't have the crazy gear, you don't have the crazy, insane rune words, then they're all competitive with Act 2, if you ask me. It's only once you really get those crazy rune words that I think that it really starts to take off. Um, possibly, possibly Insight is still going to... Insight on an Act 2 Mercenary is still going to be pretty dominant, too, but I can see... I can see the other things going on too. Plague with Frost Arrow could be good. Um, I don't think you can put Plague with Frost Arrow. You can put Plague. Oh, you mean with Glacial Spike? Yeah, yeah you could do that. Um, I don't think Plague can go into a bow. We'll go into that in a bit though. All right, last thing though, let's go to the Barbarian just to see how this one could be more useful early on. Now this one, I have some mixed ideas about because they added Battle Cry. Which means it can override curses potentially applied by Lawbringer, which does Decrepify, which is mean the main use of an Act 5 mercenary, like once you actually get Lawbringer going, which is just like Amblem and Co. Um, that's a little bit of a problem. So this, I see there's there's actually some problematic things going on here. Um, we'll also check that out with the rune word. That's one of the problems I see going on. Um, I like that they're trying to make him do a ton more damage, though. I like that they made him the tankiest mercenary in, in, in terms of base life. That's good stuff. I feel like I feel like Act 2 mercenaries should be one of the squishier mercenaries, if you're asking me. Um, uh, just because, like, it's got so access to such amazing items. Um, but these are proof. And that's all good stuff. So they increase all the scaling on it. And it has the most life. And it has the highest defense on the base. Without auras, though. But it's really good. And then they added Battle Cry. So if you're not, if you don't have very good weapons with procs, Battle Cry is actually amazing. Uh, so if you're just playing through the game, you're not going to have Lawbringer on the first playthrough, most likely. Uh, you you could. You can get lucky in Nightmare Forge and Hell Forge, and you can make Lawbringer. But Ice Rune Word, Ice is really good, too. Think about Ice on an Act 1 Mercenary. Ice with Freezing Arrow. And then you get Holy Freeze on it, too. And you get Freezing Arrow. That's such good crowd control. So yeah, there's definitely some late game uses of some of these things. Don't get me wrong. Uh, it's just that I think most of this is focused on early mid game. And with this Act 5 Barbarian change, you can almost see that for sure with the addition of Battle Cry, which is really good. That means as a melee character, you take way less damage just by having this mercenary near you. You could even argue that it's better than any Act 2 mercenary aura just for mitigating damage straight up. Um, I don't know if Blood Doll is still there, but I think Blood Doll was just here for the assassin. <laughs> it's funny. Once I started talking about things that weren't assassin, she disappeared. <laughs> but, you know, assassin's her thing, man. Assassin to be OP, though. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, hmm, I'm thinking really good for just playing through the game on a physical damage character or any kind of melee character that gets really close because that, that damage mitigation is amazing. Um, so if you're a barbarian, you might also want a barbarian buddy. Uh, it might not be a bad idea. I do think though the battle cry though, it messes with decrep, which is one of the ways to add a lot more damage and to increase survivability. I, unless they change it to where it doesn't override decrepify it, that might not be the best. And when we look at another one of the items that he could also use early game, we also see another problem with also an override of decrepify or being instead of decrepify. Um, so there are some limits to this, but I, I like Battle Cry as long as it doesn't override things. I don't know. It's got potential. It's got potential. And with all this damage increasing, maybe his head striker damage is just absurd. Maybe his damage is crazy. Uh, we'll have to see. We'll have to see. Oh no, oh no. 
Act by Merc still knocks her melee target away. Yeah, and it still knocks him back. Yeah, there's definitely some limitations to the Act 5. Honestly, think the buffs to Act 1 and Act 3 maybe have the most promise. All right. So, let's go into Rune Words last, actually. Let's do them last. So, uh... Uh, to stun and dash damage skilling. They, 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 they improve the... Hmm. I don't know. I don't know. On certain weapons, it could. You never know. I haven't... I mean, I'm not 100% sure, but it could. I know that F Head Striker, for instance, is a really good weapon on that, so that could be a very good idea. I don't know. Test it out, man. Test it out. All right, maybe for end game, there's some uh, new scenarios where just one shots everything. Who knows? Who knows, man? Who knows? Maybe use it on the um. It'd be quite interesting. All right, new Herodric cube recipes. So, basically, these are just recipes to upgrade uh set armors and set weapons. So now you can upgrade sets. What does this mean? This means that if, let's say you have a Death Sash, and it's your only source of cannot be frozen on a melee character or a ranged character, that you can now make it a Demon Hide Sash. How? How? Shale, Perfect Diamond. Exceptional version of the set armor will be created from the normal version of the set armor. And there you go. And then you have a Demon Hide Sash. You could even make it a Spiderweb Sash. You could upgrade it again using Code 11 Perfect Diamond. You could upgrade anything anything at all you could upgrade spring armor into a shadow plate um a lot of possibilities here this is pretty much carbon copy what pd2 did so um like literally the exact thing that pd2 did for sets it allowed them to be upgraded and I think that's a cool idea because it allows you to keep belts and other set items relevant that maybe couldn't have been otherwise by simply and keeping their set bonuses, by the way, while increasing their damage, their defense, or their defense. And, uh, yeah, dude. Except you can't upgrade Bulkathos set because those are elite items. And Mav set. There's a few of them that already are elite items, and the shark skin belt is already four slots, and the grand matron bow is an elite item. So you can't upgrade elite items already. Um, just keep in mind that it has to be an exceptional or a normal to upgrade it. If it's already elite, it cannot be upgraded. Yeah, so you know you're not going to be upgrading elite items but the elite items are already very strong they typically are the stronger of the items anyway so that's fine yeah 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 oh uh, make them even better the sets better uh they did something for bk set we'll get into that in a moment let's go talk about some of these sets so basically what they're doing here is they're trying to encourage you to get full sets and to make the full set bonuses worth it Look at this, man. These are some nice changes. These, as early mid-game sets, these are quite nice now. Uh, even Bolkathos looks nice. Look at that. Deadly Strike. Life Steal. Look at that. Deadly Strike on the BK set. That's crazy. That's actually something that it needs pretty badly. Look at Kathens. Kathens getting some more... Actually, I think this is like the least buff they did, but that's because Cathens is already really strong. Kana is getting more damage, making even more damage potentially with Arctic Gear, scales up a bit better. Cow King set gives one whole skill and life, but you know what Cow, Cow, uh, Cow King set still doesn't do? It still doesn't turn you or your mercenary into a cow. Well, your mercenary wouldn't be able to turn into it anyway because it requires boots. Uh, this isn't PD2. But, you can't turn into a cow. How is there a vampire form or a full training necro and you can't turn into a cow? I don't know. 
That's lame. Anyway, they should make you turn into a cow with full cow set. I think that's something that should be a thing. They don't have to they don't have to change your casting frames or anything. That'd be interesting. I'm also interested in this question. Hey, are you? Uh, what is the question here? The question is, will this be a global change to existing items, or will you have to find the new items? Oh, you mean the ones that already you found on non-letter? Um, I'm pretty sure it's global. I'm pretty sure they're just going to change all the items, yeah. I'm pretty sure. Uh, I mean, I know in the past when they made changes that you'd keep the old versions of the items, like the 08 Shakos and whatnot, the 08 Bulks, and then you'd have to find new ones. I don't know. But they, they, they have the power to do... They have, they have a bit more power, I think, with new Battle.net. They might be able to just, like, change the items. I don't know. That's a good question, actually. Well, they didn't say anything, so who knows? Hmm, Inferno Tools. So yeah, that's pretty cool, too. Uh, definitely making these sets more viable. It makes you actually want to use them. It's like, eh, it's kind of like, meh, you get the full set for some of these, but then, you know, now you get so many more stats. Like, Infernal Tools, like, cannot be frozen. Huge mana boost. That's nice. Arafas gives you piercing attack. That could be huge for uh for some like early bow builds. I mean, it can be nice to sort of like anything really. Millibrigas regalia you cannot be frozen as well with some set items. This is some some mid tier set stuff too. So remember we saw that with BK. Nauseans getting a huge magic find boost with just two items. Huh. Fascinating. What do you think about that, chat? Would you use the Nausea Staff itself on your main hand in Nausea's helmet if you could get over a hundred magic find? Hmm. Then you could use it on the main hand for teleport triggers. Hmm. Spirit exists, yeah, but it has teleport charges. I don't know. Full set fire sork, oh yeah. Make that for a fire sork. Then again, though, what about devil spirit, though? I sucked, I died to Rathma. Eh, I know. I think if I played just a little bit better, we would have gotten past it. You gotta be a cow king. Yeah, you gotta be the cow king for sure, yeah. You know, honestly, a fire trap sin might be pretty good. Yeah, I don't know about a fire sorceress. I think the sorceress needs too many uh, FCR and whatnot. Maybe plus skills. I think maybe a fire trap sin could make some sense, yeah. Because you get one skill in the staff, so it's kind of like leaf. And then you get like, uh, you get a lot of MF. Which you wouldn't normally get, I think, on a fire trap sin doing that. You could use it for swap though, yeah. Yeah. But I think it could be used before a goal. Yeah, there's definitely things you could do with this. This is zombies. So there's another plus skill in zombies now in DR. Holy crap. Dude, that is huge actually. Look at this. Look at the zombies. Bruh, if you get all three sets in the Sazabis, that could actually be a viable, like... It might actually clear hell just fun. DR and stuff like that? Dude, that's crazy. Uh, yeah. No, percent DR. Percent DR is a new mod, yeah. One skill is a new mod. Vidal is... Vidal is getting 7% mana stolen per hill. Ah, uh, for hit, hit, hill, wow. That's actually nice for a boson, yeah. And of course, increasing the cold damage as well, just like with the Arctic. Yeah, so overall, like, as leveling sets, and even through, like, different points in the game. Are they adding more inventory space? Um, I don't know why. I mean, it's not a big deal, man. Uh, the fact that you have all that stash space, I think, is fun. 
You just have to choose between charms and space, you know. That's part of it, man. It's part of the it's part of the game, I guess. I don't think they're gonna change that. Mm. For sure. Alright, and then level area changes. Item tool tip changes. Nothing there. Remember this is happening on January 25th. And all you have to do is have the Blizzard app and use the drop down menu and install the beta and then you'll have an account already created for you. That is done. General gameplay changes. All right. So I think before I go into areas, let's go into general gameplay changes just real quick. I'm definitely going to be playing the PTR. Yes, I will be testing. So I am a tester. If you haven't seen my PD2 testing, you'll know that I go hard. So we'll be testing all kinds of things to see how strong they are, one, and to also see what kinds of item combinations are going to be good in different situations. So if you want the first look, you'll be able to see it there. Of course, I'm giving you some of my, you know, insights, my analysis right now, and the analysis of chat when my analysis isn't sufficient, which is often. That's good stuff. All right, anyway, um, general gameplay changes. Some of these things are actually pretty huge for pvp so some people were talking about this stuff earlier we want to fix some of the awkward lockouts that reject player input from casting skills for pvp we added a way to reduce hit recovery spam to prevent edge cases of characters being locked out for too long now i wonder does this also apply to mind blast i don't know character hit recovery will now have diminishing returns and being hit by another player so now you can't just kill someone just by purely keeping them in hit recovery all the time. Change how attack speed is determined while dual wielding weapons. It's especially important on things like Blossoms or Frenzy Barbarians or even Whirlwind Barbarians, potentially. Swapping weapons between hands no longer results in dramatically different attack speeds. So swapping the weapons in and out doesn't do anything anymore they also remove the attack the weapon speed bug so i think they're just averaging and cleaning up some of those weird mechanics i don't know what that means though they changed it it's but they didn't say how they changed it that's kind of weird maybe it's just an average of the two weapons Yeah, 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 yeah. Microsoft buying Blizzard, I think, is a good thing, indeed. Overall, I think it's a good thing. Um, Character hit block will no longer apply while your character is playing a skill pre-cast animation. Block will still trigger for the skill's post-cast animation. So wait, what does that mean, chat? What does that mean? What does that mean? By the way, diminishing returns makes me think that the more you put them in a hit recovery, the more likely they're going to get out. That's actually kind of interesting. I, I kind of like that, though. You know what they need to do? They need to nerf Sorb, though, for PvP, though. They need to nerf Absorb. They need to nerf the Absorb stats a little bit. They're, they're a little too strong. Does that mean block doesn't interrupt a spell cast? Um, I think so. I think so. When you just start to trigger a spell, block will no, no longer interrupt it. But does that also mean that you can't block while you're casting something? Hmm. No, the late game meta won't change very much, no, but there are definitely more skills that are viable in the late game, so. But if you're talking about the very strongest skills, no. If anything, there's actually a few that even got buffed, strangely enough. Can't be stun locked in teleport. Um. But that does that also mean that you can't block when you're playing? Hmm. 
What does that mean, chat? Does that mean you can't block when you're teleporting? Or like only when you start a teleport? Uh, I don't know. Although slow the direction of the overall patch in the future is expected to follow the hints of POT or PD2. I don't know about that. It seems like they're going their own direction somewhat. They're going an even more careful approach that maintains the integrity of the whole game while trying to make things that are better that don't currently work. Hmm. Can't block while cast or is while running defense is not set to zero. What happens if the form is ignored altogether? Mm. Right, right. It's true. Well, we're about to get into that. We're not done yet. Okay. All right. Area levels. Underground patch, it's 85. So basically everything's getting buffed 85. Stony Tomb, 85. Ratnan's Lair, 85. Swampy Pit, 85. Disused Fate, 85. Wound Temple, 85. Forgotten Reliquary, 85. Sewers, level 1, 85. Level 2 is already 85. Of Abaddon, 85. Pit of Acheron, 85. Infernal Pit, 85. Drifter Cavern, 85. Icy Cellar, 85. What do you think are the most interesting of these areas and why, chat? I'll tell you. I already have some ideas. For my own D2R farming tier guide, among other things, I have ideas as to um, um, which of these areas might actually be quite good. Have it on. You think the red portals are nice. Okay. Stony Tomb. Rachnid's Lair is cool since it's next to a waypoint. Yeah, so I think out of all of these, this one's going to be the most impactful. That is a very impactful change. Why? Because as you might know for farming efficiency in late game in, in Diablo 2, maybe you don't know, the closer an area is to a waypoint and the more elite packs it tends to have, typically the uh, more efficient it will be to farm the area. Case in point, you have City of the Dam next to an 84 area. It's right inside of that area. It's a very good area. River of Flame Waypoint right next to River of Flame and Chaos, which are both 85 areas. You have Worldstone, which is literally inside of it. All 85 areas. Um, you have the pit, which is really close to Outer Cloister and has really low HP enemies and a lot of elite packs. You have Ancient Tunnels, which on single player, you can get a waypoint right next to it um, pretty easily. On Battle.net, it's a little shaky, but it has tons of elite packs. So that's the thing. You can usually find it pretty easily as well. What do all those areas have in common? They're really good. Now, Ratnid later, though, has a weakness, though. It's definitely another very good thing to farm, but it does have a weakness. And the weakness is that um, I think it only spawns somewhere between two to four elite packs based on my testing. So it's not, we're not talking a six to eight pack area. We're talking a two to four pack area, but it's right on top of the waypoint. Uh, and it's a small area, so it's compact. Compact areas with lots of elite packs tend to be pretty nice. It's so compact that even though it only has two to four uh, elite packs, it's compact enough to make it efficient, potentially. So Ragnet Layer is a pretty big one. This is a pretty big change, and anyone who is a cold damage, physical damage, lightning with a way to break lightning immunity, and um, magic damage, or did I say magic? Magic physical. Lightning with a way to break it and cold damage will like this area a lot. I think there's, if I remember right, there is fire immunity, uh, poison immunity, a lot of poison immunity. So you're not going to want poison in there for sure. And then there's um, uh, there's the bats, which can be lightning immune. And once again, or they are lightning immune. That means that you have to be able to break the lightning immunity. 
another indirect fire druid buff, really easy to get to in hell. Okay, so another very impactful area is Stony Tomb, which we already know from uh, PD2, right? Uh, PD2 made a lot of these changes already. There is one area that PD2 didn't do, though. Um, actually, I think there's two areas that PD2 didn't do. I think PD2 didn't make Icy Cellar 85. It might have buffed it to 84. I don't remember. Uh, I think PD2 made Drifter Cavern 85. I think so. Um, Drifter Cavern, by the way, is already super viable for farming. Um, at 84, it's already really good. It's just making it to where now it's even easier to find those super rare items. So now Drifter Cavern looks even better. Um, that's cool. That's already good though. So it's already an area on my farming tiers list, on my farming tiers guide. Exclamation D to our farming tiers if you want to see what I'm talking about. Um, these changes are going to be interesting for testing. I'm going to see what areas they should add to that guide, which ones are actually worth adding. And I already have some ideas as to what to add to that, so it should be interesting. Lars, so thank you so much for the follow. Welcome to the Colt Xanadrus Day. Um, the red portals will still suck without density buffs. Um, so, okay, let's talk about this. So Stony Tomb has some decent density and has a lot of clickables. I think Stony Tomb will be very good because it's an indirect fire character buff. People talk about not having areas to farm on fire characters, right? Let me get Eldritch, you got Shank, you got Cows. You got Pendleskin sometimes because he's often fire immune and it can be tough to kill him with the mercenary. But then you got to think, you know, what else really is there to do on a fire character when you're not geared up? Well, now here's another area. This is a very easy area for a fire character. So all kinds of fire characters are going to want to come in here. I guess there's also in Dariel too, and Dariel's easy to kill on fire characters. There's definitely things you can do, but um, you can even do Arcane on Fire to some extent as well, which is something that I go over in my Arcane Guides, but uh, this is pretty good stuff. Stony Tomb is an area to watch for sure. Uh, Stony Tomb is a little less predictable where it spawns, so that is the downside, but kind of like Ancient Tunnels, it has just about as many elite packs as Ancient Tunnels. Uh... And it even has a super unique, which means that even though it's harder to access, that it's still efficient. So these should all be efficient areas for different types of characters. This one is another area that cold characters can farm. So yay, cold sorceress. Another nice cold sorceress area on top of ancient tunnels and uh, mausoleum and bosses and travancore and all that. Um, you got a right in a layer. You also have, of course, once again, like magic damage characters and physical damage. So I think, I think anything that's like melee, melee characters, I think would love a Ragnar later because it's so close to the waypoint. That's usually what you need early game for a melee character to have a solid farm. So that's actually not bad. Uh, Stony Tomb is far enough away, but it's okay. You can access it. It's pretty easy to find on a fire sorceress. This should be really easy. And then uh, you're gonna pump those elites for items. Should be nice. So Stony Tomb is looking very viable now for fire characters, and it's got a lot of elite packs. Underground Passage 2, I don't think that does too much, because Underground Passage 1 is still 83. Can't even find every item in the game in there. It's a little tougher to access. The elite packs are spread throughout. The area is so big that there's not even elite packs everywhere. It's kind of hard to get to them. And it's also too far to get to, so I don't think this is going to do very much. Um, I'm not even going to consider this area. I, I mean, it's kind of cool they're doing it just for fun. And maybe to have a reason where if you are going through Underground Passage and you're not farming it necessarily, you there's a reason to actually go into Underground Passage too, uh, just for a chance at more loot. But it's not a farm, though. I don't see this as a farm. This will be a farm for sure. That will be a farm. Definitely. Swampy Pit. Okay, let's take a look at this chat. Do you guys think Swampy Pit is a farm? Do you play the PTR? Uh, I will. I will, man. Uh, January 25th, we are coming back to D2R for the PTR, and the PD2 content, unfortunately, will end 100% on that date. So, uh, you know, thank you guys, everyone in the PD2 community, for all your support. 
uh, we will be moving over to D2R stuff very soon. If you don't want to watch, that's cool. I'll be with you guys once again for more tier lists, more builds, more fun, and more challenges for Season 4. Yeah, yeah, there you go. You stop, watch, there you go. Sorry, man. Um, this is just a cycle. I've already talked about it. I know some of you guys are probably just joking, but I've already said um, that uh, I am going to be following the ladder resets in general for D2R and PD2. We're on the cusp of the D2R ladder reset. Just like before the PD2 ladder reset, I start playing the beta for testing for you guys and for tier lists and whatnot. I also play D2R before, and I also test their changes as well. And of course, I have to do this for Maxwell as well because I make build guides and I update them for them as well. So it's going to happen no matter what. And there's nothing to do. Hope it's a good reset. It will be, man. I hope so. If you don't like D2R at all, I'm sorry. Uh, hopefully you, you 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 guys play you guys learn to play both games and enjoy them both. But if not, you know, it's fine. They're, they're both Diablo though. Swampy Pit is dangerous. Your rank arachnids layer as a farm. I will have it added to my farming tiers guide. If you haven't seen that, I'll also be re-releasing that guide in case people haven't seen it. So yeah, it's good stuff. I'll re I'll re-release a shorter version of it or a shorter like overview of it just to show people how they can use it and then they can use it. Um, anyway, uh, it will be re-released with arachnids layer and stony tomb added for sure. I can already tell you that's going to happen. Farming Tears Guide will need some new areas and it will also need new builds because there's now more viable builds. So that's just how it is. Um, or, you know, more decent builds. Mm, yeah. All right. So Stony Tombs looking really good. Arachnid Lair looking really good. All right. Swampy Pit, I think, is actually not bad. There's a lot of builds, including fire builds, that would be very strong in here. Actually, wait. Aren't the drowned corpses in here fire, I mean? Hmm, I'm trying to think. There are fire amines in here, aren't there? I'm not, I'm not going crazy, right? So there's bats. Yeah, 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 they are. Yeah, okay, so it's... Lightning immune, fire immune, and more lightning immune. Shamans are also, yeah, okay. Yeah. Are there any cold immunes in there ever? I don't think so. Okay, so this area could be farmed by cold potentially. It could be farmed by. I guess it. I guess it's got a. Pretty similar profile to the arachnid layer, actually, except there's more elite packs in here. It's very dangerous, but if you just slap on a T gods, they're usually going to be pretty fine. You could farm this, and unlike in PD2, where you still wouldn't farm this because maps exist, uh, this would actually make a difference because this is also next to a waypoint. So just like arachnid's layer is next to a waypoint, I think Swampy Pit could even be better than arachnid layer because it has more elite packs. It's just more dangerous. So the problem, I always thought this area should have been 85. I've been preaching this since I started streaming. I'm like, this area is super dangerous. It, it, it has to be 85. It, no one would ever go in here unless it's 85. And well, now it's 85. So what does that mean? What does that mean? More cold sork areas, poggers. I need more of those. Exactly, there's more cold sork areas. <laughs> Right next to waypoints, too. Look at this. These are all cold sleep areas. Um, anyway, I'm going to be adding Sloppy Pit as well to my guide. I will be doing that. It, it is viable, 100%, as a farming area. I don't recommend doing it with low gear. Though. I think with low gear, almost every build is going to be pretty trash in here. Um, so, like, with low gear, I, I make a distinction between low and high gear on my guide, by the way. And I think uh, no low gear build is going to want to do this, so... You're going to want some pretty solid stuff and specific stuff. Uh, I, I highly recommend like T-God stacked like this. It's going to be tough without it. Um, and you're going to have to watch out. You're going to have to watch your back with the dolls. Hmm, but you could do it. You could do it. Hard life, man. Hard life. 
Okay, so I think there's more cold sort, maybe more magic and physical is also, except physical would probably be ranged physical in here because if you go melee physical, it's going to be a nightmare with the dolls and the souls that are somewhat physical resistant. Yeah, I don't, I don't see that being great. Uh, so it just kind of depends. Very dangerous area. If you guys don't know what's in here, by the way, there's typically bats, zombies, just hard hitting monsters. There's gloams, so there's souls. Very powerful, very dangerous. And of course, there's also um, uh, Stygian dolls, so the exploding, exploding boys. Uh, yeah, those things are very dangerous. So it's not a very easy area. But that being said, though, it could be very efficient on certain builds. Um, I see it being possible. There's a table at Reddit with the immunities. Oh, yeah. Can you, uh, can you, um, can you give that to me? Can you post the link or something? I actually kind of want to look at that a bit more. Splody boys. Yeah. Yeah. That means they can drop every item. Yes. From every, so that means from champions and uniques, every item can drop. Uh, from regular monsters, no, but almost every item can drop. Uh, so 85 areas have the most item drop potential, yes, just across the board. Disused Fane Rune Temple, Temple Forgotten Reliquary. Do you guys think that those changes matter too much? I feel like there's a different problem with these. Kind of like this is too far out of the way. I feel like the problem with these is there's not enough density and there's not enough guaranteed elite packs. Stony Tomb is in the Rocky Waste. It's in the entrance. It's the exit to Loot Galane. It's literally just out there. It's in that immediate area before you get to the Dry Hills. Pretty easy to access through the Loot Galane uh, entrance. If you're playing single player, you could potentially get a Dry Hill waypoint that is very close to the Stony Tomb. Um, so there's a way to get that pretty close. If not, if somewhere out in the Rocky Waste, and you can just go outside to the um, you can go outside the, the, the town and you can get to there. Temples are quite dangerous. Um, yeah, I, I don't. It's, it's, dude, Devil Dude, these are great changes. Like, there's almost no bad changes. There might be some that are shaky, especially for PvP, but um, they're, they're, they're nothing that's too bad. It doesn't seem like. Doesn't those cross bizarre temples always have elite packs? Um, not always. Not always. Um, they can, but I think they only have like somewhere between zero and two elite packs, maybe two, and they're not always in the same spot. There's no guarantee there's a waypoint next to them. I, I feel like this is you know not only that but they're already eighty four right. So if they were viable, they would have already been somewhat viable. This is just kind of giving them. A little bit of a love tap here but they're already kind of weird they have tons of immunities they even have magic immunities they're pretty hard to farm um there's no guarantee you even get elite packs you can get like one champion pack in these areas they're not they're not very consistent i think other changes would have to happen to make them viable i'm not even going to include them on my meta list because it's i don't see them being meta under any conditions how about sewers, though? Do you guys think sewers could be a meta farming area? People can already farm the sewers at 84. It does make me wonder a little bit. Mm, yeah. Thank you, Cole Waki. How you doing? The small temples might be moving, much moving, but for not a lot of density. That's the problem. That's the problem. Too much travel time for not enough density. It's just too inefficient. And they're honestly too dangerous and they lock out too many builds and they have too many types of spawns. It's just it's just trouble. The, the, these areas can be trouble. There, there's just too many issues with them. Um, you think a rat is layers in Stony Tomb only? You really don't think Swampy Pit's impactful, guy? You don't think that's worth mentioning? That's a pretty big deal for some builds. That's a pretty big deal. They have a lot of elite packs right next to a waypoint. And on Battle.net, that matters quite a bit. Remember, on Battle.net, there's no guarantee of the spawn of an area. So you have to find it a lot of the times. 
You don't have to find Swampy Pit. Yeah, it could be nice. You just gotta have the right gear. It's all about having the right gear on. I could see it. I could see it. I think Swampy Pit's pretty impactful. <coughs> I think it is. Eh, dolls. You can just range them. Who cares? Swampy Pit always finds you. I mean, I've farmed this... Do you know that people have me forced me to farm this area on my grail before I finished it, Sky? And, um, I, I farmed it with almost every build because I, you know, people forced me to do it. And I've proven that you can farm the Swampy Pit with virtually any build. You can. And the only problem with it was that it was a shitty area level. It's not a shitty area level, it's, it's farmable 100%. 100% farmable. Um, I'd say the biggest weakness of Swampy Pit might not even be the danger. It's just that some of the monsters can fly over the lakes and then die over the lakes and then they don't drop items. I think that's actually the most annoying thing about the uh, Swampy Pit, believe it or not. Uh, that can be annoying for sure. There are a lot of elite packs in here. It's stuffed full of elite pack box pit. It's stuffed full of elite packs. Are there souls? Yes, there's souls and dolls. Potentially. Different spawns. There's zombies. There's also, I think, blares, zombies, and bats. It's thrown to destruction. Yeah. I mean, that's an 85 area too, so. I, I farm. Do you know how much I farm, like, world stone and throne? When I was doing my grail, that's easy. You can 100% farm that stuff. 100%. You just need gear for it, though. It's it's not going to be an ungeared area. Let's put it that way. I don't think these are impactful at all. Uh, I also don't think these are impactful. So, red portals, not enough density, not enough elite packs. Um, they're often located in very different locations. You can get um, waypoints near them on single player, but... They're just not enough reason, I don't think, to go into these areas because the monsters are super hard. Kind of like, it's kind of like this. And then they just like don't have enough elite packs. Abaddon is from Frigid, right? So maybe go that. Uh, yeah, but it could be farther down as well. It's not predictable. And the spawns aren't predictable enough to know what you can even farm in here. It, it, they're just tough areas. I feel like they have to be more of a reason to farm those. I don't think I'm going to include those either because they're just like... I mean, you can you can farm whatever you want, but the truth is, is there are meme areas in the game where you could farm. But it's like, why would you do that? Now, sewers, I could see someone farming the sewers, but you can't farm the whole sewers because it's too big. So you have to kind of stick around the initial area where you spawn in. I think the sewers is I think the sewers is doable. It, it is a bit of a tougher one, but I think this is doable. I might include sewers. Sewers one, sewers two. Yeah, it's too big. It's just a big area, and then there's like lead packs can be like everywhere, but it is near the waypoints. It's pretty easy to get to. I don't see sewers being that bad. I'm going to have to check the monster spawns, though. Mm, yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, definitely. All right. And then Drifter Cavern was already viable, um, even as an 84 area. Very, very... It, it has tons of elite packs in it, and it's predictable where it's located uh, based on where the waypoint is. So this one has a predictable location. That's good stuff. Icy Cellar also has a predictable location. So I think Icy Cellar might also be impactful. Um, I actually think Icy Cellar might become an actual farm. So I think on my tier list, I'm going to add Icy Cellar. This one's already on there. I'm going to add Sewers, Swampy Pit, Arachnid's Lair, and Stony Tomb. The rest of these are not worthy of adding because they're still too shit. Even at level 85, and that's just the way it is. Another place with Dolls and Souls. Correct. Correct. So these are areas where you're going to want to farm with full builds for sure. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I see cellar is another tough area. It is. Um, it's not as bad as swampy pit though, because it's more open. I think. I actually think I'd prefer this, but this is more easily accessible. Um, sewers pretty easy to get into. This one just has dolls, but it also has like unravelers. Yeah. Sewers is gross. Unravelers and dolls. I don't know. I think I think sewers is fine though. I think sewers is a viable area. I don't as an eighty four area. I don't know, but as an eighty five area, yeah, maybe it's kind of Drifter Cavern was even good as an eighty four area though. Hmm. Interesting to say though. I can see icy cellar being good too, because it's gonna be like the same thing as uh Drifter Cavern, just different monsters. Sloppy so pit all the doors and corridors will block your moves too. Right. You're gonna have a swampy pit with all the tiki on the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Swampy pit's not bad. I think these are actually viable farming areas now. Some people are getting excited about these, but these aren't very worth. I mean you could do them, but not great. These aren't great either. If you still have some 85 areas left over in your group farming game, I mean, sure. I mean, these are areas you could do, but as an actual efficient farm, I would never recommend some of those. Um, sewers. I don't know. Cool. All right. And then the last thing we want to go over chat is the rune words. So the rune words, let's go back to our discussion on mercenaries here. So some of this stuff makes some of these other mercenaries quite attractive, especially when you have things like freezing arrow on an act one mercenary. And then you look at this first change, insight. Insight can be used in a bow. Whoa. Whoa. Abaddon is kind of nice. Yeah, Abaddon's okay. I don't know. I don't even think that's that great, to be honest. But, yeah. So what does this mean? This means that you can have that insane mana regeneration and no Act 2 Mercenary. So let's say you are a Cold Sork. I could see you maybe wanting to freeze the monsters around you with the freezing arrow and then using insight or supplementing a different kind of damage and then using the insight that kind of helps with like cold resistance and whatnot. So there are definitely some late game uses for this or even at least at least high mid game. So like insight's a pretty solid mid game, sometimes late game room word. And now can stuff it on an act one mercenary that's pretty cool so automatically that puts act one mercenaries in my opinion were always the second best mercenaries only second to desert anyway in terms of the items they could use and now they can use another very insane item that's very important um, i think pd2 put insight on an act three mercenary so they put it in scepters so this is definitely not the pd2 approach this is a different approach putting it on the act one mercenary um, I like it. I like it a lot. I think that's going to be a really cool change for Act 1 Mercenaries. And it means that you can have two ranged characters. You don't necessarily have to worry about getting close with either of you. Of course, it also means you don't have a frontline tank. So it just depends. And then there's some builds where that's what you want. Maybe your frontline tank is a Valkyrie and you're playing a Freezing Arrows on and you just want insight so you don't run out of mana. And then uh, you don't want your mercenary to die on the front line. There you go. Of course, you can also have her do exploding arrow and can help supplement her damage. And have her do freezing arrow too, so then you have double freezing arrow. I don't know. And you have the insight for the mana region. There's a lot of interesting things you can do with that. Um, it's going to be great for early and mid game for sure. Okay. And now the new room words chat. All right, so let's get into this here. Um, let's go into it. All right, let's go. All right, so Plague, Cham, Shale. Um, by the way, we're not going to get to PD2 stuff today. Uh, we might get to it tomorrow. But uh, yeah. 
Um, all right, so plague chat. What you guys thinking on this one? Sword? Remember, Act 3 mercenaries can use swords, if you don't know that already. Act 3 mercenaries can use swords. So, I don't think you could put this in a claw, actually. Not on, P not on, not on D2R. I don't know, man. Cleansing Aura. You get a free Cleansing Aura. It's the only way to get Cleansing Aura. I don't know. It's not pointless at all. That curse, that dude, that curse, that keeping the amp curse off of you can save your life. And if you don't have a Paladin on your team, it's pretty nice. Yeah, put it on an Oridin Mercenary. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You already have Conviction. You could do that, yeah. You could do that. Of course, you can also put, like, Decrepify and put Grief on it, too. But if you're, like, pure Oridin, you can do that. Of course, you can also just use it for, like, if you don't have the crazy rune words, but you found a Cham rune and you want a better way to survive, definitely ways to do that. It also casts lower resist when struck, which, hey, I mean, that's quite a bit of lower resist when struck. If you're on some kind of, like, elemental build that it's going to get the character struck a lot. That could be quite nice. Hmm, yeah. I can also think of another use for this chat. How else do you think you could use this rune word? I have I have some ideas. Let's let's test the chat's uh, game knowledge here. I like testing the chat's game knowledge. It does have ED. It does. Negative enemy poison resist too. Mm, that is sick, yeah. What do you guys what do you guys think we can use it on? That's a sword. Javazon? Mm, no, cause Well, maybe the Javazon mercenary, but you can't the, the negative enemy poison res won't apply to your poison javelin, and you can't... There's no room for javelins. Netro, Hyper Midget, thank you guys. You guys all get gold stars in the chat. Gold stars! Good job, guys. Okay, so you guys thought of the most obvious thing that I thought of. Rabies. That's right. You can put this on a rabies druid. Look at all that damage. Now, it's not grief necessarily, but you also get plus skills. You get cleansing, which means you're going to not be amped. That's one of the biggest problems with the rabies dude. When you're amped and you try to go up to things and cast rabies on them. <laughs> bruh, you just get wrecked. You get smoked on that character when you're amped. It's crazy. You get destroyed. And you know what? That's the main problem. So this is a rabies weapon is actually insane. So if you want to play a rabies druid, shit, man. This might be your best choice. Might be one of the better choices. It also has deadly strike on it. Open wounds. And it freezes targets. Which is the other problem of rabies is that um, the monster can still retaliate and smash you in the face after you rabies it. Well, guess what? That's not going to happen anymore so long as you successfully hit it. So, honestly, crazy rabies weapon for sure. I think it's going to be nice. Yeah, the boo the big ED roll too. And the lower res for rabies as well. Because remember, it's lower resist when struck. Rabies druids get struck all the time. Bruh, that is a crazy rabies weapon, honestly. It's got attack speed. It's got everything. <laughs> okay. Big ED roll, absolutely. Um, a kicker. You could use it on a kicker, I guess. I mean, it doesn't have crushing blow, though. I don't know. I think I'd rather have it. Well, on the mercenary. You could put it on the mercenary for sure, though. Uh, I'm putting this whole thing on YouTube. It's going to be a five and a half hour analysis of the patch notes, yeah. I'm also going to be putting a much shorter video. Where I just do a quick analysis of possibilities for the new rune words so people can understand how the new rune words can be integrated into the game. Uh huh, uh huh. 
Three second phase blade. That's right. You get it super fast. Uh, no. Yeah, this isn't a leveling weapon, guys. This is a definitely an end game option for sure. They're literally just taking it from the game files. Golden good boy. Thank you so much for the follow. Welcome to the cold Xanadar suite. Thank you guys for all the follows today. I hope you guys are enjoying your day for sure. All right, so guys, that's pretty insane stuff. Um, I could also think of some other things you could potentially use this for. As a stretch, you could also use it um, as a like a lower tier. Let's say you can't find or you can't. Let's say you can't find a desk web. All right. And you also want to make it to where it, when you jump into packs of monsters to cast Poison Nova, uh, you don't die from just jumping in and dying from Amplified Damage. And it could also cast lower resist for you potentially as well, which I don't think that's necessarily a good thing. But you can get the two skills from that. And you can also get the negative enemy Poison Resist. So there is... Not as good as Death's Web, but it's like a baby Death's Web, and it's cheap. It's way cheaper than Death's Web will ever be. Um, so, that's an idea. Possibly Fist of the Heavens, right? Fist of the Heavens. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Why Fist of the Heavens do you, would you say that? Um. Well... Eh, I don't know about that one, actually. <laughs> Plague Frenzy Barb. I mean, yeah, it does have Deadly Strike. It's not like you can't use it on a standard melee to some extent. It's not going to be as good as most of those like really good weapons like Oath, though. It's going to be kind of trashy. For the memes! One of you, you are a rabies druid. <laughs> okay. All right, so what do we got here? Let's go to pattern. All right, so pattern's pretty straightforward, right? If you are a martial arts assassin with all those awesome martial arts changes, and you don't have the crazy claws yet, like Jade Talon and whatnot, what are you going to want to use? What am I choking on? Rabies. You can't use the fine item on a barb with Freeze's target. Not a fine item barb, no, definitely not. Definitely not. I, 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 yeah, yeah there's, there's definitely limitations to what you could use this on, for sure. Pattern, look at that, man. Look at all that elemental damage, man. Added to the elemental damage of the charges expended by the finishers, by the way. Wow. And it has res on it. If you go double pattern and you go claw block, that could be sick. I honestly think, um, yeah, pattern looks really good early game. I, I agree with that 100%. It even has block rate, so it knows that one thing you might want to do is go claw block with it. I think the block rate does count for claw block, and even if it doesn't, you could use a shield. Does anyone know if the block rate counts for claw block or no? It does? Ooh, yeah. That's oh, Yeah, that's nice. Mm-mm-mm. Sin's coming up. Now it's not just trap sins anymore, too. All these stats, by the way, are amazing for, like, a martial sin. So that's just really good stuff. Pretty straightforward on that one, for sure. Unbending will. All right. Let's talk about this. Unbending Will. I'm not sure what I think about this one. I'm a little torn on it. I... Uh, at one... At, on one hand, it's really low runes. On another hand, though, it requires a six socketed sword, most likely Colossus Blade. Um... To make the most use out of it, so you could use six. You could use a one-handed Colossus blade on a on a, on a barb. 
It's a sword. Obedience for an act by a mercenary. Um, yeah. So you could do that, but it's just another thing that would take the place of, like, Lawbringer for extra damage. I guess if you want, like, an ultra survivability approach, you'll cast, like, Battlecry and Taunt. So, I think it could be quite good for your typical melee character. I think it's a really good Act 5 Merc we weapon, and you could use it on a 6 socket at Colossus Blade, and would be good. I also think it's good until you get Oath. I agree with that. One thing I actually think would probably be the best use of this item, because most characters would want Lawbringer or Reaper's Toll to max out their damage, is... Guess it, chat. Guess what I'm thinking? Let's test chat's knowledge once more. What, what do we think, what build do you think this synergizes with really well? Um, with no damage loss that you wouldn't otherwise not want. Mm, chance orc. No, not really. I mean, you could enchant him. Phase Blade Unbending Well, I don't think that gives you enough damage. I think Phase Blade, Phase Blade makes a very poor use of enhanced damage. If you don't know, most of the weapons that you put in a, or most of the rune words you put in a Phase Blade are like Grief that have like added damage, which is very different. Um, and other things too, like Passion that you don't rely on the physical damage. Yeah, there we go. Everyone in the chat finally started getting it. Gold stars. We got it. Berserk. Berserk Barbarian. Correct. Why is this good on a low-level Berserk Barbarian? Because you could put it on the faster weapon. You could use one hand with a Colossus Sword. It does a lot of damage. It's not as strong as Oath, but it's very cheap win-wise. It has even Taunt, which won't interfere with Berserk. Um, not, it doesn't interfere with what you attack it with. If anything, actually, it helps you take less damage, potentially, which is good. Um, it's got lots of damage, it has Life Leech, and it has no freezing effect whatsoever, which is where Reaper's Toll uh, goes wrong. Reaper's Toll. I think even Lawbringer can freeze as well. I don't remember, though. Um, maybe it doesn't. I don't know. Yeah, it's negative 40% damage, right? And you can taunt them when you're... You can taunt... You can jump on top of them with whatever, and then you can kill them. You can use, like, a staff or something and go right on top of them. And then it mitigates all the damage. So even if you howl everything else away, you can still mitigate the damage of the elite. Check it out. Wait, doesn't Lawbringer have... Um... Wait, I want to see something real quick. Just to confirm. Whoa, bringer. Oh yeah, cold damage, that's the problem. Yeah, so both Lawbringer and Reaper's Toll both have cold damage. So you're not using D crap anyway on a Berserk Barb under any circumstances. So if you can't find that crazy base for Oath and you don't have Malrune, which is Demanding, pull rune's a bit more demanding. You find a white Colossus Blade somewhere and voila, you actually have a pretty decent weapon that can go kill things and then pop them for with item find. So, not a bad idea uh, for like a starter Zerk Barb. Um, I, I could definitely think of some pretty interesting uses of that and that's good stuff. Um, I... Uh, I'm a little torn though when it's used on an act by a mercenary just because I feel like there's ways to increase your own damage, but it would also make the act five mercenary do a shit ton of damage, so maybe that's good enough. I don't know. Pretty good. Wisdom. All right, chat, what do we do with wisdom? I, I, I have ideas, but I, I'm pretty much set on like one class for this item. 
There's like one class where I'm like, damn, this class benefits a shit ton from this item. And the, the other classes, not so much. But there's like one class I'm just like. Robarb is the other character that could benefit from this, yes. But I'm mostly thinking of Amazon. So if you think about it, what do we get for an Amazon? We get everything we could possibly want on both a Javazon early on and on a freezing arrow zone, exploding arrow zone, a every arrow zone. But of course, especially anything that's non-physical damage. So we're talking about mana leech. We're talking about mana after each kill as well on top of that. That's all the sustain you need. And, and those 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 uh those characters have a tough time sustaining. Um, all the Amazon skills can have a tough time keeping their mana uh filled up. Also, it means that you potentially don't need to use Razor Tail in the early mid game. So you don't need the Razor Tail to get the hundred percent piercing attack as well. And that's on all those elemental bosons and the jabs. But what else that means is that you could also use it on. A what should I call it? And then you could also, yeah, I like this helm. And it's only a pull rune, mind you, so it's not like it's insanely expensive. It's not super hyper focused on damage, though. It's focused on getting all your sustain and you know your 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 sustained damage stats, getting all your like accessory stats kind of out of the way. Um, the other thing is like it would also be good once again we talked about it for a throw bar because you could hit 100% pierce and a throw bar easier with it as well. So that would also help out the throw bar. Of course, we already talked about the big problem with the throw bar though. So we're, I'm not convinced the throw bar is truly in play until they fix some of those quantity issues. Um, but that is a, that is a thing. All right. Cool. Obsession. Diablo 2 is an obsession. So is this rune word. Alright, I checked out this rune word and honestly... Pretty baller. This rune word is sick. Check this baller out. Let, 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 let's read out the stats, okay? This is pretty cool stuff. Six socket Staff. But there's only one other rune word you can make in a six socket staff, by the way. What is it? Breath of the Dying. And it would be in an F1, probably an Archon staff, and you would use it on a shapeshifter. However, indestructible from the Zod. It uses a Zod too. I actually love this rune word. This is really cool. It's, it's another rune word that actually uses a Zod. Um, and of course, the rest of the runes aren't even that expensive, so it's actually interesting. Chance to cast level 10. Ten weaken when struck. Level ten weaken when struck. Holy shit, bro! You know how they buffed we weaken, right? They buffed weaken. They buffed weaken. Samoth and Sudden Zena. Thank you so much for the follows. Welcome to Cold Zena Thursday. Look at this, bro. Look at this. Level 10 weaken when struck. Just think about this for a second. Let's go back up to the Necromancer changes. What does this mean? Huh. That is a huge chance, by the way. 24% is no joke. We're talking about bigger than the plague chances. And that's if you're aware now on yourself, which you are in this case. You can't use it on a mercenary, though. Okay. Um. Look at this, look at this, look at this. Level 10 weaken. What does that mean? That means it scales per level. So now, that's 43%. Actually, I think it's like 42%. 42% damage reduction. 24% chance to cast it when you're struck. That means that if you're playing a character that gets struck a lot, but does a lot of damage, so it's not super highly defensive, and always is in the middle of the monsters. Now let's check this again. 
Let's check this chat. Let's pay attention to this, okay? That is insane. That survivability potential is huge. When you're stuck, when you teleport, when you do a bad teleport, there is almost nothing more you'd rather have than this stat at your side. Let's just think about this, Let's, especially on a sorceress. Now, four skills. Four skills? So Spirit and Hodo is how many skills? Five. All right. Minus one skill. Minus one skill. But remember, staves can have skills on them. Staves can have skills on them. So even with Nova, even with three skills potentially on a Shooters, two skills on Spirit, you can have more skills. It's a staff, so it can have skills on it. It has it has staff mods on it. It's got staff mods. So you can have skills on the staff. On a white staff. It has to be a white or a gray staff, right, to make the rune words. So it could have them on a white staff. So next up, 65 FCR. Alright, that is 10 less than Hodo. 10 less than Ashuda's. Alright, so we're minus one skill, we're minus ten FCR. We have weaken though. Well we could potentially be up three skills on any sorceress skill. Because this is a staff, it will have sorceress skills. It's likely this is a sorceress weapon, alright. Likely, very likely. Just just looking at the kind of thing we're looking at here. Maybe not always, but it's definitely a sorceress weapon in most cases. 60% faster hit recovery. All right, how much does a typical weapon combo have on a sorceress? 55. How much FHR does it take to get to a breakpoint on... Um, how much FHR does it take to get to a breakpoint on a, a sorceress? 60. That's right. 86 as well. So there is a 60 breakpoint. That means you literally hit the breakpoint with this weapon alone. Whereas with the spirit, you need a 5 FHR small charm. Interesting. That, free, that frees up potentially more MF. It's more MF, it's more something. So it's actually plus 5 FHR. It's plus this, minus 1 skill. However, potentially plus 2 skills if it gets the right skill. And so that could be even stronger. This The staff even has a potentially be even stronger than that combination for damage, depending on... I mean, obviously, a shoot has plus other types of damage as well. And then, you know, there's, like, Death's Fathom that has, you know, less FCR, but has even more damage. So it's not going to be the best for everything, but we just got to think about this, though. And then we're going to have FCR. We're going to have Knockback. Now, I don't have a freaking clue why... Oh, you know what? It's because there's a Nefrin. Ah, uh, so it, this is what we call a useless stat, okay. Thanks. Vitality, energy, that's just from the love and the higher runes. That is just solid stats. I mean, those are good stats for a sorceress. You usually want both of them, especially if you go energy shield. Um, you need that sustain in one way or another. Um, that's very similar to what Spirit has, by the way, except Spirit has way more mana. But when we take a look at this, though, um, we might lose mana, but we gain mana regeneration on most of those. And one, this stat is crazy. So look at this. This might not be the energy shield approach, actually. This might be the not energy shield approach. Because you have weaken. You might not have to go energy shield. Because you have maximum life. 25% potentially. True, you could go one point. Yeah, it's one point energy shield, max telekin. Yeah, that's what I usually do to Sky, especially in hardcore. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely, definitely. And look. Look, look. Man, well, on softcore, you could go. You could do that, though. Softcore, you could do that. It's an approach on softcore, for sure. It'll keep you alive, like, 90% of the time until it doesn't. Energy shield. Increase maximum life. 45%. That's insane. That's actually a lot. That's pretty crazy. And since you're not going um, shield, so there's no shield, and you're not putting tons of points into strength because you're not going spirit, 
think about that. That's so many points you put into vitality on any build that uses this. No dex points, no strength points, no nothing. All it is is pure vitality. Pure vitality. That's crazy. You're, you're stacking so much vitality on this build, and that's going to synergize with this as well. That's going to be tankage, man. Regenerate mana. Not bad. It just helps you to sustain a little bit. And then this one is huge. All right, so let's think about this. Spirit typically has 35 all res except for fire res. Odo could get up to 40 all res, but it's 30 to 40. So that's about 65 to 75 all res minus fire, which is only up to 40. Whereas this gets 60 to 70, including fire res, which is usually the hard one to get when you're on spirit. So, so, this is how to do staves right, chat, right here. You want to make staves viable? This is how to do it. This is a viable staff. Oh, yeah. And then on top of that, you even got some gold find from the limb and magic find from the ist. And it even has magic find on it. And you want to know what the Hodo Spirit combo doesn't have? That's right. It doesn't have magic fund. Mm. And I'll tell you, there aren't any major stats that are missing that Spirit and the Hodo combo already have. Not really. I mean, there's, there's definitely a lot more mana on the spirit, so there's the mana advantage for sure. But there's other ways to get your mana. You could use Stone of Jordans. You could use other stuff. You could get mana on other ones. You get mana on an amulet. You get mana on the... You could get mana on Silk Weaves. You get mana on anything. Now, when I'm thinking builds, there's one build in particular that really comes to mind, and people in the chat have already been saying it the whole time, which is Nova Sorceress. That is going to be a monster on a Nova Sorceress for sure. Yeah, I do. Sorry, Swingling. Um, that's very nice Nova Sorceress for sure. Very nice. Hey, what are you doing hardcore ladder group fan? Where can I sign in? Um, we will be doing hardcore ladder going to 99. So we're making 99 teams. Uh, I don't know the ladder date. Once we have a ladder date, not the PTR date, I will let you know more about it. So let's stay around, stick around. So this is a staff with a Zod in it, which means you could also make it an ethereal staff for swag, and you won't even break it if you accidentally swing it, for whatever reason. But you probably won't. But it doesn't really matter. Um, it's a staff with a Zod in it. I, I mean, I think it's kind of strange that they would put a Zod in this, but it almost makes sense because there's not a lot of other space for, like, other really powerful weapons, like melee weapons, to exist, and that's usually what benefits from ethereal. So I got to think, like, what would you do? But I don't know. Nova Sorceress should be really good with this item. Like, we can, we can on top of huge life, on top of MF, on top of even getting, solving the fire res problem, and on top of it not being super expensive. If you think about it, Zod is usually um, about the same cost as a Vex. This might actually raise the price of it though a bit. Let's be real. I actually think this would this could actually do something to the price of Zod. What do you think, Sky? Let's get a uh, let's get a price expert in here. I mean, I like it too, but the poopiest fart. Thank you so much for the follow. Welcome to the Cold Xanadrus Day. You don't think it's gonna change? Really, bro? This is more MF. Imagine going three piece towels, and then you ch you, you stack this thing on. And then you get more FCR. You could get 105 FCR with three piece towels and more MF and survival of damage. Mm. Melee sorceress. Eh, no, no. There's 
there's no attack speed. There's no ED. There's no, um, I mean, I guess, okay. I guess realistically, if you find a three enchant version of this, people might try to make a plus seven enchant staff. That's another interesting use for this. Think about that. So the maximum enchant you can get on a normal orb is six, but those orbs are absurdly rare. Whereas it's much more common to find a staff like an Archon with three enchant, most likely. Mm, you can't farm, well, yeah, you could farm the white one. Can you get six sockets in those though? Yeah, three enchant, three fire mastery, right? And then remember, a spirit is two is two skills. Of course, you could also use a twenty twenty, but it wouldn't be bad to like pre buff stuff with. I could see you pre buffing a lot of things with this. Could, maybe not the best pre buff weapon, but you could do it. No, 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 no. You, you could though. It's got a lot of skills. You got a lot of plus skills. It, it might not be the best pre buff. I think it's not best in slot for any type of pre buff, but it'd be a nice, like, all, all purpose pre buff staff. You know, you could just, like, you could get three different skills on it and just pre buff all kinds of things. You could pre buff energy shield, um, shiver armor, because remember, you can get up to three staff mods. So that's three skills on these at the same time. So you could get a staff with like, let's say you have like three Nova, you could get three to energy shield and you could get like three to, I don't know. Uh, I guess you could get TS and light mastery too, but you could get other stuff as well. And yeah, you could pre buff, you just make them all stronger. Mm, fire sorceress. Well, see, this is this is another good use of this item. This this item could also be used for like a. Uh, it could be used just for a standard fire sorceress too, because imagine getting um, imagine getting like a plus three fireball, plus three, yeah, plus three fire mastery. That should be pretty solid, right? It's plus seven skills, and that's a. Uh, it's at least competitive with those other items. So there's definitely some very interesting things you could do here. Very interesting. More skills, maybe less MF than the Oculus approach though, but it's also not as annoying as Oculus because it doesn't teleport you around. So I don't know, man. Original X9, and it's also not too expensive. It seems like they thought a lot about this. Like some of these rune words, you could tell they did their research. Like. This one, they knew that Zod isn't being used enough. They also knew six socketed staves are used for like one very niche purpose, but besides that, no one ever uses them. And then they also realized that there's a potential to actually make staves viable on a character, but they also knew what the best combinations of items were in the late game, like things like Spirit and Hodo and other things. So they took all of that information and combined that into a possible staff that you would actually want to use potentially with really good stats on it. They fix block those so it doesn't interrupt cast true 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 which is something I think is pretty cool. I think that's what that means anyway, yeah. Alright, um let's stop talking about that though. I love that rune word. Honestly I got stuck on it. So it's kind of fun. Alright, flickering flame. Alright. So I'm just going to cut to the chase. This one is a fire helmet. Uh, the only other fire helmet that even kind of looks like this is Raven Lore, and it's Druid only. Raven Lore is stronger than this helmet, 100%. Uh, Raven Lore, well, okay, let's actually put it this way. Raven Lore could be worse than this helmet, potentially, with a really bad roll. But this helmet isn't going to be better than the best Raven Lore. You remember, you can't even put a fire facet in it. You can't even put something else in it. So Raven Lore has more potential for a fire druid, but as a see with the Vex rune requirement, I don't really see it being used on a fire druid too much. I mean, you could, but Raven Lore is usually cheaper than a Vex rune, uh, usually, uh, because only one type of build uses it. You can also uh, you could get a plus three fire pelt though. Yeah, Fissure pelt, you. 
good, but mm, that versus negative enemy 25 enemy fire resistance. The negative res is still better. It, it is. It is still better. The negative res is better. That isn't a bad idea, though. Um, I think it could be close. Honestly, it's close, Sky. It's not far, but it's... I don't know. The other thing is that Ravenlord gets all resistances, so it's a bit more of a jack-of-all-trades. Yeah, that that's my point, is you could get negative 25 versus negative 15 is the maximum for flickering flame. So I, I would put this item as... You could make a Raven Lore out of it, but I feel like most people would just buy Raven Lore, honestly. Like, Raven Lore is just going to be cheaper in more situations. Yeah, and the plus five from the facet, too, correct. So, Raven Lore. Raven Lore, yeah, it's the unique Sky Spirit. It's an item that exists in the game. Um, I still think Raven Lore overall has slightly more potential than Flickering Flame. But, it's close. And it's close enough to where it even gives you way more fire res. So if you're looking for fire res, you're good to go. But there's actually something that kind of also messes with this helm, um, which is the uh, resist, which is the, um, the fire theme, the fire res theme on top of fire damage. That doesn't make a lot of sense, actually. <laughs> so um, when you think about that, well, let, let's think about that for a second. If you're doing... It's for spirit users. Yeah, potentially. Potentially. But if you're thinking about... Um, if you're thinking about... Like, let's say you're playing a fire druid, right? Do you want to go in Chaos Sanctuary where there's Hell of Fire immunes? And there's a lot of fire damage? No, you don't. Do you want to go into... Do you want to go in a Travancle with a Fire Druid? You could do it with really good gear, but you're not going to be going in with something like this, I'll tell you that much. Uh, you, there's too many Fire Immunes. It's, it's annoying. Are you going to be going in... Let's use another good example. Well, Fire Users use Phoenix, typically, yes. And that's fine. You could actually use this on top of Phoenix. I don't think it's just for spirit users, actually. I'm not convinced of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good for spirit, good for trav, for mercenary. Right, right. Storm Shield lacks fire resistance as well. True, true. I, I do think you want to make use of that. The only problem, though, is that most of the time when you're a fire character... You're not going in areas where there's a lot of fire damage. I guess that's my point, is that most of the fire damage in Diablo 2 comes from fire immunes. Not all of it, but most of it. And that's a thing. That is something to consider here. So most of the time, you're not fighting fire with fire because the fire can't be fought. It's that simple. However... Yeah, exactly. So the fire resistance doesn't really... I'm not sure what it does. Thematically, it makes some sense, but usually when you're doing fire damage, you're staying away from the fire immunes, which also typically do the fire damage. Maggots. But when I think of this, when I think of this helm, though, I think of potentially a fire druid, yes. Especially if you can't find a good enough Raven Lore. It can be easier to get this than a really good Raven Lore. It depends. Especially in an Antlers of Plus 3 Fitter. You could use it in a for a Fire Sorceress. You can. I just don't know how much the Fire Resist helps. I think that's my problem. Uh, the Fire Sorceress? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, unlike a Druid who has another way to get these stats, a Fire Sorceress does not have an easy way to get negative 15 fire is on the helm. So that's very nice. Um, you get three skills as well on top of it. You also get a lot of mana and you also get poison length reduction. So there's actually some very nice things going on here and half freeze duration. 
And if there is any fire damage from fire enchant or any other source of fire damage just in general, you're good to go. It's a very good fire sorceress helm. Oh, yeah. Very good. As a matter of fact, a fire sorceress is more likely to farm areas that have fire damage um, just simply because of its mobility, so it can get to those areas a bit easier. Also a fire boa, correct. Yes, honestly, any fire build could use this. I see this as the, this is the, this is the age of the fire characters helm, the age of the fire build helm. You know how there's like a, a night wings for cold and there's a griffins for lightning and for fire, there's a mm, shake -o. Oh, wait, now though, yeah, but you don't farm trap with fire characters, though. But it's a baby griffins for fire. Yeah, exactly. In some ways, it's even better than griffins, but in other ways, not so much. So, yeah. Nice. Nice stuff, man. It's like one third as good as griff. Yeah, well, griffins has FCR. That's the thing. It also has percent damage. But honestly, this is pretty great stuff. This is pretty crazy stuff. I see this helm as having a lot of potential. Holy fire, Zealer. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, man. All the fire builds. So all the fire builds could benefit from this, theoretically. And it requires a vex and a pull at the worst. And, I mean, there are builds that would also want a Hodo. You could actually, it's funny, you could use a Hodo and a Flickering Flame, and basically your build costs, like, Two vexes and two pulls. <laughs> uh, you could do that. That's that's something. Yeah, it is much rarer than a vex, it's true. So honestly, I really like this. It really bridges the mid to late game. And in some cases, it could even be the late game helm because it just does more damage than Shaco. But it doesn't have MF. That is a big weakness of this as well. So there's no option for MF. Doesn't do as much damage as Raven Lore potentially. And it's a bit more limited. Mm -hmm. Act 2 Mercenary with Conviction on top of that, though. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But now you could go Spirit, though. If you think about it, you, you don't have to use Phoenix anymore on a Fire character. Okay. We don't have to use Phoenix anymore, potentially, if we don't want to, but Phoenix has such good sustain, and it has so much more negative enemy res, we still could. But we could actually go Spirit instead if we wanted to. This actually does open up some more options here. A CE Necro? Hmm. I don't know. Uh, I think the half fire, half physical. I think you have enough sources of negative enemy res on the CE Necros. I think you're fun. Usually it's because of the lower res. It's decent. Yeah, you could use it. Sacred, thank you so much for the follow. Welcome to the Cult of Xana and Jerusa. Alright guys, and last but not least, the last thing to discuss in the patch notes is Mist. Oh, another thing I didn't mention about this, guys. Fire Mercenaries. <gasps> and enchant mercenaries too. There you go. Fireball mercenaries. That could make the fire mercenary very strong, actually. The Act 3 one. I could see it. Alright, miss. Of course, you can't put a staff on a mercenary, so it sucks. What levels the enchant? I don't know. They didn't say. They didn't say. Well, all, all this stuff needs to be tested more and whatnot, and it's just good stuff. But yeah, you know, it's good stuff. Um. Anyway, mist. What is this? What is this rune word? I definitely see its a uh its potential. I definitely see its potential. Uh, you could put it on an Act 1 Mercenary to get a baby concentration aura. And you could also get some crowd control with Freezing Arrow. And you could also have it on a physical damage character. You could also put it on the Boson. 
And remember, this could be put in any bow and crossbow. So it already has three skills, which means it could have free to bow and crossbow skills on it as well. What does that mean? You could have six to bow and crossbow skills on top of piercing attack, top of resistances, on top of increased attack speed. And what's even crazier is because it has a lot of enhanced damage, you could also use this for like strafe. So you could have a hybrid build that uses the elements and also uses physical damage. You could also put it on an Act 1 mercenary, like I already said. And since the runes aren't absurdly expensive, it might be cheaper than other options, like going for the faith on the mercenary or other things of that nature, like pride as well. Pride is a lot more expensive. Um, you want to see Bone Spirit Necro and Fist of the Heavens Paladin become viable, like S tier. Uh, you mean for PVE? I don't know if that's going to ever happen, but you never know. Fits of the Heavens for PvE, the only way they could do that is by changing the way Holy Bolt works, I think. It has to work more like on PD2 or on Pod. A Bow Paladin, you know, I didn't think about that. You could put it in a non-Amazon bow, and you could go to town with it. It's true. It's true you could, and it gives concentration ore on top of that as well. That's interesting, actually. Yeah. It could. Now, is this better than Faith, someone might ask me? No. No, it's not. It's not better than, like, a Faith-Pride combo. Pride's level 20, concentration aura, potentially. Um, faith does more damage. Faith has ignored target defense. And it's not that hard to get the piercing attack, to be honest. Um, however, it's a little awkward in some ways, though. Like, the, the, it's using a cham and a goal, which is something I really like, and it definitely has some mid game vibes potentially using on late game builds as well. But if you think about it, what would you rather have on a fire boson? This or hand of justice, or this or phoenix? Or this, and or ice for freezing arrow. Ice gives percent cool damage and negative enemy cold res. Faith or wind force do a lot more damage than this. And like I said, you could get pride on the weapon too, on the mercenary. So it's kind of in a weird place, but it only costs a goal and a cham. It's very strong for what it does. This might be one of the more awkward rune words that I see maybe not. Yeah, I think this is like a hybridization. Like, I think this build, the way this bow works is you could make it, but it would be more effective for a hybrid build, like a hybrid physical element build, but not necessarily a pure element build. And it could also be good for a non zon And it could be good for an Act 1 Mercenary if you're uh, short on budget. But the truth is, is that this thing is not best in slot under any conditions. For like a pewter build of any kind. Well, that's the other thing too, is people might want to save their chams for creating Hand of Justice or Pride or otherwise. So that is an issue. It is an issue. Indeed. Well, anyway, chat. I think that's pretty much it for the discussion on the patch notes. Hope you guys all enjoyed it. Man, that was a long discussion. We talked about everything. We definitely went over lots of things a lot. I kind of talked about how you could potentially integrate and use these rune words. Um, really cool stuff. Integrate these skills, integrate all these changes. Overall, I have to say, um, I think they did a pretty excellent job at maintaining the overall integrity of the game. 
while making it to where more things that aren't working are working. That's what they wanted to do. Uh, they didn't nerf anything. Um, there's some risk to some PvP skills being a little too strong, but they might have ways of mitigating that. There's definitely more they could do, in my opinion, and in most people's opinions, like nerfing Sorb a bit in PvP. Um, they could definitely, uh, there's definitely a lot of skills that maybe need more help, like throwing. Uh, needs that quantity fix, man. Now, without that quantity fix, I think it's going to still be a build that people are going to be very frustrated playing, despite it existing. Um, Holy Fire Paladin. I don't know, man. There's some things that could be very insane, but we're going to want to test them all. And, of course, the number of hybrid sorceresses has probably doubled or tripled, uh, at least in terms of possibilities. Kind of just do whatever you want. And there's just a lot more possibilities in general. Um, I I think it's I think they've did a, done a pretty good job. Remember, of course, the PTR is gonna be January twentieth. Yes, so definitely catch you then. I think Blizzard Blizzard did a good job here. I think the their D two R team is uh definitely uh, being very careful. They might do more bold changes in the future. I definitely, one of the biggest things I would love to see without seeing anything here about it is upgrades to certain elite set items, but also to uniques. There's a lot of uniques that I feel are almost completely useless, particularly early game, and of course the ultra rare TC-87s. Uh, making some of those insanely rare items actually useful uh, could be very, very cool. They'd have to think about doing that, but it would be pretty awesome. There's also some rune words that are already existing that aren't made often at all because they're also pretty trash. Um, that could also be something they could look at. And there's definitely a lot of things they could look at in general. But I am overall very happy with these changes. And it's just a lot of fun stuff. I, uh, I It is crazy, man. I, I'm, I'm, I'm hyped for this. I hope everyone's hyped for this. Any D2 fan should be hyped for this. It's been over 10 years since they've touched anything balance-wise. And it's been even longer since they've touched so many skill balances. I mean, they've done like a couple here and there, like around 2010. But we're talking like big changes. And these are changes that are going to make, you know, all these skills and abilities feel better anywhere from the early to late game, depending on what they're going for. And just making more skills and items more usable. And with such awesome graphics and such an awesome base game, um, just making more farming viable, I don't know. It's just going to be a lot more fun for more people, and I think more people are going to enjoy it, especially getting into that heavy grind, but otherwise it's okay. It bothers me they're breaking PvP. Uh, just a couple of skills. I think they can, I think they can manage. They can fix that. Um, you could do that, D-Label, but then you're losing a lot of negative enemy cold res. I mean, in, in Players 1, that might actually be the choice, so, you know, there there's definitely options for that, uh, that item. Make them splash when you melee with them on, not only pulse. Um, uh, I don't know. I think splash damage has a lot of abuse cases. You see how much of a joke LOD areas become a splash damage when you introduce it into a mod, right? And remember, there's no maps in this game. This is the Diablo 2. So you don't want to make your normal areas a joke. Bone Necro is getting buffs. It's already one of the best builds. Um, Bone Necro is already one of the best builds for PvP, yes. For PvE, mm, not in the late game. Early game, yes. Late game, no. And I think they were trying to help the uh, early game. That's what they were trying to do with that. Anyone have any more questions on any of the abilities? And you guys want any more analysis on anything? It's been a lot of fun to go over all this stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's up, Great Woo? How you doing? What do you think of the Act 3 change? Ah, um... So, you mean the one that makes it to where you have to get all of the organs? 
you, you can't just skip. You just can't. You, you can't just skip to it. Um, I mean, from the perspective of cleaning up weird crap in the game that allows you just to skip past the game, I think that's a good thing. But from the perspective of spending more time in Act 3, I am highly against it. <laughs> All it does is making rushing harder. Yeah. Yeah, but that does mean now rushers can... Uh, so rushers cannot justify a price increase, right? Because it takes them longer. Hmm... So with all of these new carrot powers that your characters will have, does that mean I'll get to leech off of you more? Sure, why not? <laughs> um, I have a... So, conversion. I, I talked about conversion. Um, I thought it could be an interesting uh, utility skill. 90%, it's pretty reliable. Act 3 is very integral to the story. I have a question. Does anyone know if they are fixing G-rushing? Are they, um... Are they fixing the bail quest? Do you still get the bail quest if you're partied in town, or is Ancients now required for it? Are they gonna do that? They better not. I just think it's really weird. Okay, so so th this is something that's really weird to me. Yeah, I know uh, they have no intentions of doing it, but. The low, 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 low level duelers will screech bloody murder. I know, I know. They'll have to, they'll have to do tomb runs. <laughs> um, cow runs. The one thing I don't get is why do they change the Act Three quest, which in my opinion is a much more minor bug requiring only Travancore and Mephisto, and allowing someone at level one to go to the next difficulty. That's the biggest bug there is. That's the biggest bug there is. I'm not saying they should fix it. That is the biggest bug in existence. Period. Period. Hmm. You think that's all it is? You think that's all it is? Also, G rushing is just too integral to how people, yeah, yeah. Well, you you know what you know what it would do though. You know what it would do if they fix it. It just mean that everyone makes a classic rusher. So everyone would just start classic rushing if they get rid of G rushing, right? Make a classic rusher, rush your character in classic, and then convert to expansion. Yay. <laughs> Yeah. Rip sins and druids. Yeah. Exactly. I don't know. I don't. I don't think that would actually. I don't. I don't think they could change it. But I just think it's funny that that's so much of a bigger thing. So much of a. It's a. It's a game break practice. It's game breaking doing that. And yet. And yet. They don't care about that. Mm, no. Act 3 is the Act 6 you asked for. Poof. Yeah, I hear that nonsense. People will get rushed anyway. Yep, that's true. People will get rushed no matter what. <laughs> It'd really piss anyone off interested in playing expansion characters. <laughs> it would. It would. You have to go through three more portals to pick up organs. That's correct. Mm-hmm. But it also means that you have to go find the spider cavern, find the um, find the flare dungeon, and then you also have to go find the sewers. Yeah, sewers too. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, um, overall though, overall though, I think they've done an amazing job, and I think overall their philosophy is a very good one. Um, keep the stuff that works. Don't mess with it. People love it. It's fun. Um, help out all this other stuff, at least in the early and mid game, which I think they've accomplished. I think all this uh, this is going to make a lot of things very good. Does it totally radically transform the late game meta? No, and I don't think they want to do that. I don't think the player base would like that either. Um, I think 
I think the pl- player base in general likes a lot of the end game builds that already exist. And if they just want to make more builds viable and more combinations viable, making more trap combinations viable, they should do it. Um, one thing I'm also looking forward to them doing, besides maybe messing with some of the ultra rare uniques and whatnot, is actually fixing D clone to where it's not some kind of secret club, as they themselves have admitted that it is. The secret club that knows about how to look for IPs and stuff. It's really weird. It's really wonky. And they do need to fix D clone. D clone needs to be more accessible to every player. Which means they might need to create a new item. And I missed the part about upping the set parts. What are your thoughts about it? I like it. Because now, if you're a melee character and the only, only source of cannot be frozen you could justify in your build is on a bell, it's not a Raven Frost. Say you're like a Berserk Barb. When you find a Death Sash, but you don't have a train belt, now you can upgrade the Death Sash, and it works! Honestly, Death Sash, I think, is the thing I'm most excited about upgrading. Like, that's... It's so good. It cannot be frozen. And then, did you know what Death Sash and Death Gloves? You have a sick combination of stats. Really high attack speed, really high all res. And you get all the poison lanes for that. Out for that for sure. Well, anyway, definitely catch us on the PTR for sure, though. We are going to be going ham on the PTR, no doubt. We're just going to end this for uh, YouTube, by the way, chat. Um, anyways, you, got, you guys can always catch me at twitch.tv forward slash dark humility for six to seven days a week of Diablo 2 action of all kinds. D2R going hardcore, and we are getting a sword to 99 first thing. Of course, first off in PTR, we're going to be testing all kinds of builds, especially ones that I am in charge of on max roll. So we're definitely going to be checking out any of the potential changes just to make sure that they do work the way they do. And we're going to need that as well. Uh, I make lots of build guides. I make tons of build guides. I have tons of, of D2R build guides, PD2 build guides as well on YouTube. Also check all of them out and D2 D2.maxwell.gg. I will have the timestamps for this incredibly long video in the description and in, in, in the first pinned comment so you guys can check out when I talk about various things so you can hear all of mine and my very intelligent chats in-depth analyses on all of these skills, all these changes, what that means for the builds, what that means for the skills, and what it's likely to do um, in terms of making them viable or good and playable. You know, we talk about all that indeed. Um, is anything going to be as strong necessarily as the late game Lightning Fury Amazon or as strong as the late game Hammered In or Poison Necro or some of the very strongest builds in the game? Maybe not, but it's okay because they will be a lot more viable and will be fun. And there's a lot more places to play them in because they made all these different areas too. Apparently D-Clone will be a global event. Wait, what? Oh, did they announce it? Do I have to do I have to mention something real quick? Ah, this is only because we don't have it in the PTR, but cha- expect the changes for Uber Diablo events to appear with 2.4. The changes that are coming will make it a global event as opposed to IP based. Ah, thank you. Oh my god. Are you telling me I don't have to switch regions or look for IPs and stuff? Oh, man. Okay, okay. Cool, cool, cool. You know what? There should just be, like, a random time. This is what I think should happen. No, no, no. No, I think I think the ante price might even be higher because I think it's only going to happen at certain times. They might literally have a randomizer that randomizes it, like, once every, like, week or so, maybe once every two weeks. What I would do is I wouldn't even make it to where you have to sell items. What I would do is I would be like, Bruh, it's just gonna happen, and then all of a sudden it just happens, you know. Oh, that's oops. Yeah, that is huge, actually. Oh, cool. I didn't know that. So they they have said something about it. Good. Um, I you know I'm actually glad to hear that because if I had to go searching for IPs in ladder one for an Annie, 
It would have been pretty silly. I don't like that, man. SOJ price will drop. Eh, it's still, SOJ is going to always be worth a lot. It's going to be worth more BK, which is quite a bit, no matter what. You are right. If SOJs aren't necessary, that is what will happen. But I think it should just be a random thing where every hell game just he appears, bro. You have to fight him. And if you can't, you're going to die. Hmm. I don't know. I feel like, okay, so I, I, I hate the whole, like, where people hoard IPs and they hoard games and IPs. and It's, it's like a secret club. It's like, like it's basically like a back room. It, it, I don't know. It's like cartel, man. The, the, the way it works with Annie's, it, it's totally like cartel. It, it totally reminds me of a cartel, man. Like, people literally just, like, monopolize the area. They, they, they try to, like, gather as many gains, as many territories as possible. And then they they literally just like <laughs> they they monopolize all the shipping routes, and then they you know they 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 take them all in. They get the annies and then they sell them at exorbitant prices because no one else was able to get in their IP. Oh yeah, it, it's a cartel. It's crazy. It's like it's it's like El Chapo stuff, dude. It's like El Chapo, man. That's how annies work currently on D two, and it's stupid. It's stupid. It's really dumb. <laughs> And if you're not, if you if you don't buy in, man, if you don't if you don't pay your if you don't pay your mob taxes, man, you're not getting in. And uh, <laughs> the people that do it, you, you got to be very influential, man. You, you got to be at the top to charge these fees, and they charge the fees for people to get a game on it. And if not, you can't get it. And it's just like <laughs> it is crazy stuff. It is crazy. Anies will be way cheaper, possibly. Yeah, it it depends on how they do it, though. They they might not make it to where it spawns for every hell game. It might be sporadic. Yeah, it could be just where there's a chance that when you make a hell game, a very tiny chance that it just spawns in there. At, at any time, you know. But it doesn't mean it happens everywhere. Though. But when they say global, I think it means it's going to happen, like, maybe on all games. It could. It could. Anyway. Anyways, GG chat. Hope you guys uh learn all your stuff. OP, OP. Let's get it, guys. Let's get it. Here we go. Dark humility over and out. See you guys next time for more awesome D2R content. We are back on D2R, so check us out on there and we will be going on. Let's go. That's the OP. Also remember to check out our D2R farming tiers, which will be updated in addition to all of our build guides as well. Alright, see you.